Comparative mythology is the study and comparison of myths from different cultures in an attempt to identify shared themes and characteristics. In the late 20th century, a professor by the name of Joseph Campbell devised the theory that all mythic narratives ultimately function as variations of a single great story which he coined the monomyth or the hero's journey. After a lifetime of observing the trends and patterns between narrative elements of countless myths, he formed a 12-stage cycle that most of these mythic narratives follow, an all-embracing metaphor for the inner journey of transformation that the majority of mythic heroes seem to share. Going full circle from the ordinary world to the special world, from the original status quo to the new status quo formed by the world the hero helped to create. The 12 stages may be avoided, shifted, or uniquely ordered depending on the needs of the associated narrative. This concept of the hero's journey is a good prelude to this massive video. The construction of Kurosaki Ichigo's own journey follows an almost identical structure to the one outlined by Joseph Campbell. Bleach follows our main protagonist on his personal path to enlightenment as he goes full circle from the ordinary world to the special world. But despite choosing to include the hero's journey in the title of the video, I won't be making too many callbacks to the template because that would not make for an enjoyable, accomplished analysis. Still, I want you to remember the hero's journey and think about it as you watch this video. The connections are so rich and vivid you'll undoubtedly see them for yourself. As you can clearly tell by the length of this video, this is a massive undertaking. We will be diving extremely deeply into the character of Kurosaki Ichigo, the heart and soul of Taito Kubo's weekly shonen jump icon, a character that has grown to become very important to me over the years. This analysis aims to serve as an all-encompassing viewing of the character, the ideas he represents, the extent of his development, the growth he undergoes, the ultimate conclusion his journey reaches, his position in the greater structure of Bleach's narrative, its past, present and future. We'll be looking at things on a micro level and dissecting even the smallest bits of characterization. Today I aim to convince you that Ichigo may just be one of the most elaborate and articulately crafted protagonists in not just Shonen Jump, but manga period. A tall task for sure, considering just how many people are convinced Ichigo is not a particularly good character, a stance I'll be challenging throughout this video as I peel back the countless layers that coalesce in the uncanny construction of Bleach's main man. This video is months in the making and I'm fully aware how daunting the length may feel so I have included precise timestamps in the description to help you navigate through the video and consume it in pieces considering the length. I do highly recommend you watch as intended, in order, from start to finish, as the video has been structured to provide the most comprehensive understanding of Ichigo. It should already be obvious but I must make clear that this video will contain spoilers for all 686 chapters of The Bleach manga. With that being said, let's lay the groundwork for this absolute behemoth of a video. The world of Bleach is governed by balance. The coexistence of separate realms and races can be best described as a circulation of kompaku or souls. The world is made up of souls that travel between life and death, between the human world, Hueco Mundo, and Soul Society. At least, that's the case for the majority of souls. There are other realms within Bleach's cosmos, but they aren't too important for the purposes of this video. The race of a being is largely determined by what each individual kompaku consists of. A human is the most basic type of soul and it resides in a body of kishi, the material that makes up the world of the living and can be best understood as the equivalent of atoms and molecules of our world. Their soul is connected to their material bodies via a chain of fate and upon their deaths this chain is severed. They travel between life and death through the console ritual and reincarnation. A Shinigami is a soul that possesses high amounts of Reryoku or spiritual power as well as a body of Reishi or spiritual particles. The only real difference between a Shinigami and the normal souls that reside in the Rukongai awaiting reincarnation is their higher amount of spiritual power. 
A Quincy is a soul that belongs to the Quincy lineage, most of which we know having been granted their powers by the Quincy king, Yuhaba himself. The majority of Quincy we meet in the story contain a piece of Yuhaba's soul deeply tethered within their own kombaku. A hollow is a deceased human soul who has lost their heart due to intense despair or regret, or simply having been neglected by the Shinigami's operations. The chain of fate that is latched onto their soul slowly corrodes, coinciding with the degradation of the soul's ties to the human world. Once the chain of fate completely decays, the plus transforms into a hollow and a hole opens up on their chest where the chain was once attached, signifying that they have lost their hearts. As for the Fallbringers, we'll be speaking about them at length later in the video. All these different types of souls exist in a twisted harmony that is maintained by the ones who established it, the Shinigami. So long as there is balance between the realms and the gates of hell are kept shut, the world can continue to function as it has for a million years and the Shinigami are content. The Shinigami's attitude towards their role in the universe is something repeatedly criticized over the course of the story and absolutely integral to the journey of Ichigo, as you'll see throughout the video. Bleach's cosmos is seeped in Buddhist references, which is best seen in the cycle of life, death, and rebirth known as the Samsara. In Buddhism, existence is split into six realms collectively known as the Six Paths. Each realm in Bleach takes direct inspiration from the Six Paths, but there are some key differences between between the two. However, the most significant similarity between Bleach's cosmos and the Samsara is the idea of striving for enlightenment through self-actualization. It's worth noting that the term heart in Bleach means far more than it does in the English language. It is not referring to the organ that pumps blood around our bodies, but rather one's very spirit, interchangeably used with the term soul. The Japanese term kokoro is used for heart, which doesn't serve a single definition, but rather signifies a concept that encompasses various definitions. Kokoro refers to what a person thinks, feels, and would like to express. It is the cumulative collective conscience of an individual, not just the sum of one's life experiences, but each of those experiences at the same time. It cannot be touched or seen. It is invisible, symbolic, formless, and conceptual. Not to be seen, but rather to be felt, both deeply and profoundly. It can be used interchangeably with the term identity. The Kokoro is the essence of an individual and the linchpin of Bleach's world. It dictates the flow of the universe, the several different magic systems, even the thematic framework of the story. It's the single most important concept in Bleach, the underlying principle that everything ultimately stems from. An individual's abilities are directly tied to their soul, through their reryoku or spiritual power and their reyatsu or spiritual pressure. Think of it this way, the soul is the very essence of an individual. The more in tune you are with your essence, the better you understand yourself and the more powerful you can be. Of course, some individuals are naturally born with a higher ceiling of potential and latent talent by virtue of external factors that have nothing to do with their own individual merit, but those external things are still tied to the soul. For example, your parents. Nobody chooses who their parents are. It's completely outside of one's control, something that can be attributed to fate. But as I previously explained, who your parents are can greatly affect the composition of your soul, which determines what type of soul you have, what race you are, and so forth. Another example would be childhood experiences. Nobody chooses what kind of life they have as an infant, but those experiences from an individual's formative years greatly impact what kind of person they'll become. This can also be attributed to fate, an external factor the individual has zero control over, which again ultimately impacts what kind of powers they'll have. These foundational principles of Bleach's world building and power system inform various aspects of the story. The Shinigami have Zanpakuto. All Zanpakuto originally start off as nameless Asauchi created by Oetsu Nimaya that are given to the lower tier Shinigami within the Gotei 13. After spending a lot of time with the Shinigami, this Asauchi evolves into a unique Zanpakuto that functions as a reflection of that Shinigami's soul. The process by which this happens is the subconscious imprinting of Reryoku onto the Asauchi, essentially imprinting your very soul onto a blade, which in turn creates a sentient being being that exists as an extension of your soul. The name of Azampakto is the name of the living spirit which exists within the blade and lends its strength to the Shinigami who wields it. The Aranka, who are awakened hollows that have removed their masks and gained the power of Shinigami, 
also have Zanpakuto. But instead of this being an extension of their soul, it's more like the concentration of their soul into a weapon. Aranka sealed the nuclei of their hollow powers within the Zanpakuto, and by releasing its seal, they unleash their true hollow powers and true hollow forms. For Quincy, we fittingly have the very inverse of Shinigami powers, seeing as they are polar opposites. Shinigami emits Reishi from within themselves to use their powers, whereas Quincy absorb Reishi from the outside environment and emit that Reishi to use their powers, which have numerous variations. Then there are shrifts, intrinsic abilities that are activated once Yuhaba engraves associated letters onto their souls and shares a deeper, even more powerful piece of his own soul with the select few individuals that make up the stern litter. I go extremely in depth into all the different concepts that the lore, power systems and world building of Bleach contain in my world building series. You'll find a link to a video compiling every race into one massive explained video in the description. It's not an analysis like this one, but it does complement a lot of the things I'll be talking about today. In fact, one of the underlying claims in this analysis is that Ichigo is the centerpiece of the story. Everything exists to supplement the hero's journey. Going over these very key aspects of the world and power system are absolutely crucial for the purposes of this video, hence why I call it the groundwork. A great deal of Ichigo's character work is delivered through subtext, which isn't rare at all for shounen manga. Stuff like visual symbols, allegories, and other elements of Bleach's writing that exist outside of Ichigo's individual character. Though in the case of Bleach, these elements of his character seem to be completely overlooked by a lot of people, which leads to terrible misconceptions and widespread misunderstandings in the general animaga community. Bleach and Kubo have developed a reputation of lacking thought, which is something I aim to address in studying practically every main aspect of the character. For a story that's over 700 chapters long, that pretty much demands a video of this length. To gain a truly comprehensive understanding of Ichigo, I'll be looking at everything surrounding him to discern what this main character is meant to represent in the overall framework of Bleach. There are some key design elements that go a long way in establishing the character. Ichigo's name, for example. Stated within the manga itself, his name means the one who protects. It's a Japanese name after all. Of course, that's not all that it means. The word is a homonym and has several meanings. It's also the word for strawberry and a way to say the numbers 1 and 5 in quick succession. Ichi go. Strawberry pops up a lot in jokes and sticks as Ichigo's main nickname, 15 is his age when the story begins, his favourite number, and his birthday. Kurosaki translates to dark destination, which is especially noteworthy when viewed as a part of his full name. Kurosaki Ichigo essentially meaning dark destination for the one who protects. Just his name can honestly be considered a semi-accurate summation of his journey. He repeatedly faces trials and tribulations and relentlessly he overcomes darkness for the sake of protecting not just his loved ones, but everybody. Ichigo places the well-being of others above his own, and confronts a great deal of suffering for entirely selfless reasons. But of course, this video wouldn't be as long as it is if it was ever that simple. There are countless shades and nuances that make this journey feel consistently fresh, original, and engaging. Every volume of Bleach begins with an epigraph in the form of a poem. A trend somebody pointed out to me is that the the poem typically comes from the perspective of the character on the cover, internally directed towards the character shown on the page of the poem. If both are the same character, then it serves as a thought directed inwards. To oneself. If they are different characters, then the character on the volume cover is directing their words to the character on the page of the poem. Volume 36 is a great example of this, a poem from Shinji's perspective directed towards Aizen, with the poem being called back to in the title of the chapter where they finally face off in fake Karakura Town. Volume 44 is another example, a poem from Tosen's perspective directed towards Komamura, which coincides with their dialogue contained in the same volume. I'll be sharing my own interpretations of many poems throughout this video as they inform various aspects of Ichigo's character. From my personal perspective, the story of Bleach is primarily a character study. It may not be as character centric as your typical study, but the ultimate purpose of the entire story is to follow the hero overcome his fears of death and the unknown and ultimately reach enlightenment, with the story being carefully and meticulously structured to achieve this purpose. 
Cyclicality is a crucial concept to Bleach's world building that informs various key elements of the narrative. The world continues to function as it does under a single pretense, balance, which is realized by the circulation of souls between the realms. Cycles by definition imply a lack of free will. Those caught in cycles have no choice or control over the flow of said cycle. They are victims and perpetrators of the same innate conflict. Ichigo breaks this cycle for various characters time and time again. Through his unshakable morals and steadfastness in his beliefs, Ichigo is an unstoppable force of change. But the ultimate cycle, the cycle of life and death, is one that Ichigo chooses to maintain rather than break. Yuhaba aimed to create a utopia wherein the shapes of life and death do not exist. All souls would exist in a solitary, almighty realm. The true world as he calls it. Ichigo at the beginning of the story would more than likely be supportive of Yuhaba's plans. He was plagued by grief in the death of his mother, a traumatic event that he always chalked up to the natural order of the universe. Death comes to all. This is perhaps the single fact that every single person watching this video can agree upon. Death is inescapable, guaranteed and terrifying. But over the course of his journey, Ichigo learns to appreciate the necessity of death. He learns that without death, life loses meaning. They are nexuses like love and hate. Life and death are necessary counterparts that cannot exist without the other. The realization and acceptance of this concept is the essence of Ichigo's character journey in simple terms. A journey that can interestingly be split into two near perfect halves. Not perfect in length, but definitely in form. The first half consists of chapters 1 to 4 to 3 culminating in the defeat of Aizen at the hands of Ichigo. And the second half consists of the remaining chapters, 424 to 686, culminating in the defeat of Yuhaba, again at the hands of Ichigo. These two sections of the story parallel, mirror, and complement each other in countless ways. They integrate the concept of cyclicality into the very structure of the narrative itself. With that being said, the groundwork has been established and we are ready to address my claims by assessing Ichigo's journey on an intimate level. I'll be tackling things chronologically whilst taking the entire manga into consideration so we can address things that are greatly impacted by later added context. This has easily been my most difficult project since I started making videos and I have poured hours on hours into this. If you've made it this far, I truly hope you do stick around until the very end because this is just the beginning. There are 686 chapters that make up the main story of Bleach, and they are numbered accordingly. But over the years of its serialization, Kubo did release some bonus chapters with unique numbering, often using decimal points to bridge between two issues of standard chapters. Of them, there are two that stand as the true beginning of Bleach, chapter 0 side A, the sand, and chapter 0 side B, the rotator. These two chapters function as a brief prelude that take place a small time before before the events of chapter 1, the two chapters respectively following the perspectives of Bleach's two main protagonists, Death and Strawberry. The Sand gives us some further insight into Ichigo's frame of mind at the start of the story, before he meets Rukia and is introduced to a brand new world. The poem of Bleach's first volume is We Fear That Which We Cannot See, and it functions as Ichigo's internal thought. Ichigo's fears are rooted in a lack of understanding. He fears is that which lies beyond death. He can see, touch, and speak to ghosts, but that's all. They just disappear after a while and he never knows what happens to them. But sometimes they leave behind spots of blood that only he can see and the faint smell of fear. In this specific instance, he's bringing a toy from home for a little boy who had just been eaten by a hollow. And Ichigo's anguish is on full display. He curses his own powerlessness, his lack of understanding. He curses his fear of the unknown and thus wishes for strength. A millstone is a large circular stone used for the purposes of grinding grist. This line is an allegory of humanity's powerlessness concerning the cyclical nature of life and death. Grist has 
no agency. It exists solely to be ground by the millstone. Humanity can do nothing in the face of death. Fate is a wheel, a spinning, uncontrollable cycle that robs you of the capacity to exert your own free will. So Ichigo wishes for strength, for a strong blade and enough strength to shatter fate. Ground grist resembles grains of sand, which coincides with the title of this all-important chapter, a motif that reappears in Ichigo's final adversary. A point that is missed by many people who started with the anime, as this material in this chapter was adapted into the filler arc. It being included at the end of the trailer for the new anime, which is supervised by Kubo himself, should communicate the importance of this line. Ichigo could have never known that the strength and knowledge of the afterlife he deeply desired was only a matter of moments away from him. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the Rotator, which provides a lot of insight into Rukia's frame of mind going into the assignment in Karakura Town. Apparently, she's been there before but doesn't remember it. Perhaps that last visit was when Urahara hid the Hogyoku within her soul. At a time just before the beginning of the manga, Rukia is feeling lonely and abandoned by Byakuya, who had yet to show any care for her. We also see Renji's promotion to assistant captain, which he originally plans to keep us surprise for Rukia's return. He could have never known the circumstances in which she would find out. Rukia's departure from Soul Society is accompanied by a monologue that complements Ichigo's from the previous chapter. The Shinigami's self-glorification as divine beings who dictate the flow of the universe is clearly outlined. They are to believe that the crushing wheel of life and death is guided by an infallible power, a clear nod to the Soul King who Shinigami have been indoctrinated into revering as the ruler of the universe. The contrast is made clear. Ichigo wishes to shatter fate, to challenge the status quo, and the Shinigami work to maintain it. They are in opposition from the outset. These two chapters lay the thematic backbone of Bleach. They are unequivocally significant in countless ways, as you'll see over the course of this video. With that firmly established, let's dive into the main storyline of Bleach. The Substitute Shinigami arc marks the beginning of the story and in turn the beginning of our main character's journey. The arc stands at a total of 70 chapters and serves a variety of foundational functions that ultimately aim to create an anchoring framework for the story to build upon over time. It is the introduction to both Ichigo's personal world and the greater world at large, set but never limited to our protagonist's hometown of Karakura. We learn about the existence of Shinigami, the different types of souls, the race of Quincy, the importance of balance, the circulation of souls, the existence of a realm known as Hell, the different types of hollows, and how they are born. The primary focus of this arc is to strengthen the bond between Ichigo and Rukia in preparation for the first grand arc in Soul Society as Ichigo steps into the special world. It also has the job of establishing a dynamic between the two namesakes of the story. It is through this relationship that we gain the best immediate understanding of Ichigo's character. Rukia presents him with the ability and capacity to protect his family, a debt he promises to repay by taking over her Shinigami responsibilities until she regains her power. He blamed himself for the attack on his family as it was ultimately none other than himself who had unintentionally drawn the hollows to his home. Constantly blaming himself for things outside his control is one of Ichigo's defining traits in this early section of his journey. Our story does not begin with Ichigo though, but rather Rukia, who is visually paired with a black swallowtail butterfly. She senses an enormous amount of spiritual energy, which she considers strange and so fell the sword of fate. Rukia will set the gears of Ichigo's journey in motion as the rotator. Ichigo is beating on some delinquents who knocked over a flower offering for a dead child. Despite his moody and somewhat brash exterior personality, he is immediately established as somebody with a soft heart and a great deal of empathy, the boy who can see ghosts. He was born with the ability to see the souls of the dear departed, which his limited perspective thinks might be connected to the fact his family runs the local clinic. The Kurosaki family is entrusted with the lives of the living, 
So naturally, Ichigo assumes that must be why he has the ability to see ghosts. When coupled with the aforementioned poem, there's irony to this detail. He sees far more than the average person, yet still, he fears that which he cannot see. Something that is further substantiated by the introduction of Rukia into his life. Despite seeing ghosts and realizing they disappear over the years, Ichigo never once questioned where exactly they go. He never pondered the existence of divine beings who govern those souls and transfer them to and from the afterlife. The Kurosaki family consists of the oldest son, Ichigo, a widower for a father, and two younger girls. Karin who can see ghosts and Yuzu who cannot. Ichigo's family means absolutely everything to him and he's incredibly overprotective of his siblings. He's not just the eldest son but the only son, both crucial details in understanding the life he has led so far. That firstborn syndrome, the natural sense of responsibility that comes as not just the eldest child but the only boy. In a Japanese town in the early 2000s meant to resemble the real world, it's fair to assume Ichigo was raised with contemporary family values. He sees it as his duty, his God-given role as the older brother, to protect and be there for his younger siblings. In this first meeting with Rukia, Ichigo makes it very clear he doesn't believe in anything until he sees it with his own eyes. We fear that which we cannot see is a nod to resignation in the face of fatalism. The idea that we are blind to the complete truth of the world and ignorance ultimately renders us helpless and powerless in the face of uncontrollable external factors. There is horror in the unknown. There is fear in what we cannot understand and conceptualize. Bleach immediately concerns itself with existentialism, crafting a world wherein people are targeted by invisible monsters characterized by death that feed on their souls, wherein people are governed by invisible deities that maintain the balance of the universe by transmitting people between the living world and the afterlife. Ichigo, in his ignorance, can see ghosts but doesn't see any further, blinded by the unknown. The first chapter works so well for this reason. Ichigo's ordinary life is completely transformed. Everything that happens to Ichigo in this first chapter is far removed from the logic he has always known and believed in. A massive flesh-eating monster has come to attack his family. Sure, he can see ghosts, but he's never seen a hollow. This is beyond what he's used to. And Rukia tells him that this hollow is here because of his extreme spiritual power for a human. It's his fault that this is happening. But in truth, the appearance of this hollow here was a calculated move by Aizen, a piece of his grander plan to help Ichigo realize his latent potential and develop him into a powerful individual. Even the very beginning of Ichigo's story is concerned with this bridge between fate and free will. Aizen crafted a situation that can be chalked up to fate with full belief that Ichigo's strong resolve would overcome it. He made use of the Hogyoku within Rukia, knowing she was suffering due to the death of Kai and had begun to feel disillusioned with the life of a Shinigami. He deploys her to Karakura Town for that very reason, to give birth to Kurosaki Ichigo, the substitute Shinigami. Ichigo couldn't just see ghosts, but Shinigami as well. His spiritual awareness was uncanny for a human. When placed under the Kido binding spell to keep him out of harm's way, he breaks through it through sheer force of will. And when Rukia was left with no other choice but to transfer her powers over to him, Ichigo gains a massive Zanpakuto unlike anything she's seen. He is immediately established as a special talent. This massive Zanpakuto he wields here is not a display of his Shinigami powers. Rather, it is his Quincy powers, a replica, a knockoff Zanpakuto crafted by old man Zangetsu, the source of Ichigo's Quincy powers. Rukia does in fact transfer her Shinigami powers over to Ichigo, but what this really means is she transferred her Reryoku over to him, which makes her Shihakusho turn completely white. That Reryoku combines with the Reryoku he already had, the mixture of Quincy, Shinigami, Fullbring, and Hollow, and old man Zangetsu, as the center of his power, suppresses white and controls what happens to Ichigo's Reryoku. Quincy's have the ability of crafting reishi constructs that serve as weapons, and the options are pretty much endless. They can craft snipers, bows, shields, swords, arrows, bombs, buildings, you name it. What Ichigo and everybody else thinks is his Zanpakuto is actually a manifestation of his Quincy powers that mimic the appearance and functionality of a Zanpakuto. Here it mimics Rukia's Zanpakuto. Later it gains
gains a unique appearance which still mimics the Zanpakuto. There's definitely an overlap between his Shinigami and Quincy powers and they technically are one and the same as Ichigo is a hybrid whose powers coalesce, even his hollow and fullbring powers. But the essence of his knockoff Zanpakuto stems from his Quincy powers, from old man Zangetsu, the center who controls the flow of his powers. Throughout this first arc we learn about Ichigo through those around him. His friendships paint a good picture of his character. Through Orihime we get to see more of his intense love for his younger siblings, his pride and honor as an older brother, something that will be further reiterated in the future of the story in his battle against Byakuya. Through Chad, we learn of his soft spot for outcasts like himself. Ichigo was discriminated against throughout his adolescent years for a number of reasons. His bright orange hair made him an easy victim of prejudice. His ability to see and speak with ghosts made him seem creepy and unapproachable. His closed, tough guy persona made him difficult to befriend and truly understand on a deeper level. We see how he can truly be himself around Chad. We see his empathy in his careful approach at dealing with Orihime as a victim of trauma, and we ultimately learn that Ichigo himself is a troubled youth with deeply rooted insecurities and self-loathing. Memories in the Rain is the third volume of Bleach, and perhaps serves the single most important role in the eight volumes of the Substitution Igami arc. This tragic tale of a night in the distant past is Ichigo's origin story the catalyst for a bulk of his psychological development through his formative years, making him the individual we meet in chapter 1, June 17th the death of his mother Masaki. This traumatic event was not only witnessed by Ichigo, but arguably caused by him, rendering it an unbearable memory that has been carved deeply into his soul. June 17th. That's the reason why he decided to protect them. The day Ichigo stopped smiling. As a child, Ichigo behaved and carried himself very differently. Alongside his bright orange hair was an equally bright smile, and a beautiful mother who shared his hair that he would constantly latch onto. Tatsuki viewed him as a weak, scrawny wimp at the time, constantly crying when he lost his fights at the dojo. But without fail, every single time he'd see his mother, he would stop crying and smile once again. He loved his mother very much, and that's why it stings as much as it does when Ichigo flat out states that it was he who killed her. He blames himself for her death and pushes away any attempt from Rukia to justify Masaki's death by way of hollows. Rukia immediately internalizes her understanding of his words, clasping her mouth at the shocking realization that Ichigo's self-blaming for Masaki's death is exactly because of the hollows and ghosts he has always been able to see. She was only adding fuel to the fire. Further the subconscious suspicions he's had about how his mother died ever since he learnt of the existence of Hollows. As a child, Ichigo struggled to tell the difference between the living and the dead. He has had the ability to see ghosts very clearly for as long as he can remember, making it difficult to distinguish between normal humans and the undead ghosts living amongst them. So he was used to being asked questions about who he's talking to, as he confuses the living and the dead, publicly speaking to things nobody else can see. He thought that if he just laughed it off and denied, it would be dropped. It didn't seem like a big problem. This may seem like a fairly simple detail, but it gives us a great deal to extrapolate from. Young Ichigo's thought process and attitude in response to questions of the inexplicable and unknown were very much that of an escapist, someone who lacks the necessary knowledge or even confidence to confront the unknown and seek truths. Yes, he was of course an innocent child, this kind of behaviour is expected, but that very mindset is exactly what he curses now six years in the future, a mindset he has still not yet escaped from. Ichigo loved his mother more than anybody. Never once did he see her cry or get mad. She was a bubble of joy that warmed him without fail. And now Ichigo understands that she did all this for him, that a parent's mood greatly affects their child and she remained calm and happy for his sake. Masaki was the center of the family's universe, the heart of the family. 
the sun that illuminated them all. As a young boy, Ichigo was told by his father the reason for his naming, that Ichigo means one who protects. And that's when he began thinking he wanted to protect his mother who always protected him. On that rainy day on the way back home with his mother, a young Ichigo sees a girl on a cliff's edge, who looked as if she was deciding whether or not to jump. And back then, Ichigo couldn't distinguish between the living and the dead. At first, I just wanted to protect my mother. Then my sisters were born and I wanted to protect them too. That's why I started going to the dojo. And as I gradually got stronger, I wanted to protect more and more people. It's worth noting that this monologue is coming from the perspective of Ichigo in the present, who is thinking back on the past and providing a self-assessment for his actions. He's digging into his thought process and it is here we learn a considerable amount about Ichigo's character. The yearning for strength as a means to protect people is something Ichigo has had even as a regular human child, before he ever knew about the existence of Shinigami and other supernatural entities. And most importantly, the desire to protect people, anybody. Ichigo's identity as a protector is not limited to just loved ones. They are naturally the focus of his efforts for a majority of the series because they're repeatedly targeted, but as a child, he wanted to protect more and more people, more than just his own family. There is an established link between gaining more power and wanting to to use that power to protect more people. And that beautiful outlook on life is what led to his mother's demise. The girl at the cliff's edge jumps and Ichigo follows, which forces Masaki to take the leap and sacrifice her own life for the sake of her child's. Or at least that's what Ichigo is made to believe at this stage in the story, as he wakes up hugged by the corpse of his mother. The same lines from earlier are repeated once again. Masaki was the center of their universe and Ichigo feels as if he tore the heart out of their universe. He blames and beats himself up over her death. Memories in the Rain is the origin story of Kurosaki Ichigo, but it's also the truth of Ichigo. The child we see in this flashback who chases after that girl on the cliff's edge is the truest, purest form of Ichigo there is. But in the present, Ichigo has grown to hate that child. Witnessing the death of your beloved mother as a kid would be a traumatic experience for anybody, but having only yourself to blame for it on top? That's another experience entirely. And so Ichigo can convinces himself that in order to continue on living, he had to change the way he views things. He began to curse the child he once was and stray further from his truth, beginning to live a lie. In the second chapter of the manga, we see Ichigo's current frame of mind with regards to being a protector. He refuses Rukia's request of him filling in for her, to carry out her duties as a Shinigami while she regains her powers. He has no care for those responsibilities. He doesn't want to face any more hollows and he only did in their first meeting in order to save his family. He proudly states that he's not that self-sacrificing and only protects the boy because Rukia pushes him to an extreme. She forces him to make a decision, placing him in front of the plus as he's being attacked by a hollow. Either you watch this child be eaten or you commit to all duties. There's no picking or choosing or convenience when it comes to the duties of a Shinigami. Before your eyes or out of your sight, they're going to be attacked either way. The conclusion Ichigo comes to here is that he will continue to serve as a Shinigami not for the purpose of protecting people but rather for repaying his debt to Rukia for allowing him to protect his family. This is a key distinction as younger Ichigo, the truest purest form of Ichigo, would be beyond delighted at the idea of being granted extreme power and the opportunity to protect so many people. But that rainy June 17th changed Ichigo. It has lessened and traumatized him. He begun to wear a mask to conceal his true emotions, going from positive and open to moody and defensive. He now considers it his duty to serve his family, not just as the loving older brother who wants to protect them, but as the one who destroyed the family. Protecting them is the least he could do. He cannot afford to be self-sacrificing because that attitude is exactly what led to the death of his mother. He detests that kind of mindset now. He needs to be around for the sake of his loved ones. It's not about protecting everybody anymore, but specifically protecting his family and friends. Ichigo is still so deeply traumatized by June 17th. So much so it has impacted the way he lives, breathes and conducts himself. Enter Grand Fisher. Ichigo's sisters are being attacked by a hollow, who takes the appearance of the same girl from that rainy day six years ago. The girl Ichigo chased after, which led to his mother's death. Rukia's suspicions have been confirmed. 
Ichigo's mother was in fact killed by a hollow, but it's still not that simple. Ichigo isn't yet absolved from his guilt, he still blames himself for Masaki's death because he fell for Grand Fisher's trap. But at least now he has someone to share that blame with, a monster he can use as an outlet for his anger. He immediately goes into attack, behaving recklessly and emotionally. He refuses Rukia's assistance, telling her to stay out of it because this one is personal. For the first time in the story thus far, Ichigo is fighting solely for himself, for his pride, for his honour and for vengeance. Yet still his behaviour is criticised heavily during the battle. He is fighting in a fit of rage, throwing himself blindly at his enemy. He is the furthest thing from cool and collected, a very crucial detail to note as Bleach places heavy emphasis on the importance of remaining calm in battle. As previously explained, powers are interlinked with the soul. Intense emotions interfere with one's ability to perform at their very best, and that is the key takeaway from this battle. Ichigo fails to defeat Grand Fisher because he is at war with himself. To make matters worse, Grand Fisher uses his abilities to recreate the image of Ichigo mother, forcing him to fight against the person he loved most. Ichigo faces his demons both literally and figuratively in this battle. Rukia recalls Kayan's honour, an incredibly important character in understanding Ichigo comprehensively. She comes to the conclusion that she must stay out of this battle to protect Ichigo's honour. If he manages to win because of her help, he will never get over it. There are two kinds of battles, fighting to preserve life and fighting to preserve honour. This battle definitely falls under the latter. Ichigo passes out and Grand Fisher escapes, with Rukia thanking Ichigo for surviving being the final scene of the battle. She too is deeply traumatised by the death of a loved one. When Ichigo gets up, he goes to his mother's grave and apologises for failing to avenge her death, but his father Ishin steps in to give his son some much needed wisdom. Them. Ichigo breaks into an emotional, childish outburst that does a great job of communicating his self-loathing. His father's simple, effortless rebuttal couldn't be more fitting. Why should I blame you? Why should I blame a 9 year old kid for going through something so traumatising and not having the ability to do anything about it? Masaki gave her life trying to protect her child, and that child is Ichigo. Instead of beating himself up over surviving, he should honour her last moments by trying to be happier, and in turn make making the most out of her sacrifice. It's a very natural, understandable train of thoughts, right? But for Ichigo, it was really tough to get there. He may present himself as a mature individual, and he typically is, but the guilt and self-loathing he feels has been there since he was 9 years old. That's the only way he's ever dealt with his trauma, by blaming himself. When it comes to that, he's still that same 9 year old, suffering just like he was back then. And here, Ishin frees him from his self-inflicted torture with just a few simple words by sharing a different perspective. And it is here we receive one of the most crucial developments in this first arc. Ichigo regains the desire to protect not just his loved ones, but everybody, to try and return to the child he once was. He asks Rukia to allow him to serve as a Shinigami for a little while longer. He yearns for strength so that he can protect as many people from the Hollows as possible, claiming he'll never be able to face his mother if he doesn't get to avenge her. And you know what the most interesting thing about this is? The fact he never does get to face off against Grand Fisher once more. His father Ishin ends up being the one to kill Grand Fisher, but that doesn't mean Ichigo doesn't get to avenge Masaki. The truth about Masaki's death allows him to avenge her in an even more significant manner, in the ultimate battle of the series against Yuhaba. The father and son both avenge their respective wife and mother by defeating the two people responsible for her death. Memories in the Rain comes to a close and the skeleton of Ichigo's character has been built. A young man who intends to overcome his own trauma by working to prevent anybody else from suffering a similar fate. To Ichigo, being a Shinigami means having the strength to protect. It's a direct extension from the mentality he had as a child. The following conflicts in the first arc serve to strengthen the previously established concepts. 
further developing Ichigo's character in subtle ways and introducing new ideas that will continue to be prevalent in the story until the very end. The Don Kanonji stretch is the first example of this. Beyond the lore and world building information we receive, this story is concerned with some of the most prominent themes of Bleach. The acknowledgement, or perhaps denial, of intangible concepts, things you can't see but may still exist. It follows up on the initial characterization of Ichigo as a skeptic who doesn't believe in anything he cannot see. Don Kanonji's way of thinking is the complete opposite of this, an incredibly idealistic self-proclaimed hero. Like Ichigo, he can see ghosts, he can see the chain of fate tugging at the holes in the chests of Demi Hollows, and so he performs exorcisms at live shows in which he tears the holes under the pretense that he is passing them on to the afterlife. In reality, he is only fastening the speed of their holification. Rather than freeing them of their suffering, he dooms them to an even worse form of suffering by turning them into hollows. Upon learning the truth of his actions, Kanonji is overwhelmed with guilt. The message here is that not everything is as it seems a message that is consistently hammered down throughout the story in numerous ways. You can't necessarily blame Kanonji for his theory. Chains are universally associated with a lack of freedom. They're used to enslave people, to lock and oppress. But in the case of Bleach, the chain of fate represents life. Breaking these chains doesn't free a person. It kills them when they're living, and turns them into a hollow when they are spirits. So these ideas of questioning everything you can see, the bridge between intent and reality, as well as the limits of what you can perceive with your eyes, are all raised here. These chapters very much echo the first thematic idea we spoke of, the idea of confronting that which you cannot see, the association between truth and what your eyes can observe. The background scenes of this arc are also concerned with this as the Karakura gang sense something supernatural taking place at the show. Naturally, Ichigo throwing himself into a supposed exorcism gone wrong is an incredibly ironic idea in the context of the entire story and the role he serves in this arc as a substitute Shinigami. We as readers know there is more to the world, and thus more to the true nature of the world, but the others cannot know for sure. They can only suspect, which is why there's talk of astrology and luck. Of course, Ichigo and Karin have always been able to see ghosts, but they never knew anything beyond what they could actually see. They could have never known about a soul society, about flesh-eating monsters that were once just like them, or about a king of this race called the Quincy who was tied to their mother and ultimately caused her death. This idea of grappling against things that aren't immediately clear to you is absolutely everywhere, and that's especially true in these five chapters for the Karakura gang. Chad, Tatsuki, and Orihime can all hear the cries of the Demi Hollow. Karin can obviously see it and has had concerns for Ichigo since the start of the story. The people spending time around Ichigo are being affected by his extremely potent Reryoku. This has been happening since the start of the manga, something Aizen later claims is connected to the Hogyoku and its ability to read the hearts of those around it. In the case of Chad and Orihime, there's also the fact that their fullbring abilities are awakening, which is increasing their Reryoku and in turn their perception of spiritual energy. To echo this fact, the chapter is titled Symptom of Synesthesia. Synesthesia is a neurological condition in which information meant to stimulate one of your senses stimulates several of your senses. For example, seeing a specific colour may evoke a certain sound in your ear, or hearing a certain sound may evoke a certain image in your eye and a certain taste in your mouth. In Buddhism, this idea of seeing what you hear and hearing what you see is considered one of the first steps towards enlightenment. We see a great example of this recently in the Jujutsu Kaisen manga. To perceive something invisible, something abstract and intangible, you must perceive everything else that is there. If you can see everything, then that must mean you can see nothing, as you are fully observant of everything else. It's a hard idea to wrap your head around, as it isn't particularly bound by logic, but something beyond logic, something formless, incomprehensible and undefined. But this idea of synesthesia itself is particularly interesting because of how it applies to the story at large, the connection between enlightenment and spiritual power. The more in tune you are with your soul, i.e. the more enlightened you are, the more powerful you should be. Generally speaking, that's one of the main rules of the overall power system. And this of course ties to the base building block of the story, the Kokoro, which I previously explained. So to accompany the chapter where the characters we are following are tapping into aspects of the world 
world that have always been foreign to them, that have always been invisible to them, Kubo uses synesthesia in the title. Another cool detail during this stretch is Urahara's role as a spectator. He helps transform Ichigo into his Shinigami state and watches over him as he fights against the Hollow. A small setup to how he lends a hand later in the arc and trains Ichigo for the purpose of rescuing Rukia. In this arc, Urahara displays concern for how Ichigo will behave, questioning his next move. This is interesting, considering there's no limit to Urahara's knowledge, especially regarding the deepest, darkest secrets of the universe. After all, he knows the truth of the Soul King. He knows Ichigo is a being of all races, so he probably knows that Ichigo is a worthy candidate to replace the Soul King. This scene is the first of many where Ichigo is being watched over by someone much further along than he is. His every move is closely observed by individuals who far surpass him in terms of power, from Urahara to Aizen to Yuhaba and even Ichibe. And speaking of being watched over, the national broadcast of this event is how Rukia's whereabouts were discovered by Soul Society. A section of this first arc that greatly benefits from later context is the introduction of Uryu Ishida, a Quincy who hates the Shinigami. He's incredibly intelligent and has been going to school with Ichigo all along right under his nose, even appearing in the prelude chapter. What's particularly interesting is that he comments on Ichigo's unusual aura even before he became a Shinigami, hammering home that Ichigo has always been special in some way, and he knows Rukia's true identity. He challenges Ichigo to a petty duel with hopes of determining who is superior, a Shinigami, or a Quincy. This duel is rather twisted. He uses hollow bait to draw hollows to Karakura. Whoever defeats the most hollows in 24 hours wins. While this is happening, Rukia heads over to Urahara to ask questions about the Quincy. We learn that they were a race of people scattered all over the world dedicated to fighting hollows. This first arc has a very linear progression. Everything moves forward, and so this section carries on the ideas explored previously. After using the baits, Uryu spurs Ichigo on by warning him that Hollows will attack anyone with high spiritual energy, and Ichigo immediately thinks of his sister Karin, who he knows is capable of seeing ghosts. What Ichigo doesn't know is that Karin isn't the only one in his close circle who would attract Hollows due to having high spiritual energy. Chad, Orihime, and even Tatsuki are liable victims. Hollows are flocking to Karakura Town at a ridiculous rate, and the situation is dire. With the sky itself cracking as these monsters traverse between the realms to crush their prey. A nod to the first page of this sub -arc. Chad is attacked by a hollow he can sense but not yet quite see when he bumps into Karin who can see it clear as day. She serves as his eyes as they both evade the hollow's attacks and question Ichigo's involvement with these monsters. This is when we receive a crucial backstory for Chad, the main lesson his grandfather left him with that shapes the core of his personality. Chad was picked on for being different growing up, but he learned to embrace his identity despite that and cherish his features. His grandfather taught him to be kind, to use his fists not to hurt people but to protect his mighty body and use them for good. By thinking back to this conversation and yearning for power, Chad unlocks unbelievable power and activates his forebring abilities, the right arm of the giants. And of course he gains the ability to see spiritual beings, a higher level of perception but he still has absolutely no clue what's going on, where his power came from and how he could see the hollow. A Fullbringer has an affinity to a particular thing that ties into their identity, their soul itself. In the case of Chad, it is his mighty body, the skin he is proud of, the symbol of his heritage. It materializes into an armor that covers his entire right arm, which grants him enhanced strength and durability. On the other side of town, Orihime is about to undergo a very similar transformation. Unlike Chad, had, she has already reached the level of spiritual energy that allows her to see spiritual beings, and so, when the hollow arrives, it immediately catches her frightened gaze. Overwhelmed by fear, she instantly thinks to run, but intends to do so without scaring the others out of consideration. She pretends like nothing's wrong, but that doesn't work, and then they're forced into battle against the Hollow, when Tatsuki is almost killed. And that is when she activates her own Fullbring abilities, the Shinshun Rika, or Six Princess Shielding Flowers. They manifest from her hairpin, which she associates with her late brother, and her long hair, which symbolizes her trust in Tatsuki. 
Like Chad, Orihime was bullied for something she was born with, the colour of her hair. Tatsuki as her best friend who has protected her since her brother's death allowed her to feel comfortable and grow her hair once more. And it is only once she expresses the desire to protect Tatsuki that Orihime activates her powers. The experience both Chad and Orihime go through here may seem like typical power of friendship battle shown in storytelling, but there is far more to this than meets the eye in the overarching context of the story. These are two characters who have been discriminated against for things they were born with. The colour of skin and hair. Things that are determined for you that you have no control over. Things that fall under the natural order of the universe. Things you can most definitely ascribe to fate. They both embrace these core aspects of their identities and they are rewarded for it with powers beyond their imagination. To wholly accept yourself, to embrace every single thing about you, even the things you have zero control over, like your height, skin colour, racial background and so forth, is typically considered one of the first steps to self actualization and enlightenment the ultimate destination of Ichigo's journey. And these two moments from his two close friends very early in the story is a microcosmic expression of this idea that reverberates through every corner of this story. The poem of the fifth volume continues this thread, presenting Urahara's perspective who denounces the existence of fate in hopes of ascribing it a consequence of ignorance and fear. Free will is stolen by fate. The mere notion of fate denies any real agency. It likens fate to a rapid river, an end endless stream of water that rushes in a fixed direction, but only if you remain ignorant and afraid. Fate does not apply to those with the courage to march forward relentlessly, despite anything and everything. That is the mentality of one of the two men who set the gears of Ichigo's story in motion. Urahara rationalises the activation of Chad and Orihime's powers as a direct result of coming into contact with Ichigo in his Shinigami form. He has extraordinary Reryoku, but his ability to control it is limited, so he emits a very concentrated energy that can affect those around him. As mentioned previously, there's far more to this than just that, like the Hogyoku and the fact that both Chad and Orihime are forebringers. This is addressed very ambiguously as Urahara claims Ichigo played a role in accelerating the activation of their latent inborn powers. He tells them they don't need to understand what they've been told, that their transformation isn't a disease but rather a key a key to a new world. You don't need to know the cause and there's no need for sadness. What comes next is entirely up to you. Remain in ignorance or use your key to enter a world with a monstrous enemy. All of the hollows in Karakura as well as all of the cracks in the sky converge into a single spot, and what follows is the appearance of a Gillian Menos Grande, the amalgamation of several normal hollows. And at the same time we learn about the Quincy alongside Ichigo. 200 years ago, a genocide was carried out by the Shinigami which massacred the majority of Quincy. This was seemingly done to prevent the collapse of the universe, but it's absolutely crucial to note that the character delivering this information is none other than Rukia. She serves as our lens into the history of the Quincy and her knowledge is taken directly from Urahara and has been tainted by Shinigami biases. They were once known as balances as the essence of their existence is to maintain the balance of the universe by averaging the number of souls present in all realms. In truth, the Shinigami are really just glorified data analysts with an exacerbated sense of self-worth and divinity. In fact, the very idea that Shinigami are divine entities is brought into question several times over the course of the story. And this chapter, where we first learn about the Quincy Massacre, is a brilliant sign of things to come. The chapter is titled Carnides, Back to Back, and it's accompanied by a colour page that illustrates a rift between Ichigo and Uryu. They are mirrored, as if to say they aren't so different from each other. The title is especially noteworthy, as Carnides was a philosopher and perhaps the most prominent of the Skeptical Academy in ancient Greece. This is Kubo's subtle way of telling us to be sceptical of the information in this chapter, that once again, not everything is as it seems. And of course we learn this much later on in the story when it comes front and centre in the narrative for the Thousand Year Blood War. Ichigo is confronted with this information and forced to make a decision. Will he act in a way that serves the Shinigami's customs, or will he diverge from them, creating his own path? Like almost everybody in the cast, Uryu is also suffering from the death of a loved one. He grieves for his grandfather, 
who died due to the shortcomings of the Shinigami. Soken taught his grandson not to discriminate between anybody, that being a Quincy or Shinigami doesn't matter. His philosophy was that ultimately, these two races who are fundamentally opposed could coexist. They could fight together, as a team back to back, which is something Ichigo immediately understands and hopes to accomplish alongside Uryu. Ichigo's ability to place himself in somebody else's shoes and see their perspective is uncanny. He constantly looks beyond the surface and digs at the core of any given situation, but he fails to do so for himself, which is consistently his greatest flaw throughout the story. He opens up to Uryu here with a very mature outlook. He proposes mutual survival as the reason Quincy and Shinigami should overcome their differences. Of course, there are many things he doesn't know that stand in the way of this, but he knows that and addresses it. He only recently became a Shinigami and all he knows for certain is that he wants to defeat Hollows. He gains Uryu's sympathy by sharing his own experience with grief, the loss of his mother. And he commits himself to a life of fighting against the Hollows in hopes of preventing anybody else from suffering the same fate he and his family fell victim to following the death of his mother. Much like Sorken, seeing sad faces pains Ichigo, and so he wants to protect as many people as he can. Together, they overcame the huge number of Hollows that surrounded them, until finally, the Menos Grande appeared. Ichigo's extreme level of spiritual energy is leaking into the surrounding environment which serves as an extra source of power for Uryu, while Chad and Orihime observe from a distance and contemplate whether they should enter the new world they've been exposed to. And finally, Ichigo has his first major breakthrough in terms of power as he learns to control his output of spiritual energy and pressurize it into a massive strike that chases off the Menos Grande. Tessai makes an ominous comment about Ichigo's potential if he learns to control his power. Perhaps he will be in time. What exactly Tessai is referring to is a mystery. Even now, there is no direct follow-up to his words, but there are countless directions we can take this. Ichigo begins to lose control over his powers, which reshapes his Zanpakuto and poses a threat to the surrounding environment, which prompts Uryu to interject and stabilize the situation by dispelling the excess spiritual energy into the atmosphere. Think of it like putting out a fire by removing the fuel, slowly but surely. The reshaping of Ichigo's Zanpakuto further points towards its real nature as a Quincy ratio construct. When have we ever seen a Zanpakuto twist and bend like this? Uryu begins to assess his own behaviour and acknowledges how far removed it is from his grandfather's ideals. He acknowledges that his reckless behaviour was a projection of his insecurities, his hatred for the Shinigami serving as a coping mechanism for his own shame and shortcomings. He curses his own weakness for being unable to risk his life in protecting his master and instead watching his death in hiding as a powerless spectator. Uryu's character serves as a foil to Ichigo, an individual who has undergone a very similar traumatic experience, the death of a loved one at the hands of the Hollows. But they respond to this very, very differently. Ichigo pointed his rage inwards, blaming himself for not being strong enough to protect his mother, and Uryu pointed his rage towards the Shinigami, blaming them for not making it in time to prevent his grandfather's death. But there is a strong similarity in how they overcome their grief. They both learn to move beyond it by embracing the lessons left behind by their loved ones. They learn to honour their sacrifices and choose to live in service of their loved one's ideals. For Ichigo, this means protecting people and for Uryu, this means working towards a world where Quincy and Shinigami can indeed coexist. The ultimate message here being that you cannot bring people back from the dead, but you can give life to their philosophies by inheriting their wills. The similarities between these two men are directly addressed within the story by Mizuhiro. This stretch of chapters comes to a close with a mission report to locate the missing personnel and criminal Rukia Kuchiki of Squad 13. We immediately dive into the penultimate stretch of this arc, as two masked Shinigami arrive in Karakura Town, as Rukia expected following the appearance of the Menos Grande. They are here to capture or kill Rukia, for reasons currently unbeknownst to the reader. This is of course the entrance of Byakuya 
and Renji. They suspect her powers were stolen by a human and Renji demands she expose his whereabouts when Uryu intervenes before being completely overpowered. He manages to buy just enough time for Ichigo to arrive on the scene who also gets his ass completely handed to him. Ichigo is vastly outmatched here but he still has a fairly impressive showing and manages to gain the acknowledgement of Renji. His ridiculously oversized Zanpakuto, abnormal spiritual pressure, tenacity and unwillingness to surrender almost buys him the win before Byakuya steps in and completely destroys him. Not only does he defeat Ichigo but he seals his Saketsu and Hakusui which seals his Shinigami powers. Ichigo is left bleeding out on the ground, powerless before real Shinigami as they traverse back to the Soul Society and leave him to wallow alone in the rain. The title of both this volume and the chapter the battle ends in is Broken Coda. A coda is a concluding event in music, dance and even writing. This is, for all intents and purposes, Ichigo's final dance as a substitute Shinigami. The twilight of his short-lived tenure as the protector of Karakura Town. A broken conclusion as he is left completely defeated at the end of it all. These chapters are chock full of foreshadowing and setup for plot threads that rise to prominence much later in the story, such as the similar appearance between Ichigo and Kayen. Byakuya correctly theorizes that Rukia's attachment to Ichigo is tied to the fact that he looks just like him. Another example of this is the idea of Ichigo being a nameless boy who has an unusual Zanpakuto. Nameless in this instance referring to the fact Ichigo doesn't even know his Zanpakuto's name, a sign of his incompetence as a Shinigami and ignorance in the face of the real deal. However, it serves as a double entendre. It also refers to Ichigo's identity crisis and ignorance regarding his own lineage. The truth, the real truth we learn nearly 500 chapters later, is that this Zanpakuto isn't really a Zanpakuto, as previously explained. This overwhelming defeat for Ichigo is a direct mirror of Memories in the Rain. A loved one he associates with a core aspect of his identity was taken from him and he was spared. Masaki was the symbol of his desire to protect people and she was killed by a hollow. Rukia is the symbol of his power to protect people and she is captured by the Shinigami. And in both scenarios, Ichigo is left alone, covered in blood as the rain falls. Urahara arrives to present Ichigo with the means and power to save Rukia from the Shinigami. He gives him a rude awakening, a reality check. He forces Ichigo to confront his own weakness and finally offers to train him in preparation for an infiltration of Soul Society. Ichigo is pulled from the depths of despair and the rain stops. He now has something to fight for once again. He spends one last day at school before summer vacation and realizes absolutely everybody has forgotten about Rukia. She is completely erased, a blank, gone from the hearts and minds of everybody in the world of the living. That is what it means to return to the soul society, gone from the minds of everyone in the normal world, all but Ichigo, Orihime, Chad and Uryu who aren't a part of the ordinary world anymore. They can see and remember things that normal people simply cannot. A crucial interaction between Ichigo and Orihime follows where she displays a deep understanding of the kind of person Ichigo is. She questions his motives in saving Rukia, presenting a real realistic perspective on the matter. Rukia was never from the human world. The Soul Society is her real home. Everything she has ever known is all over there, so is it truly the right thing to do to insert yourself in matters that honestly don't concern you? It's a much needed viewing of the situation, one that Orihime both addresses and resolves by answering the questions she brings up with what Ichigo would say. She validates then subsequently dispels his doubts regarding his dilemma and that's why she's so important to him. She knows him better than almost anybody. And finally, she calls Chad and makes up her mind. Together they will use their newfound abilities to to venture into this terrifying world that they've been exposed to, and thus, summer vacation begins. We see Rukia as a prisoner and learn of the execution preparations that have been put in place, and as this is happening in the Soul Society, Ichigo is making his own preparations in the world of the living. Placed into the shattered shaft, his chain of fate begins to encroach at a ridiculous rate. Ichigo has 72 hours to either become a Shinigami and survive, 
all become a hollow and die. 70 hours pass and Ichigo is exactly where he started, completely powerless and no further in escaping the pit. The final encroachment is coming and it will be far worse than anything he's experienced so far. His face begins to hollowfy, which is unusual as usually the Kompaku bursts into pieces and rearranges into a hollow. The fact that the hollow mask is coalescing while his body is still whole is a sign of his resistance. And then it happens. Ichigo enters some kind of vision, his inner world. A cloaked figure calls out to him and approaches him. After being asked for his name, the man responds, don't you know? I'm something. His name is blocked out and doesn't get through to Ichigo, framed like a glitch in the matrix, like it was forcibly stripped from Ichigo's conscience, teared out of his psyche. This is his spiritual world, and the blocking of Old Man Zangetsu's name is yet another double entendre. Initially, it is framed as Ichigo failing to understand himself, to recognize the extension of his soul, his Zanpakuto. This directly carries off of Renji's mocks a few chapters ago. Ichigo not knowing the name of his Zanpakuto is a point of weakness, something he'll come to know with time. The second meaning is particularly interesting and it lies in the fact that this spirit is actually the representation of Ichigo's Quincy powers, who not only shares the appearance of Yuhaba from a thousand years ago, but exists within Ichigo as a piece of Yuhaba's soul. Ichigo removes his name from the annals of history in the distant future, which is why the text is blocked. Unbeknownst to Ichigo at this point, this spirit is merely pretending to be his Zanpakuto and serves his own agenda. The surrounding environment of Ichigo's inner world functions as a visual representation of the core meaning of this scene. This kind of environmental storytelling is present in every single scene in this inner realm in the depths of Ichigo's soul. Here Ichigo wakes up in the dimension sitting on the edge of a skyscraper. His world is tilted at a 90 degree angle, a visual indication of not just the abstract nature of the realm but Ichigo's poor foundations. He is lost and confused, his world has been tilted on its head. The spirit tells Ichigo that he has his own Shinigami powers, that Byaku Rukia only sealed the power given to him by Rukia and that he must now activate and access his own latent abilities. The world begins to fall apart, to crumble. And as it does, Ichigo falls, sinking into the water beneath what he visualized as the ground. Natural law doesn't exist in this dimension. After all, this is happening in Ichigo's head. But it's still happening, and it has terrific impacts on the outside world. Countless boxes fall at Ichigo, pieces of the disintegrating world. And in one of those boxes lies Ichigo's own power. He identifies the correct box and pulls the hilt of a Zanpakuto out of it, which brings back his consciousness and takes him back to the real world. At this point, Ichigo's chain of fate is mere seconds away from being completely encroached, and so he has almost completely taken the form of a hollow. He emerges from the smoke as a figure with a hollow's mask and a Shinigami Shihakusho. I'm not going to explain this double meaning as it's fairly obvious, but Kubo sure loves to reshape your perception of earlier material. The combination of Shinigami and hollow is especially noteworthy, because that's exactly what his Shinigami powers are. His Asauchi is a hollow which fused with his Shinigami powers making them practically one and the same. And to top it all off, this combined appearance hides the true source of most of his spiritual power, the center of all his powers, Old Man Zengetsu and Ichigo's Quincy power. He pulls the mask back, revealing his face, and we immediately enter Urahara's third trial. To complement Ichigo's official yet simultaneously not so official birth as a real Shinigami, with just his own powers and nothing borrowed from Rukia, we switch perspectives to Soul Society. Rukia is officially to be executed in a mere 25 days, and we're also introduced to Gin and Kempachi. The first interaction between captains, higher ups of this divine race of death gods, is one of hostility snide and aggression. It's not the kind of behavior you would expect from the ones who govern the universe and live in the apparent paradise that is the soul society. Things are not as they seem, and I think it's noteworthy that Kubo immediately makes that clear here, instantly touching up on ideas of classism, nobility, law, and order. These final chapters of the Substitute Shinigami arc are not only conclusive for their own arc, but serve as stepping stones to the first large-scale conflict and storyline of Bleach, the next arc, the soul society. Urahara reveals himself as a Shinigami and immediately flexes his superiority by calling out to his Zanpakuto by name, prompting Ichigo to remember Renji's words and internalize his own weakness. This is the Blade and Me. 
Ichigo begins to sink into extreme thoughts of self-ridicule, questioning his actions, his fear, his resolve, calling himself pathetic and shameful. A coward beyond all redemption. That's you. A very interesting choice of words to say to himself, afraid and irredeemable. This is fear, and it is Ichigo's first real obstacle, one that follows him for most of this story. But here Ichigo's resolve wins this tug of war against fear. He calls out to the name of his Zanpakuto, which comes to him naturally and gains a new big sword. Thank you! He gains ridiculous power and we receive even more reason to believe that Ichigo is simply built different when he subconsciously uses the Getsuga Tensho. For the Karakura gang, summer vacation has just started and Ichigo acknowledges that this may very well be his last vacation. He's about to embark on a journey that, in all likelihood, will cost him his life. The gate to the Dangai is opened and Yoruichi gives them one last moment to turn back. This is do or die. There's no turning back from passing through this gate and venturing into Soul Society. And in order to even make it to the Soul Society, you must have an unshakable resolve, a desire to get there. As I've repeatedly made clear, the Kokoro informs every single aspect of this story and its world. The will to go forward will serve as a guide to reaching Soul Society. Have no doubts, no fear. Do not stop or look back. Do not think of those you're leaving behind. Just go forward. Even reaching the Soul Society is a trial in of itself, a trial of resolve. And so they pass through the gates which marks the end of Bleach's first arc. We have only covered just over 10% of the manga so far and we're already so deep into the video, but there's a good reason for that. I wanted to spend as much time as possible on this first arc because it's typically brushed over by many people in the Bleach community. It's nowhere near as ambitious or developed as practically every other arc in the series, but it has unrivaled significance as the foundation everything else rests upon. To understand the middle and end, you must have good understanding of the beginning. This arc is structured very simplistically with a monster of the week formula as we follow Ichigo fight hollow after hollow whilst learning about the world of the main characters. It gets more suspenseful as the chapters go on, ultimately reaching its peak with Ichigo's defeat against Byakuya and subsequent imprisonment of Rukia. And it doesn't end with a conclusive statement, but rather immediately transitions into the next story arc. But despite that simple structure, it is chock full of fundamental elements that inform almost every aspect of the story henceforth. Taking everything I I've spoken about so far on the macro, this first arc already establishes Ichigo as a pretty good character. He's multifaceted, he has a tragic origin story that informs a lot of his decision making and character traits, he is both filled with purpose and integrity while searching for deeper meaning and self understanding, and he's a freak of nature from a power perspective. He has already grown a considerable amount in just this first arc examples of this being what he fights Hollows for, his attitude regarding his mother's death and earning a stronger sense of responsibility. But all of this growth is surely going to be put to the test in a matter of chapters as he leaves the ordinary world and embarks on his journey into the special world where Hollows fear to tread. The events that follow are known in the Soul Society as the Ryoka Invasion. Ryoka meaning traveling evil, which is used to identify those who are not aligned with the Soul Society. It's said that no good can come from Ryoka. Our protagonists are the intruders as they storm a holy land, defiling their traditional customs. While passing through the Dangai, Ichigo and his group are chased by the Kototsu, which results in a gain of eight days due to a time anomaly. The bizarre time mechanics of the Dangai is a point that crops up later on in the story, being of service to Ichigo in providing him time when racing against the clock. Ichigo crosses the border into the Seirete, which triggers the gates of the Salt King Palace to come down crashing, and of course the appearance of Jidambo, the gatekeeper of this west gate. We immediately see the fruits of Ichigo's training, the experience he has gained from fighting against Urahara for five days straight. He had always been a monster of natural talent, but now he has substantial experience to accompany that as well experience that will only grow and improve over the course of his countless battles in this invasion. He makes short work of Jidambo, effortlessly defeating him with an incredible strike. This is the same gatekeeper, said to have the power to kill 30 hollows with a single swing of his axe. In the 300 years of his gatekeeping, not a single person has ever crossed into the Seirete past him. Surprisingly, Ichigo immediately gains the respect and admiration of Jidambo, a neat detail in retrospect, especially considering 
during its placement. Ichigo may be the evil intruder who has come to disturb the peace of Soul Society, but in time he becomes their hero, the one who saves them time and time again. Jidambo shows a lot of respect for Ichigo, allowing him and the team to pass through the gate, which isn't so unusual given the way Soul Society is fashioned in a way resembling feudal Japan. Jidambo accepting defeat and looking up to his martial superior is expected and in line with those social values. But it's the last part of the interaction that's especially noteworthy. Jidambo tells Ichigo to be careful and that there's a bunch of mean guys inside the Seirete. He opens the gates only to see exactly the kind of person he was speaking of. Ichimaru Gin, captain of the third company, the cold snake who immediately cuts off his arm. A gatekeeper ain't supposed to open gates. Ichigo's name, the colour of his hair and the size of his zanpokuto make him immediately recognisable to the captain, who sends him packing back into the Rokongai. An easy to miss detail in this chapter is the Okame or end of chapter sketch that shows Renji peeking from the shadows and observing the confrontation, a subtle sign of his current dilemma. He does not want Rukia to be executed but he must abide by the rules and his duty as a Shinigami. In the Rukongai, we see more of the injustices present in the Soul Society. The plight of the Rukongai residents, the fact that they consider the Shinigami a bunch of bullies, the fact they're friendly to a group of evil intruders. Clearly not everything is as it seems. Rukia is being executed for breaking the law while delivering a family from harm. Should that not be sufficient cause for overriding the law as it is? The souls residing in the Rukongai are left trapped in a state of limbo as they await resurrection. They are never reunited with their families and live in families made up of strangers. They're given numbers that represent the order of their death and sent to different districts. Something Chad notes is very businesslike. Because it is very businesslike. The system maintained by the Shinigami, the gods of the universe, is incredibly flawed and that is made abundantly clear right at the outset of this storyline. Fitting, considering this arc is all about challenging the status quo and instilling change change in a fundamentally corrupt society tainted by conformism and extremist legalism. We meet the Shivas, the family Ichigo never finds out he's related to, and they aid in bypassing the Seirete security by using the shooting star. The death of Kayen is implicitly mentioned, which serves to build up a later moment between Ganju and Rukia, and in the meantime, Aizen is introduced and adding fuel to Renji's pre-existing suspicions about Rukia's execution. What Kubo is going for here is is a conflict shroud in mystery and moral ambiguity. There are people in the shadows pulling the strings and almost everybody included in this conflict has their own unique motives. In order to pierce through the sphere of reishi that circumnavigates the Seireite, our main group needs to infuse their own reishi into a cannonball that can penetrate through the defense system. In order to do so, they must control and concentrate their reishi into the cannonball, creating a perfect stable sphere, something considered to be the basic form of all spells. Orihime Chad and Uryu pick this up fairly quickly, but Ichigo is struggling to make it happen. This is when he opens up to Ganju and explains his motivations regarding the invasion and desire to save Rukia. He denies that saving Rukia is that important to him, whether this is true or otherwise is besides the point. The point is that Ichigo considers it his responsibility to save Rukia as the subject of her crime. She's being executed for giving her powers to him, for allowing him to save his family, and he is not the kind of loser who can just sit back and watch her be killed without at least trying to save her. His motivations are pointed inwards. This mission is less about Rukia and more about himself, affirming the individual he thinks he is. It's about principle and the standard Ichigo holds himself to, as well as the debt to Rukia he still considers unpaid. Expressing himself in such a way gains Ichigo the respect of Ganju, who gives him a massive tip in stabilizing and concentrating his reishi into the cannonball. Ganju tells Ichigo to visualize visualize a perfect circle in his mind. The darker, the heavier, the better. Then imagine yourself diving into the center of that circle. If you're even slightly familiar with Buddhist philosophies, you'll know that this is clearly inspired by the concept of Ensor. The Ensor is a sacred symbol in Zen Buddhism that is traditionally drawn in a single brushstroke, as a meditative practice of letting go of the mind and allowing the body to create. It symbolizes absolute enlightenment, infinity through emptiness, the cyclic nature of life and death, as well as Mu, the void. The Ensor exemplifies 
exemplifies many core philosophies of Buddhism that ultimately aim to achieve a state of equanimity, complete calmness and composure in hopes of reaching enlightenment. The visualization of a circle allowing Ichigo to relax and overcome the first of many trials in this arc is a perfect fit. It ties into the concept of the Kokoro and the inherent link between power and the state of your soul absolutely flawlessly. This is how you get stronger in Bleach. You harness your abilities by fine-tuning your relationship with yourself through meditation and looking inwards throwing yourself into yourself. In doing so, Ichigo immediately masters the technique and showcases extreme amounts of spiritual pressure. Ganju joins the main group and before the infiltration is made official, he proudly proclaims his motives in accompanying them on this death wish. He tells us about his older brother's death, the death of Kai and Shiba, how he was a prodigy in the Shinigami Academy and rose to the ranks of assistant captain in only five years. But then he was killed, betrayed by the Shinigami he thought were his friends, that the one who killed his brother had the face of a demon lord, and that for some reason, Kayan looked happy in his final moments and thanked the Shinigami who took his life. Once again, everything is not as it seems, and Ganju is joining them on their invasion out of curiosity. Why did his brother believe in them to the bitter end? He's seeking answers and hoping that Ichigo, who isn't like the other Shinigami, can hopefully guide him to that answer, to learn what a Shinigami really is. This interaction is integral to the remainder of the arc as the idea behind what a Shinigami is, how a Shinigami should behave and carry themselves, is consistently challenged, questioned and just generally explored throughout the entirety of this arc. Finally, they enter the Seireite and the invasion truly begins. The group is separated and we immediately dive into the first of many battles in this invasion. Kurosaki Ichigo versus Madarame Ikaku, the substitute Shinigami versus the third third seat of the 11th company. Ichigo defeats Ikaku relatively quickly. It's by no means an easy win, but he isn't pushed to any extreme. He takes a few hits and quickly adapts until finally finishing him off. This fight is drawn incredibly well, with smooth flowing choreography and brilliant brushwork to accentuate the speed and impact of their exchanges. But what we're interested in today is the character implications, most of which come from their brief conversation following Ikaku's defeat. Ichigo not only spares Ikaku's life, but uses his styptic medicine to stop his bleeding a sign of his compassion to all. Though unsurprising for a shonen protagonist, the fact Ichigo doesn't kill his opponent is noteworthy, especially because they've mostly been hollows up until this point. And Ikaku's response is very telling. By being saved, he now feels shamed. He isn't appreciative or glad that Ichigo spared him, which is a mentality shared by many of the Shinigami as a result of their collective philosophies. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, and neither does it really change over the course of the story, but Ichigo's response is striking. He isn't too far from sharing that very mindset. He too felt shame for surviving the hollow attack that killed his mother. And the real reason he saved Ikaku wasn't because he's compassionate and doesn't want to kill anybody. That's a part of it, sure, but really, Ichigo wants to know where Rukia is. His core motivation here informs almost every decision he makes to save Rukia, to live to the standard he has set for himself and be true to his word. That's the key thing. Ikaku's willingness to share Rukia's location out of sheer disregard for her planned execution further supplements the pre-established profile of soul society and Shinigami in general. This system flaunts itself as principled and righteous through the likes of Byakuya and Yamamoto, while simultaneously lacking order and uniformity through self-serving individuals like Gin and now Ikaku. But of course, Ikaku doesn't think Ichigo will even be able to save Rukia because of a certain pointy-haired captain, Zaraki Kenpachi, the Blood Knight. Uryu's insane progression in power is worth noting for the purposes of this video. Unlike Chad and Orihime, Uryu is genuinely comparable to Ichigo in terms of power. He's a prodigy of immense talent and that is showcased wonderfully here, with his growth on full display as he makes short work of Shinigami. At the same time, we see Orihime grappling with her lack of growth, the fact that she has remained relatively stagnant since she first gained her powers. Another noteworthy point that will rise to further significance later in the video. Ichigo and Ganju are reunited and meet Hanatoro of the 4th Division. They try to use Hanatoro as a hostage, which only gets them mocked and laughed at. The heartlessness of many Shinigami within the Gote 13 is on full display, and it only adds to this corrupt image of the Shinigami that Kubo has been painstakingly portraying to the reader. This is not a good place, and these are not good people. 
Hanotoro offers to provide them with a route to the Senzaikyu where Ukiya is being held captive. Something Ichigo questions. Why help us intruders when that almost guarantees the death penalty? It turns out that Hanotoro as part of the medical division who were assigned to the more menial tasks was given cleaning duties in the detention area Rukia was previously held in. The stuff he shares with Ichigo here might seem pretty simple but how Ichigo internalizes the information is what we're interested in. At first Hanotoro was afraid of Rukia as a member of a noble family. Understandably as the soul society is fundamentally classist as an aristocracy. They place extreme power in the hands of the elite so Hanotoro was very careful about how he addressed Rukia even as a prisoner. But Rukia corrects him. She tells him to use her name and not refer to her as Miss Kuchki. She was kind which was unexpected and relieving. And so every day she would share stories with him about her time in the human world and much of what she had to say was about Ichigo. How she trusted him regardless of how little time they'd known each other for and how she blamed herself for coming into his life. That because of her his fate had been twisted. That she'd hurt him terribly and could never make up for what she'd done to him. Hearing this angers and invigorates Ichigo as he feels the exact same way. He thinks he's to blame and he's the one who owes her an immense debt. And this works as well as it does primarily because of what immediately follows. The appearance of Renji, one of the two people who captured Rukia and is therefore the subject of most of Ichigo's anger. What follows is the first battle in Bleach that can truly be considered a clash of ideals. Most of the battles in Bleach can be viewed as such but everything up until this point was focused on flesh out the protagonist as they overcome obstacles in the form of hollows or basic antagonists who simply stand in their way like Ikaku. But this? This is very different. Renji is genuinely intrigued by Ishigo. He wishes to understand why he fights so desperately to save Rukia, a human who spent just two months with her and doesn't know the first thing about her world. Renji confronts Ichigo with reason and sound logic. He tells him there are 12 other assistant captains just as strong as him and then 13 captains who are even more powerful. How can Ichigo hope to overcome each and every single one of them? How can Ichigo have the audacity to want to save someone who is only in that position because he took their powers? Ichigo takes all of this head first and highlights that it is precisely because all of this is his fault that he must save her or at least die trying. It is Ichigo's steadfastness, his unwavering resolve that wins him this battle. Even after losing so much blood and being knocked down time and time again by Renji, he gets back up. He gets sliced across the chest, he gets back up. And Renji at this point in time is in a state of mind that is the furthest thing from resolved. He's having a moral crisis. He thinks somebody may be behind Rukia's execution but feels powerless in the face of the Shinigami's corrupt system. In the face of Ichigo's resolve, Renji is absolutely defenseless. This clash of ideals is completely one-sided, as Ichigo is truly in tune with what he believes in, whilst Renji is only saying things he has been indoctrinated into believing. And as this is happening, we get cuts back to Ichigo's training with Urahara that encapsulate these ideas. The Zanpakuto is the manifestation of the soul, it resonates with exactly what you're feeling. If you're afraid, that will be reflected in your blade. That is the lesson Urahara taught Ichigo, and that's exactly the difference between Ichigo and Renji in this battle. Ichigo's sword resonates with the resolve to kill Renji, whilst Renji's sword resonates with his indecisiveness and deeply rooted feelings of powerlessness. Deep down he wants Ichigo to defeat him and save Rukia. Like a balloon being pumped with too much to handle, Renji finally bursts. He remembers his childhood memories of Rukia in the Rokongai, how they existed as a family and promised they would become Shinigami together, only for her to be stolen by Byakuya. He stood by and watched from a distance, telling himself this is for the best and that he shouldn't get in her way. But he was only lying to himself and thinking things he was taught to think, not things he truly feels and wants to think. He acknowledges this in a breakdown of self-pity and helplessness. All I do is bark at the moon and I don't have the guts to jump at it. It's incredibly fitting that Ichigo Zanpakuto literally translates to slaying moon. He does have the guts to jump at this corrupt system and challenge it wholeheartedly. So Renji begs him to save Rukia and Ichigo Ichigo stands as the victor of this ideological battle. A side note I really appreciate is Hanatoro's constant questioning of who Ichigo really is from the background. It serves as neat foreshadowing for what we eventually learn regarding Ichigo's origins. Byakuya demands that Renji is thrown into a cell for 
failing to defeat Ichigo, further cementing him as the personification of Soul Society's corruption. He is the head of a noble family, the captain of a division, the older brother of the accused criminal, and the one closest to being her executioner by way of his actions. Everything about Byakuya at this stage in the story is indicative of Soul Society's crippling conformism, the enforcement of traditional customs and rejection of anything that opposes those customs, regardless of any moral claims. Byakuya's sense of justice is limited to the very strictly defined way of Shinigami, a way of stagnant extremism. The defeats of Ikaku and Renji are enough for the Gotei 13 to declare all-out war on our protagonists. And as this is happening, the internal conflict within the Gotei 13 begins. The assassination of the kind and caring Aizen Sosuke triggers countless disputes between captains and assistant captains. It's safe to say that this internal quarrel among the Shinigami regarding Aizen's death is one of, if not the only reason, Ichigo manages to survive this arc and actually save Rukia. It's an incredibly fortunate turn of events for Ichigo. Perhaps too fortunate. But as always, not everything is as it seems. When healing Ichigo's wounds, Hanotoro notices something in his pocket, a mask that saved him from Renji's strike across his chest, protecting his vital organs, a mask that very much resembles that of a hollows, and also the mask he was wearing as he left the shattered shaft. Surely Urahara or even Ichigo himself would dispose of the mask from his holofication in training, but it turns out this mask just saved his life, an eerie detail that will gain prominence the further we continue throughout the arc. This is when we receive receive a brief flashback between Ichigo and Chad, how they met and immediately bonded as outcasts. They resonated with each other as people who looked unlike everybody else around them, and Chad remembers this in a dream, as he hides alone within the Seireite. Following this, we get perhaps the most iconic line to come from Bleach for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> Ichigo thinks about his friends and how they must be doing, acknowledging that Uryu and Orihime are smart enough not to pick any fights they'd lose, and that Chad is doing just fine as he can feel his spiritual pressure, and that he can't imagine Chad losing. Well, unfortunately for both Chad and Ichigo, he's about to take a ridiculous beating as he approaches the future captain commander himself, Kyoraku Shunsui, the laid-back captain of the 8th division. He refers to this Ryoka invasion as just fun and games, an obvious nod to his shikai. Nanowo thinks she can handle Chad alone, and she might be right, but Shunsui has to deal with it himself despite his laziness, because he was ordered to by Yamamoto. You must follow your superior's orders without fail. That is the essence of the Gotei 13 structure, a typical feudal model that places the utmost importance on a strictly defined hierarchy. We cut back to Ichigo, just as he's about to reach the summit of the the Senzai Q, he feels an overwhelming, terrifying spiritual pressure. The man Ikaku spoke of has arrived, captain of the 11th company, Zaraki Kenpachi. The mere presence this man exudes simply by making himself seen is enough to make Ichigo feel as if he's been stabbed through the chest. That should be enough to communicate just how terrifyingly powerful Kenpachi is to Ichigo. His murderous intent is immediately recognisable, and Ichigo is completely overcome by fear as Kenpachi appears behind him and the battle begins. As a show of his superiority, Kenpachi offers to give Ichigo a free strike, a disrespectful act of condescension, but one he genuinely considers to be an act of courtesy. To pass up on this offer may be admirable, and Kenpachi acknowledges that. But not today. Not against him. He wants to savour this battle for as long as possible, and if that means entering it with a massive wound as a handicap, then so be it. He wants to gauge the power of this man who dared to storm this holy land. Unfortunately for Ichigo, a free strike on Kenpachi's chest does absolutely nothing to the madman. In fact, Ichigo is the one who receives damage from the exchange, as his hands begin to bleed. This is explained by Kenpachi and it's a relatively simple concept. When two spiritual forces collide, the weaker of the two absorbs the impact. To apply that concept to this scenario would mean the spiritual force coming from Ichigo's strike is weaker than the energy that is constantly leaking out of Kenpachi subconsciously. Ichigo is vastly 
outmatched. This is the first fight he wins where he is truly the underdog right from the very beginning. We have to cut to Chad as the outcome of his own battle is inherently linked to this Kenpachi fight and Ichigo's resolve to win. Shunsui doesn't want to fight Chad but he refuses to step aside and let him pass which results in Shunsui asking Chad what his purpose is. Why risk your life fighting for a Shinigami you hardly know? It's a good question and Chad acknowledges that, claiming that saving Rukia isn't something he's doing for himself but rather for Ichigo. He is here because Ichigo is here, putting his life on the line because Ichigo is putting his life on the line. That's all the reason there is, which segues into yet another backstory that perfectly expands upon their brotherly bond and shows the reader exactly why they mean so much to each other. Expanding further on what we learned about Chad's past in the previous arc, how he was once a bully and used his big body to beat down on everybody who bothered him, Kubo shows us the friction within Chad as he struggles to fend off bullies without resorting to his fists. Ichigo questions why he doesn't defend himself, to which Chad responds, he promised his abuelo he would never use his fists for his own sake. The following day, he is tied to a chair by a group of thugs who reach for pliers and threaten to take his life. And that's when Ichigo swoops in and frees Chad Chad from this tricky predicament, providing an alternate perspective to his original promise in the form of a new promise. Chad won't have to use his fist for his own sake. Ichigo will handle anybody that troubles him, but in return, Chad will use his fists for Ichigo's sake. They'll fight for each other. If there's anything either of them wishes to protect with their life, the other will join them with their own lives on the line. A partnership between two outcasts who do everything they do for the sake of others. That's why Chad can't lose here, but unfortunately for him, he's standing face to to face with a captain of the Gorte 13, a man who vastly outmatches him as a combatant and he is made short work of, sliced across the chest before falling to the ground. As this happens, Ichigo is being chased around by Kenpachi, grappling with his fear and powerlessness in the face of the battle hungry. And just as Chad falls to the ground, Ichigo notices the change in his spiritual pressure. At first, he thinks it's completely vanished, which would mean Chad was killed, but he then senses a tiny, weak amount of Reiatsu that tells him Chad is still alive, the pick-me-up he so desperately needed. Knowing that his friends are out there fighting with their lives at stake for a mission he dragged them on is enough for Ichigo to conquer his fear, and he finally manages to cut through Kenpachi's tough skin, which makes the madman incredibly excited. Kenpachi wears an eye patch that feeds on his Rayatsu as well as bells on his hair to serve as handicaps and make the fight more exciting. That is how confident he is in his power. Ichigo sees this as a mockery, noting that must be why he hasn't called on his Zanpakuto, which is exactly when the true importance of this fight is made known. Kenpachi tells Ichigo his sword has no name and was never sealed, that what he's using right now is his Zanpakuto and that it won't get any stronger, and that it's more than enough to defeat him, as he pierces through Zanpakuto Getsu and into Ichigo's chest. Laying in a pool of his own blood, Ichigo struggles and struggles to get back up and continue fighting, which prompts the appearance of his Zanpakuto spirit, the old man Zangetsu. He asks him a question that will forever inform his understanding of Ichigo. Do you want to fight? Do you want to win? Or do you want to live? To which Ichigo responds, fighting for its own sake is meaningless. Survival in itself is meaningless. I want to win. I want to win. Old Man Zangetsu uses a Quincy shadow to take Ichigo to his inner world and train him. The inner world is still tilted at a 90 degree angle. An interesting detail considering OMZ states that Ichigo's inner world is stable now. To still have the environment be tilted on its head is a very intentional decision. It's not just stylistic, but also symbolic, representing Ichigo's lack of understanding of his own Zanpakuto spirit and the truth of OMZ as the representation of his Quincy powers. Almost as if to coerce Ichigo and convince him that he really is his Zanpakuto spirit, Old Man Zangetsu throws an Asauchi at him, claiming it is a nameless Zanpakuto given to Shinigami who aren't worthy of the 13 guard companies. That is not the purpose of an Asauchi, and the sword he just gave Ichigo is not an Asauchi either. Asauchi are crafted specifically by Oetsu Nimaya, formed by melding the souls of countless Shinigami together. This is a reishi construct made via Old Man Zangetsu's Quincy powers, just like the Zangetsu Ichigo has been using throughout the arc so far. The coercion continues as White appears, the spitting image of Ichigo only
only mirrored. An Ichigo wearing a white shihakusho wielding Zangetsu who calls himself his partner. This is Ichigo's true Zanpakuto spirit. This is the representation of his Shinigami powers, the powers that have melded with his inner hollow and thus can only be interpreted as such by Ichigo's limited understanding of himself. The way old man Zangetsu goes about manipulating Ichigo is very sly. He doesn't lie but rather gives him a limited understanding of the truth, enough to know parts of the truth but never the whole truth. This time, your enemy is you. The reflection of White's smile on his blade hides deep, dark secrets that are currently unbeknownst to both the reader and Ichigo himself. White uses Zangetsu in ways Ichigo never would have thought of throwing it at Ichigo and using the hilt wrap to retrieve it, a sign of his true identity as Ichigo's real Zanpakuto spirit, as well as a harsh reality check for Ichigo, who knows nothing about what he perceives to be his Zanpakuto beyond its name. These aren't just soulless tools used for the purpose of battle, they're your partner the extension of your soul, intrinsically tied to the very essence of your being. Simply by internally acknowledging this in his mind, not verbalizing his mistake but thinking about it, Ichigo is able to overcome White and retrieve Zangetsu from him. He immediately rises up with insane amounts of spiritual pressure and the bleeding from his chest stops thanks to the Quincy Blut, and he is born again ready to fight with the resolve to win. The interaction between White and Old Man Zangetsu as Ichigo awakens is particularly interesting. We learn that he was only pretending to be an evil spirit for the purpose of keeping Ichigo alive, as the king of this world, and thus his survival is necessary for both of these internal spirits to exist. It's time for White to go home and he does so by literally being sucked into Old Man Zangetsu, a crucial detail in understanding the composition of Ichigo's soul and the many powers he possesses. Quincy, Shinigami, Hollow and Fullbringer all exist as one. All of Ichigo's powers coalesce and function as a unit. However, at this point in time, Old Man Zangetsu is the center, the one who controls the flow of Ichigo's power. But this won't be the case forever. As White's parting words suggest, raise him well because his power will eventually be mine foreshadowing not just White's true identity as Ichigo Shinigami powers, but his hollow powers also, which come to light in the Aranka saga. Following White's departure, Old Man Zangetsu has a monologue that remains one of my absolute favourite moments ever the rain speech. Rain is a commonly used motif that can be found across all forms of literature, used for a variety of reasons but typically to depict feelings of sadness, longing and reflection, to create a melancholic or contemplative atmosphere and scenes. And that's exactly what it represents for Ichigo's inner world that Old Man Zangetsu lives within. Much like how the environment's being tilted on its head is a visual representation of Ichigo's misguided understanding, rain in this world serves as a visual representation of Ichigo's Ichigo's sadness. Whenever he feels sad, the dimension Old Man Zangetsu is trapped within begins to rain, but the old man promises that should Ichigo place his trust in him, he will not let any rain fall in this world. He won't let Ichigo be sad and will fight alongside him through whatever trial or tribulation he may face. Ichigo rises from the dead, ready to fight Kenpachi once more, and immediately overpowers him. This only serves to fuel Kenpachi's satisfaction, his love for battle, which prompts Ichigo to question his way of thinking. What is wrong with you? How can you like fighting that much? How are you not afraid of being cut or even worse being killed? To which Kenpachi responds, me? What's wrong with me? There's something wrong with you. How can you be strong and not love fighting? Revel in the death and pain. Those are the rewards of battle. He removes his eye patch and finally begins fighting at full power, with zero handicaps. But unlike before, Ichigo is no longer fearful. Kenpachi's insane flurry of spiritual pressure doesn't worry him, and Old Man Zangetsu appears once more to highlight the decisive factor of the battle. Can you hear it, Ichigo? The sound of his sword screaming. When those who don't trust each other fight together, the strength in each is diminished. Those who only trust in their own strength cannot comprehend that. This is a crucial message for Ichigo to come to terms with. Here, Ichigo is one with Zangetsu. They have complete trust in one another and thus can share in each other's power. Diametrically opposed to Kenpachi who doesn't even know the name of his Zanpakuto. This idea of placing complete trust in those you fight alongside is everywhere. 
elsewhere. Not just in this fight, but the story at large. And Ichigo learning to embrace his comrades, to place trust in their abilities, is a consistent struggle for him throughout the series. Even if he has convinced himself that he trusts them now, telling himself that Chad will never lose, deep down he tries to take everything into his own hands. He thinks he's keeping them from danger by taking it all on himself, and that way he wouldn't have to worry about losing any other loved ones. But what he's really doing is selfishly interfering with their own desires and serving himself. We see Ichigo's rejection of his comrades time and time again, and he gradually grows out of this mindset as we come to the end of the story. Both Ichigo and Kenpachi prepare for their most powerful attacks yet, putting everything into a single strike, and Ichigo comes out on top. As they prepare for the exchange, we see patterns formed by their spiritual energy. Kenpachi's pattern resembling the skull of death, and Ichigo's pattern resembling the mask of a hollow. There's a really cool meaning behind Kenpachi's pattern, but that's a topic for another day, we're concerned with Ichigo here. The hollow pattern is obvious foreshadowing of his inner hollow powers, but it also represents the fusion of his powers. Even if Old Man Zangetsu is the center, and thus his Quincy powers are the predominant force, the inner hollow is still present. The battle comes to an end, and Ichigo apologizes to his friends for being defeated, before Kenpachi corrects him and tells him he won the fight, both of them collapsing to the ground and both of them losing consciousness. Yoruichi arrives to heal Ichigo and at the same time, Kubo is planting seeds for the later story beats. Rukia's remembrance of Kayen as well as Kenpachi's longing for a bond with his Zanpakuto. Ganju arrives at the Senzaiku and immediately recognizes Rukia as the one who killed his older brother. In his fit of anger and disbelief, he reaches over to attack Rukia and is stopped by the arrival of Byakuya Kuchiki. A really interesting dynamic between these characters and the sibling relationships that spearhead the scene. We learn that Ichigo's hollow mask saved him from being cut in half once again, which pretty much confirms that this isn't just some fortunate stroke of luck. Ichigo even threw it underground in the waterway and it still found its way back to him, a neat parallel to his relationship with the inner hollow powers in general. No matter how hard Ichigo tries to get rid of them, the powers will always make their way back to him. Yoruichi senses Byakuya's spiritual pressure which prompts Ichigo to immediately make way to the Senzaiku, arriving just just after Ganju is completely washed by Byakuya and Ukitake arrives to stop Byakuya from going any further. Ichigo is standing face to face with the man who sealed his powers a few weeks ago, but this time he is completely resolved in beating him. His determination and smile reminds Rukia of Kayen. The parallels between these two are hammered home time and time again throughout the arc, but this is the first example that's really in your face. Ukitake's reaction to seeing Ichigo is what most of the examples feel like. Like. They're not completely obvious, but you can still tell that the characters are drawing similarities between Ichigo and Kayen. For now, those similarities are merely superficial and tied to their appearances, but with time, we learn that Ichigo resembles Kayen in a number of ways. Byakuya tells Ukitake that Ichigo is not related to Kayen and that he's no one, just a Ryoka. Funny, because Byakuya couldn't be more wrong, but to be fair, there's no way of him knowing that. Before Byakuya can release his Zanpakuto against Ichigo, Yoruichi intervenes and wraps Senbon Zakura in bandages. As this happens, Renji is having a conversation with his Zanpakuto spirit about who he will fight next. The lack of harmony between Renji and Zabimaru is very telling. His Zanpakuto should know exactly what he feels and who his feelings are directed towards, but he doesn't, because Renji himself is having an emotional crisis. He doesn't know what he wants to do, which is a really neat piece of character work from Kubo that I appreciate. Even if his last words were pleading for Ichigo to save Rukia, that was an emotional outburst. He didn't have the time to register his thoughts and think about them rationally. All he knows is that Ichigo is not his enemy any longer and that he needs to process what his next move will be. Yoruichi flexes her incredible shunpo, blitzing Byakuya and escaping only after telling him that she will train Ichigo to become stronger than him in just three days. The same amount of time remaining until Rukia's execution will take place. Ukitake spares Ganju and Honotoro, explaining that regardless of their questionable actions, their motives were pure and that's enough to support them. The discordance in the Gote 13's behavior is extremely telling, as I've said a hundred times so far. This is a broken system, being maintained by million-year-old guidelines that ultimately only serve their own interests. From Aizen's questioning of Rukia's execution to his imminent assassination, to the invasion of Ichigo and Ko, the Soul Society is a very mysterious place right now. 
it is time for the Bankai training, one of the most integral portions of the arc when it comes to character work for Ichigo. We learn that Zangetsu is a constant release Zanpakuto, meaning it remains in Shikai at all times. It's different from the others, it doesn't change shape when its name is called, which makes sense given the truth of the sword as I've already explained. Yoruichi tells Ichigo about a second release stage known as Bankai, which is a prerequisite to becoming a captain of the Gotei 13 unless you're Zaraki Kenpachi. The Bankai is generally considered to be 5 to 10 times more powerful than the Shikai, which is exactly why it usually takes 10 or more years for somebody to master it. Ichigo obviously doesn't have that much time, so Yoruichi is going to take a far riskier approach at teaching him Bankai with the hopes that he'll survive and manage to learn the sacred ability in just three days. Orihime apologizes to Uryu for not being much help, to which he corrects her saying she can protect and heal them which makes her a huge help to the gang, a slight but crucial detail for her own character arc which ultimately ties into Ichigo's at the end of the story. The two of them are confronted by a group of Shinigami. One of them questions their true identity and what squad they're part of, and the others knock him out cold for his nerve in accusing fellow Shinigami. This is one of those tiny moments that exist in a vacuum for a character whose name we never even receive, but does so much for the story being told. A low-ranking Shinigami who failed the enlistment exam for the Gotei 13 three times before finally passing on his fourth was assigned to the 12th company. On his 20th day of service, the Ryoka invasion began, and there was talk of promotion for whoever caught them. This Shinigami was assigned to the 12th division, Mayuri's division. Mayuri had a special assignment for these new members, to lure the invaders disguised as Shinigami to the 12th company barracks. A dangerous job, but not too difficult if they were careful. That is why they knocked out the 11th company Shinigami who questioned Uryu and Orihime, as part of a plan to befriend them and lure them to the barracks. But unfortunately for these three Shinigami, Mayuri had a different plan in mind. He intended to use them as bait and kill them alongside Uryu and Orihime to guarantee success and the murder of the invaders. His arm reaches out to Mayuri as he internally pleads for mercy and disbelief, and Mayuri seals the deal by setting them ablaze. Orihime saves the Shinigami of the 11th division who had just questioned her true identity and begins to cry for the other Shinigami who were just killed. This has the member of the 11th division very confused. He cannot understand why she'd feel sorry for her enemies, which paints a pretty vivid picture of how things are in the Seireite. They are shackled to their limited understanding of the world and how people should conduct themselves. The Shinigami lack humanity, which may sound normal considering they aren't actually humans, but the only thing that really separates them from regular humans is their Reryoku. The Shinigami all have inflated egos, a sense that they are better than everybody else in the universe due to their superior spiritual energy, and this ties into Aizen's character very well. Mayuri goes on to offer Orihime what he considers to be the best possible terms for a research subject, stating he will lessen the daily drug regime, feed her orally and give her clothes to sleep with. Oh and he'll try his best not to perform any modifications that might kill her. If it isn't already clear, Mayuri is an evil piece of shit who is somehow a captain of the Gotei 13, the people we were originally led to believe have been keeping the universe safe and serving the best interests of all. Things are definitely not as they seem and Uryu who already harbours a lot of negative feelings towards the Shinigami has just met his match. Mayuri immediately recognises him as a Quincy and expresses disinterest in his species, claiming he's already completed his research on Uryu's kind which only serves to fuel the flame within Uryu. He makes sure Orihime gets away from the area safely and it is time for the battle between Mayuri Kurotsuchi and Uryu Ishida. This fight is all about making the Shinigami look like terrible people through Mayuri. The way he uses Nemu as a sacrificial pawn throughout the fight and just his general treatment of practically everybody is criticised throughout. Even when Nemu is coming close to death and begging for medicine, Mayuri abuses and screams at her for being pitiful. She is his own creation and so he views her weaknesses as an insult. I don't want to dive too deeply into this fight and steer away from the main focus of the video, but the general idea behind this battle informs a lot about Ichigo's character through his dynamic with Uryu. It's also chock full of foreshadowing for the Thousand Year Blood War. Mayuri shares all the terrible things he's done to Quincy in the past, with his last research subject being none other than Sorkin himself. Uryu's grandfather, 
who kept calling out his name as he was being tortured. Even despite being cut by Mayuri Zanpakuto and being rendered immobile, Uryu stands up in a fit of rage. He uses Ranso Tengai, an ability that uses the surrounding reishi to control the movement of the body, like a puppet on strings. Uryu is established as a prodigy, a genius, a talent like none other. Of the 2,661 Quincy Mayuri had studied, not a single one could perform the Ranso Tengai, making him believe it was a lost art. But Uryu has mastered it at such a young age. The similarities between himself and Ichigo as young talents with ridiculous potential are made very clear. Uryu's backstory is further fleshed out in these chapters. We learn of his poor relationship with his father and we learn more of Sorkin's philosophy. As children, Uryu and Ichigo were very, very similar. They wanted to be powerful and protect everybody from harm. The only difference being that Uryu had seen hollows so he could recognize their threat whilst Ichigo had been lucky enough not to encounter any until the first chapter of the manga, obviously not including Grand Fisher and his mother's death which he didn't even understand at the time. There has always been a stark disconnect between Uryu and his father. Ryuken is a doctor who seemingly despises the ways of the Quincy, claiming there's no profit in fighting against Hollows and in turn gaining the disdain of his own son. Despite that, Sorkin urges his grandson to try and understand his father, telling him that what someone thinks is right is intrinsically tied to what they want to protect. And of course, Ryuken's attitude stems from a desire to protect Uryu from the curse of being born a Quincy and the inevitable return of their father. Sorkin tells Uryu that he'll find out in time and when that time comes, Uryu will finally understand everything. He'll understand what he himself wants to protect, what his father cares about most and the battle he will not be able to avoid if he still wishes to walk the path of a Quincy. When the time comes, he will have to sacrifice himself and use this. This referring to the Quincy trump card, the let's steal or last style when translated into English. A technique that momentarily grants immense power at the cost of losing all your Quincy powers. Uryu internally apologizes to his late grandfather for jumping the gun and using this trump card before the time has come, before he understands Duken and what he himself wants to protect. I'm sorry master, I'm disobeying you one last time. Uryu reaches a state of overwhelming power that leaves Mayuri in complete awe, forcing him to use his Bankai. But even with that, the pinnacle of Ashinigami's capability, Mayuri is completely destroyed by Uryu, who cuts clean through his Bankai and leaves a gaping hole through his chest with a single attack. A complete low diff. Mayuri only manages to survive the exchange due to his technological expertise, which allows him to liquefy himself as a last resort. And Nemu displays her individuality from Mayuri, giving Uryu the antidote he needs to survive. Despite how he treats her, Nemu is grateful Mayuri survived and can't quite understand her feelings just yet. With time, the picture becomes clearer and we understand what this twisted father and daughter dynamic is truly attempting to communicate. Uryu makes his way to the Senzaiku even though his time as a Quincy is over and to his dismay, he is welcomed by yet another captain who almost effortlessly knocks him out. Kaname told Awesome who wishes to maintain the peace and soul society. Yet another peculiar individual in the Gote 13 as he apologizes to Uryu after taking him out. I spent quite some time going over the key details of this battle between Uryu and Mayuri because it represents a point in his journey that is almost identical to what Ichigo later experiences in the conclusion of Fate Karakura Town. The introduction of the Quincy Let Steel is also incredibly noteworthy as it makes up part of Mugetsu, Ichigo's unique variation of the technique, and the contrast between the likes of Ichigo and Uryu who defeat captains and Chad who was completely embarrassed by a captain is also made clear to the reader. Finally, we cut back to Ichigo who is getting his ass handed to him by Yuruichi in his Bankai training. Old Man Zangetsu is forcibly externalized into the material world through the use of the Tenshin Tai, activated when Ichigo stabs it with his sword. This is further proof that the blade he is holding is in fact a Quincy Reishi construct and not his true Zanpakuto, otherwise White would be the one to appear. Old Man Zangetsu appears behind Ichigo, a very cool detail which will come into play later in the video. Just like the original trial he gave Ichigo, the countless boxes falling with only one of them containing Ichigo Shinigami powers, Old Man Zangetsu materializes countless swords through his Kunsi technique of constructing Reishi weapons, and he tells Ichigo that he can only be defeated by one of them, the real Zangetsu, as he calls it. 
All the blades here are pieces of Ichigo's soul. Only a specific one of them was made for the purpose of fighting, or at least that's what Old Man Zangetsu claims. When Ichigo finds a blade that resembles his Shikai Zangetsu and it is easily crushed, Old Man Zangetsu refers to it as a piece of Ichigo's fragile spirit trying to rely on him. Sounds pretty contradictory to what he was just teaching Ichigo in the fight against Kenpachi, right? Working together with and trusting your Zanpakuto as a team, relying on them, is exactly the reason why Ichigo managed managed to come out on top there, but now his reliance on Old Man Zangetsu has been painted as somewhat of a negative. Ichigo fails to differentiate between the different blades, the different pieces of his soul, and what each of them represent. Until he can tell the difference between them and essentially completely understand himself, he will fail to achieve Bankai. The frightening pace of Ichigo's growth throughout this battle against OMZ is repeatedly reiterated by Oroichi. He is a special talent through and through. However, his growth is limited to only his combat skills. His Ryoku hasn't increased much at all, which is a nod to the fact that his power is predominantly in the hands of Old Man Zangetsu, who functions as the center and controller of Ichigo's power. His true Shinigami powers, his hollow powers, even his Fullbringer powers are suppressed and minimized as his Quincy powers thrive. The Aizen assassination plotline thickens as the letter he left before his demise accuses Toshiro of being the one to orchestrate Rukia's execution with the goal of using the Sokyoku to destroy the entire Soul Society. This revelation segues into a brief exchange of swords between Hinamori, Toshiro, Gin, and even Rangiku, which ultimately leads to Toshiro and Rangiku being among those who wish to stop Rukia's execution, which has been rescheduled once again. It is now 29 hours away and everybody is preparing for the moment, with even Renji joining Ichigo in the training area to learn Bankai. This is also when we receive Rukia's flashback, Memories in the Rain Part 2 the naming being an obvious nod to Ichigo's flashback in Volume 3. This is the same story being told through a different lens, a story of death, grief and guilt. The story of Kai and Shiba, who always chose the path of greatest peril. After having his body hijacked by the Hollow who killed his wife, Kaien attacks Ukitake and Rukia, which ultimately results in his death. Kaien is for Rukia what Masaki is for Ichigo. The root of their trauma stems from failing to protect the person they idolized most, the person their philosophies are born from. But much like Uryu's trauma, both Rukia and Ichigo fail to actually apply the philosophies of their inspirations to themselves and are shackled by guilt precisely because they fail to do so. Their journeys of overcoming this trauma is resolved by a simple shift in perspective, a shift that is largely possible due to their relationship and what they teach each other. Renji has always lied to himself about chasing after Byakuya, out of fear. He told himself he is preparing to fight him and reclaim the Rukia he was once so close to, but he has never actually acted on those feelings, until now that is. Renji makes his way to the Senkaimon where he is welcomed by Byakuya's Reiatsu and immediately activates his newly acquired Bankai. The Baboon King's fangs have been sharpened and are pointing at the object of their anger, forcing Byakuya down to one knee even after he boasted that wouldn't be possible. But despite Renji's applaudable growth in such a short time, he is 10 years too early to match Byakuya in a battle of Bankai. A thousand cherry blossoms pierce through Renji and almost decide his fate. Byakuya's superiority complex as head of a noble clan is reiterated as he references the tale of the monkey and the moon, a Buddhist story in which hundreds of monkeys hold onto each other's tail and attempt to seize the reflection of a moon in a well, ultimately failing when the branch they are hanging from breaks, the monkey being a representation of unenlightened individuals who cannot distinguish between reality and illusion. In this case, Renji is the monkey and Byakuya is the moon. That which shines in the eye of the beast is but the moon reflected on water. You can try to capture it, but you'll only sink to the bottom. This idea of illusions, things not being as they seem to the eyes, is incredibly prevalent throughout the arc. It's the foundation of Aizen's character as someone who detests the fraudulence of a system ruled over by a figurehead sealed in a crystal, the key motivation for his betrayal of soul society and grand ambition to reach the Soul King Palace. Renji acknowledges the great difference in strength between himself and Byakuya, his crippling inferiority in the face of the man he has dreamt of surpassing for half a century. He is almost completely defeated, wallowing in his own weakness until he remembers Ichigo's relentless resolve. He repeats Ichigo's exact words, swearing to nobody but himself that he will save Rukia. 
This is an act of pride and accountability to one's goals. Instilling Renji with just enough willpower to stand once more and attack Byakuya for the final time. And in this final attack, the monkey's fangs do reach the moon in an intense display of absolute resolve. This battle is the perfect representation of Ichigo's impact on others, his contagious steadfastness in the pursuit of his ideal and the inspiration he exudes with every decision he makes. Ichigo, like Masaki, is the sun. The universe spins around him. Everybody around him is changed by him at some point in time. He frees them from the shackles of their preconceptions, the destiny they succumb to before even trying to fight against it. In the meantime, Kenpachi is fighting against both Tosen and Komamura, a battle that goes to great lengths at illustrating the variety in the captains of the Gote 13. There is no singular cause that ties these individuals together. They each have their own unique philosophies that inform their choices in their positions of power. Kenpachi fights out of a love for battle. He doesn't care about labels like hero or villain. He lacks a specified moral compass. He simply revels in bloodshed. Torsen fights out of a strong sense of justice. As a young man, he learned of the world's cruelty and wished for power with the hopes of imposing peace. Long ago, Torsen decided he will become justice incarnate to make up for the justice that is lacking in the Soul Society. Komamura fights out of duty, kinship, and camaraderie. A deep brotherly love for Torsen who accepted him as he is, though this battle is interrupted by the release of the Sokyoku and finally it is time for the execution of Rukia Kuchiki. The countdown to the end has begun. As it stands, there are a lot of mixed thoughts on Rukia's impending execution and various people intend to interfere and prevent it from happening. Toshiro, Rangiku, Ukitake and Shunsui all plan to stop this execution somehow, with Ukitake even planning to destroy the Sokyoku itself. As her parting wish, Rukia asks head captain Yamamoto to spare the invaders. Let Ichigo, Uryu, Chad and Orihime leave the Soul Society unharmed. And this wish is granted, or at least Rukia is led to believe that it is granted, but Yamamoto had no intentions of honouring his promise. Unahana calls this a compassionate act, allowing Rukia to die with some peace of mind. But if this is how the leader of the Gote 13 conducts himself, it paints a pretty vivid picture of how broken this system is. This on disingenuous and untrustworthy. A fundamentally corrupt regime of glorified data analysts who have deluded themselves into believing they are divine, enlightened beings when really they aren't so different from the regular humans they look down upon. The Sokyoku assumes its true form as a giant firebird and begins its flight of impaling the condemned. But before it can pierce the accused, Deathberry returns. In the end, the Ryoka saves the day. He effortlessly stops the destructive power of a million Zanpakuto before Ukitake and Shunsui destroy the Sokyoku on its second attempt, using a device belonging to the Shihoin family. To fully communicate his defiance of Rukia's execution, Ichigo breaks the scaffold she had been tied to. A mockery of Shinigami traditions, a spit in the face of their honour, a challenge to the established order. This is Ichigo's way of confronting the Soul Society's injustice, their terrible treatment of Rukia, one of their own. To gain the assistance of 4 out of 13 captains as well as Renji, the assistant captain of the one who has advocated most heavily for the execution rubs further salts in the wound of the Seireite's exposed corruption, and Ichigo takes this disrespect even further by completely humiliating not one, not two, but three assistant captains in a matter of seconds without even drawing for his Zanpakuto. A ridiculous showcase of his growth that immediately segues into the battle we've all been waiting for. Renji reveals a new layer to Ichigo's motivations in this arc, something I've touched upon already but is cemented in words from Ichigo himself. He told Renji that he owes Rukia the debt of changing his fate by making him a Shinigami and thus giving him the power to fight and protect everyone. That is the crux of Ichigo's love for Rukia. She served as the key to venturing into a world he had always dreamt of being a part of, to be able to protect those ghosts he sees around that disappear, leaving pools of blood in their wake. This conversation 
between Renji and Rukia is a meager expression of one of Bleach's grandest ideas, to stop taking all the blame onto yourself and share it amongst loved ones, ultimately lightening the load of the burden for all, a message Ichigo is slowly but surely learning for himself. The battle between the combined force of Shunsui and Ukitake against head captain Yamamoto is emblematic of the primary thematic conflict this arc hopes to address, the line between personal justice and the world's justice. The pupils fiercely proclaimed to their master that it was he who urged them to fight for justice, to become strong precisely for that reason, yet now their master stands as their enemy for doing just that, and worst of all he refuses to discuss with them, immediately calling for his zanpakuto and fanning the flames of the conflict. As one would expect, Yamamoto is both the quintessential figure and enforcer of the Gote 13's conformist stagnation, an old man covered in battle scars wielding the most terrible zanpakuto, the oldest and greatest of them all, Ryujin Jaka, a blazing inferno. The last thing you'd expect from the death gods who maintain balance and supposedly peace in the universe. As orthodox as a Shinigami can be, the head captain maintains this stagnant society from the top. Byakuya is very much the same. He flat out states that nothing Ichigo can say will change his mind, the key word being say. Ichigo won't get through to Byakuya with words, and instead he needs to beat that change into him. Ichigo finally knows the name of the technique he subconsciously used when training with Urahara, the Getsuga Tensho, a super high concentration of reishi released from the tip of his blade that magnifies upon discharging, an ability he did not know how to use because he lacked the proper state of mind. The only person who could teach Ichigo about Zangetsu was Zangetsu, a technique that increases greatly in firepower provided Ichigo knows its name. Very fitting that Ichigo uses the Moon Fang Piercer of the Heavens for the first time against the Captain in class Shinigami, a divine being who has been associated with the moon repeatedly throughout the arc. This showcase was more than enough for Byakuya to respect Ichigo enough as a fighter to display his Bankai, and so he does. Byakuya's superiority in Bankai over Ichigo in Shikai is made abundantly clear, and Ichigo is smart enough to immediately acknowledge this, thus the time has come for the black moon to rise. The poem of this volume is especially interesting. Volume 19, The Black Moon Rising, has Ichigo on the cover and Tensa Zangetsu on the page of the poem making the Ensor Circle I previously mentioned, the Buddhist sign of enlightenment coupled with the words, no, nothing can change my world. This battle is perhaps the Kurosaki Ichigo battle of the series. Against Byakuya, he's the most resolved he possibly ever was in the entire series. Against Byakuya, his actions have an instant effect on his opponent's philosophies. Against Byakuya, Ichigo fights with a crystal clear goal in mind, to protect. Against Byakuya, Ichigo wants to win, not just to fight, not just to survive, but to defeat his opponent fair and square and exerts definitive superiority over them. This is Ichigo's world. He has achieved the pinnacle of the Zanpakuto Arcanum, an ability that only the most experienced Shinigami could ever hope to perform, a level of power that etches your name in the history of Soul Society, the peak of his Zanpakuto, what Ichigo believes to be enlightenment, and thus he tells Tensa Zengetsu that nothing can change his world, essentially meaning he will never lose again. He won't allow the rain to fall again, that he will win this battle and every battle to come. Of course, Ichigo is far from being a truly enlightened individual at this stage in the story, but this is what he believes, and it is painfully evident from his behavior during the fight. Tensa Zangetsu is an incredibly unique Bankai. The only one it can truly be compared to is Yamamoto's Zanko no Tachi, a small sword that garners the exact same reaction from those who see it. In Ichigo's case, this is of course not his true Bankai, but that remains a mystery to everybody in the first half of the manga, including Ichigo himself. Byakuya feels greatly disrespected by Ichigo's actions. First he crashed the execution ceremony, and now he displays the pinnacle of Shinigami combat. You'll soon know the price of insulting our honor, he proudly proclaims before being completely blitzed, and if that wasn't rude enough, spared by Ichigo, who retorts by assuring Byakuya that stepping on his honor is precisely what he is intending to do. The hand guard of Tensa Zangetsu is is in the shape of the Sanskrit character for infinity or all of creation, the left-facing swastika, an often seen Buddhist symbol. This symbol is also a Japanese kanji. In fact, it's the first character in the term Bankai itself, a nod to Ichigo as the quintessential
potential being in this universe. Byakuya denying Tansa Zengetsu as a Bankai functions as a double entendre. It comes from a place of condescension and disbelief while simultaneously holding weight in hindsight. This isn't Bankai but neither of them could have known that for sure at this stage in the story. The chapter titles in this battle are all noteworthy, but I specifically want to focus on the part twos. The Speed Phantom 2, the counterpart to chapter 152 when Ichigo blitzed and humiliated the assistant captains. The connection here is pretty self-explanatory. In both chapters, Ichigo displays super high speed as a defining characteristic of his fighting style. The Dark Side of the Universe 2, the counterpart to chapter 110 when Ichigo was taken into his inner world by Old Man's Sangetsu and first met the true manifestation of his Shinigami powers, White. The connection here being the payoff to the recurrence of the Hollow Mask, White's takeover of Ichigo's body, and the first appearance of Hollow Ichigo. And finally, Black and White 2, the counterpart to Chapter 111, when Ichigo first confided in Old Man Zangetsu as a partner and overcame White within his inner world. The connection again is self-explanatory. Ichigo rips off the Hollow Mask and overcomes White, denying him once again. As cool as these connections are, are they significant enough to mention in the video? Yes and no. These specific connections in a vacuum aren't particularly important for the purpose of the video, but the fact they exist is noteworthy when considering the construction of Ichigo's character. His journey is by no means linear. He consistently grows and matures, but he also regresses and falls into bad habits. He falls deeper and deeper into ignorance, denying the true reflection of his soul and growing closer to the Quincy spirit, who originally intended to sway him away from the path he wishes to walk. These part twos paint a crucial picture concerning Kubo's approach at writing Ichigo's character. These chapters and their counterparts exist as anchors in this 74 volume journey. They're given weight with these callbacks because they serve as foundational stages of his character arc. The Karakura gang watches the battle from afar as both Ichigo and Byakuya fight until they can no longer, with Byakuya promising he will share exactly why he didn't try to save Rukia if Ichigo wins the fight. Over the course of the battle, he slowly gains more and more respect for Ichigo as they exchange sword strokes and learn to understand one another. Kubo's love of black and white interplay is on full display for their final exchange, which marks the end of the Soul Society's Battle of Sokyoku Hill and in turn, the submission of Byakuya Kuchiki. As promised, he explains why he didn't save Rukia. As I've reiterated multiple times by now, Byakuya is the poster boy Shinigami. Even familial devotion is nothing next to the law for this man who refuses to succumb to sentimentality and approaches every given situation as rationally as possible. He strongly opposes Ichigo in this regard, who fights almost entirely out of passion and emotion. As the head of a noble family, he serves as a role model for all Shinigami. He must carry himself as such. If he does and uphold the law, who will? It's a very understandable way of thinking and at the very least, it does suggest that if Byakuya were to allow his emotions to influence his decisions, he wouldn't have allowed the execution to take place. The issue is much bigger than Byakuya. It's the customs of the Soul Society entirely, the law itself, and Ichigo addresses this perfectly in his rebuttal, which reminds Byakuya of Kayen, the man whose ferocity Byakuya always found distasteful but he finally succumbs to that ferocity. In a way, Kayan's will has been inherited by Ichigo, whose own ferocity has broken Byakuya's blade, guaranteeing his submission and unwillingness to pursue Rukia any longer. Byakuya stays standing and Ichigo falls, but this is not a battle of martial might, it's a battle of ideologies. So despite falling to the ground first, Ichigo stands as the victor. The threads that have been building in the background, the internal conflicts within the Gotei 13, finally reach their crescendo, the end of hypnosis. Aizen is not dead. The Central 46 are all dead. They've been dead for a while, and all the orders the Shinigami have been receiving were coming directly from Aizen's team. He was behind absolutely everything. He orchestrated Rukia's execution, Ichigo's invasion, his own death, and even Rukia being saved by Ichigo. Everything went according to Aizen's plans, who capitalizes on the chaos he is precisely coordinated to achieve his goal. The Hogyoku. The Central 46 governs society and enacts laws and judicial restrictions on the population. They 
are the moral system of the soul society. Law and order starts and stops with them. They are not to be questioned. So naturally, their existence is exactly the sort of thing Aizen rejects. They maintain this fundamentally fallacious system he wishes to topple. Aizen Zanpakuto is Kyoka Suigetsu, which literally translates to Mirror Flower, Water Moon. The name is derived from the Chinese idiom, flower seen in the mirror, moon reflected on the water's surface. This is an obvious nod to the elusive properties of Aizen Zanpakuto, which can tamper with the five senses. A flower, a thing of beauty, can be seen reflected on a mirror, but cannot be grasped. The moon, yet another thing of beauty, can be seen reflected on the water, but cannot be touched. Kyoka Suigetsu's naming ties into the poem of volume 12. We think the flower on the precipice is beautiful because our fear make our feet stop at its edge instead of stepping forward into the sky like that fearless flower. This poem coming from Aizen's perspective is directed inwards at himself, showing his desire to step over the edge and see what lies beyond, his insatiable curiosity, the very thing that seals his fate. Aizen considers stepping out beyond the precipice to be an act of fearlessness something grand and desirable. This informs his goal of filling up the unbearable vacancy of Heaven's Throne. As you know, the Reo lacks all agency and serves as a symbolic figurehead for the Soul Society, which infuriates Aizen for a number of reasons we'll be diving into as we progress throughout the video. The real value of Kyokasu Getsu stems from the irony of it all. The Zanpakuto is the extension of one's soul, and Aizen's is named Mirror Flower, Water Moon. This doesn't just inform his illusory abilities, but also his greatest flaw, his superiority complex, his false sense of enlightenment. Aizen wishes to make himself a god, to rule above all through sheer dominance and overwhelming power, yet he fails to rule over himself. After completely humiliating the combined force of Ichigo and Renji by literally stopping Ichigo's OST with his fingertip, Aizen explains why he seeks after the Hogyoku. It is an object that breaks the barrier between Shinigami and Hollow, shattering the fixed shapes of these opposing existences in hopes of creating a fusion between the two, to reach greater heights of power, an act of defiance for the natural laws and forms of the universe, in hopes of striving for something akin to formlessness, something that isn't bound by the Shinigami Zanjutsu or the Hollow abilities. Kai and Shiba's death was the result of Aizen's experiments in hoping to create something like the Hogyoku, but he could never get it quite right. Nobody could, until Urahara Kisuke. Ichigo's mentor created the object of mass destruction that set the cogs in motion for this story to be told. None of this would have ever happened if not for Urahara's scientific curiosity. Upon realizing the terror of his own creation, Urahara hid the object deep within someone's kompaku. Within Rukia's soul lies the Hogyoku and Aizen effortlessly cuts down every obstacle before finally attaining his prize. Before Rukia can be killed by Gin's Shinso, her older brother of all people swoops in and protects her. Yoruichi and Soifon enter, fighting side by side, and one by one, the rest of the Gote 13's heavy hitters arrive, all fighting alongside the evil intruders who were their sworn enemies just moments ago. Unfortunately for them, simply surrounding Aizen isn't enough. He choreographed this entire chain of events to perfectly suit his plans and manages to escape with ease. This is the power of Sosuke Aizen, out of reach for even the combined force of most of the Gote 13. This is what it means to seek greater heights, joining forces with the Menos, the mortal enemies of the Shinigami. Aizen intends to stand at the top, alone and uncontested. We learn of Byakuya's internal conflict he had been repressing throughout the madness. Stuck between two oaths to the dead, riddled with guilt, and finally freed from his conflict by Ichigo. Not just by submission or defeat, but by being outclassed. Ichigo is a no one from nowhere. Byakuya fought for the justice he believed in, and lost to a stronger force who is doing what he wishes he could, saving Rukia's life. And when Aizen is exposed, Byakuya is provided a stage to fight for that same justice and honor his oath to Hisana. He risks his life for Rukia's sake. Ultimately, Rukia 
Rukia is exonerated of her crimes, Ichigo and the rest of the Karakura gang, the Ryoka, the evil intruders, are all provided shelter until they recover and given the freedom to return to the world of the living. All things considered, it is a relatively positive ending to this storyline, despite the conflicts they know are coming concerning Aizen. Rukia chooses to stay in the Soul Society, not just because this is the world she's always known, not just because she'd been forgiven for her crimes. When she had first arrived in Karakura Town, she was disillusioned with being a Shinigami. She was ridden with guilt due to the death of Kayen. The complete transfer of her powers to Ichigo was precisely because of the Horyoku within her, granting her desire of no longer being a Shinigami. She had a broken relationship with Renji, and her older brother would never even look at her. The only normal person in her life died by her own hands. This is why Death and Strawberry is the title of the first and final volumes. Ichigo reinstilled Rukia's will to live, and Rukia brought Ichigo into a new world, one where he no longer feels powerless and can protect his loved ones. Yes, he did get embarrassed by Aizen. Yes, he is absolutely terrified of the hollow within him, but he feels like he has overcome the main burden of his life. This is the Soul Society arc, a tale of an extremely flawed civilization being hoodwinked, bamboozled, and led astray by the grand ambitions of a single man. The tale of a traditionalist society being slowly but surely swayed to reform by the unshakable resolve of a single man. From mending the broken relationships between Rukia, Byakuya, and Renji, to criticizing the laws and customs of the Shinigami, even if he's a mixture of Shinigami, Quincy, Hollow, and Fullbringer, Ichigo is still a human at his core. His formative years years were spent among humans, his family are humans, yet he is still respected enough to be given a substitute Shinigami badge by Ukitake and be considered one of them. Uryu's immediate suspicion of the badge is a really neat piece of foreshadowing of how it functions as a surveillance device that is completely in character for somebody like him who already harbors resentment and suspicions of the Shinigami. Fighting against Mayuri of all people didn't leave the best of impressions, but Ichigo remains very much an exception, fitting for the substitute Shinigami. He isn't really one of them. Ichigo remains a unique existence in the universe. These two are genuine friends. Hostile for sure, but still friends. From a storytelling and character building perspective, the Soul Society arc accomplishes a great deal of crucial things. The picture has become clearer. Ichigo through his unshakable resolve, strong sense of morality, and prodigious talent greatly affects the world around him. He instills change everywhere he goes, from a Quincy in the first arc to a million year old Shinigami society in the second. A shonen protagonist inspiring positive change wherever they go isn't revolutionary by any means, but in the case of Bleach, this common concept speaks directly to the central ideas of the story. Bleach is told through cycles, for this is a story deeply concerned with free will and fatalism. Cycles of pain and suffering primarily expressed through grief. Uryu cursed his own weakness for his mother's death. Byakuya was stuck between two oaths to the dead. Rukia was purposeless after losing Kayen. Renji was powerless in the face of Byakuya. Kenpachi had an identity crisis due to the loss of a loved one. Even on the other side of the spectrum, Tosen is enacting a sense of justice born from the grief he feels towards the death of his friend, and choosing what he believes to be the path of least bloodshed. The past casts a heavy shadow over the present for many of these characters, keeping them trapped in a state of suffering. Until Ichigo, the sun that illuminates them and removes those shadows. He frees Uryu by highlighting Sorken's desires, a world where Quincy and Shinigami can coexist. He frees Byakuya by teaching him to fight for what he believes in rather than what he is told to believe in. The exact same can be said for Renji to a lesser extent. He frees Rukia from her trauma, providing her with the will to live. He instills Kenpachi with the desire to bond with his Zanpaktor. But what's most noteworthy is that each of these characters' internal conflicts are still present and will continue to develop over the course of the story, Ichigo's own cycles of pain and suffering included. At this stage in the story, he lacks the necessary knowledge to understand the full scope of so many things surrounding him. His time in this new world has only really just begun. He doesn't know the real story behind Masaki's death, his parents' true identities, the nature of his Zanpakuto, the extension of his very soul. His personal battles grappling with his grief, his own identity, and the many forms of fate are only just beginning.
Ichigo returns to his previous life, a substitute Shinigami that maintains peace within Karakura Town by handling the Hollows, this time with more knowledge and power than he previously had, but also with a new conflict accompanied by new players in town. Hirako Shinji of the Visors has arrived, quite literally upside down. Everything about Shinji is an inversion, backwards or upside down, from his Zanpakuto to his existence as an exiled Shinigami who possesses the power of a hollow. He will go on to be one of the few unique individuals who assist Ichigo in developing his powers, with the inversion symbolising how he will soon turn Ichigo's world upside down. He will dramatically impact Ichigo's way of thinking and treatment of the hollow that lies within, providing him with a new perspective on the monster that terrifies him. He serves a role similar, though not identical, to Rukia's introducing Ichigo to a brand new world of supernatural beings. First, the Shinigami. Now, a Shinigami merged with their mortal enemies, a Zanpakuto and the Mask of a Hollow, a Shinigami who crossed over into the realm of the Hollows, a Visit, one of the masked army. Just like you, Kurosaki Ichigo, join us, you don't belong with them. Ichigo was accepted by the Shinigami a matter of days ago and already, this partnership is questioned. Where does Ichigo truly belong? Who amongst? Where is Ichigo's place in this vast cosmos of swirling life and death? Therein lies the ultimate aim of the Aranka saga. Shinji urges Ichigo to relax, that somebody with Reryoku of his calibre shouldn't be so easily rattled as that will echo throughout the world. They will feel your presence, and indeed they did. Grand Fisher, now an Aranka, returns to Karakura to claim retribution. Uryu, now powerless, is attacked and chased by yet another Aranka. His father arrives to to rescue him, promising to restore his powers under a single pretense. Swear to never involve yourself with Shinigami again. The unavoidable battle Sokin spoke of is clearly fueling Ryuken's words. He knows of the inescapable impending conflict between the Quincy and the Shinigami. On the other side of town, another father is rescuing their child. Kon is within Ichigo's human body and Ishin shows up in a Shihakusho with a Zanpakuto to fend off Grand Fisher, the hollow who killed his wife. Ishin takes Ichigo's place and avenges Masaki in his stead, lifting a burden off his shoulders without him ever finding out about it. The Aranka are established as hollows that remove their masks to gain the power of the Shinigami, the direct opposite of visors who are Shinigami that gain hollow powers through the process of holification. Ishin gives us an epic lesson on Shinigami lore and establishes himself as a captain class combatant. His powers were sealed until the trials of the Shattered Shaft. He he was a necessary counterforce to the hollow within Ichigo, neutralising its powers until it grew too powerful to be contained any longer. A strong parallel between father and son is made clear. Ishin was never bitter towards Grand Fisher for killing Masaki. He acknowledges that hollows have an insatiable thirst for murder, that they are fundamentally wired to behave the way they do, and he cannot blame them for it. That is the natural law of the universe he has resigned to, but what he can blame is his own powerlessness. The only regret he's had over the last two decades, unable to see even ghosts let alone hollows, is his incapacity to save his beloved wife. Blame takes the form of guilt pointed inwards, a near exact response to that traumatic June 17th between father and son. Aizen intends to crush the world with the army of Aranka he is creating by way of the Hongyoku. Everybody is mobilising for all out war, friend and foe alike. The Hollows under Aizen's rule, the Shinigami under Head Captain Yamamoto, and the Visors led by Hiroko Shinji. Everybody has a stake in the impending battle of fake Karakura Town. Ichigo and Uryu are explicitly paralleled for the umpteenth time both internally struggling with their powers and a sense of belonging with the Shinigami. Ichigo's inner hollow is a ticking time bomb, growing at ridiculous rates and threatening to destroy everything Ichigo knows and loves. Uryu's Quincy powers are lost, the defining characteristic of his identity, and he can only retrieve them if he promises to sacrifice his newfound love and friendship with Ichigo. Uryu makes his decision relatively quickly. Of course, it is a much easier decision. Ichigo takes his time. He needs a stark reminder of the threat his inner hollow poses and a reality check regarding the mastery of his Shinigami powers. He can comfortably use Bankai, the apex of a Shinigami's combat prowess. But that's nowhere near enough in the face of the adversaries that are right around the corner. But something else could very well be enough. The monster within. 
the voice calling him, the mask that kept coming back, the unstoppable evil inside the depths of Ichigo's very soul. He may just be enough for the conquistadors, the conquerors who have arrived to disrupt the peace. Urukyora of nothing and Yami of rage. Fully developed Aranka with blazing Reiatsu, wreaking havoc on all who are unfortunate enough to be within their vicinity. Chad acknowledges his inferiority before even arriving on the scene, pleading for Urihime to avoid the battle and instead focus on healing people, and nudge forward in her own journey of embracing her inherent strengths and allowing them to inform the role she serves in the main group. Kubo takes this moment to showcase even Orihime's superiority to Chad. He is by far the least impressive individual in the Karakura gang. Her powers immediately grasp Urukyora's attention and concern, not really healing but something more akin to time and space regression, something that rises in prominence throughout the saga, and before almost being killed by Yami, she is saved by Ichigo. Ichigo immediately enters Bankai and Orihime notices his Reiatsu feels more different than usual. He's in a fragile state of mind, terrified of his inner demon. Ichigo is revealed to be the conqueror's target, his talents being praised but still noticeably in inferior to Aizen. These hollows are different to anything Ichigo has seen so far. They have faces, broken masks, they wield Zanpakuto and emit a strange Reiatsu. Ichigo wonders if they're like Vizards, like Shinji and himself, and that single moment of fear and doubt triggers the beast Ichigo rejects, his true Zanpakuto, the mixture of his Shinigami and hollow powers into a single entity that Ichigo naturally only views as an evil, denying his help and trying to take everything on alone, telling Orihime to stay back when he's being pummeled by Yami. Ichigo physically cannot move as he puts everything into resisting White's takeover, Urukyora noticing the wild fluctuation in his Reiatsu. At its lowest, his power is garbage, but at its highest, it surpasses even Urukyora. It seems the monster within is exactly enough to protect his loved ones from these conquerors. Then again, these two are just underlings of the Grand Conqueror, the one to conquer all even the very trajectory of Ichigo's journey. Aizen dictates the direction and Ichigo moves forward, all according to plan. For Aizen knows Ichigo better than Ichigo knows himself. Urukyora is convinced the boy Aizen has his eye on is trash, not even worth killing. Once again, Ichigo is spared, humiliated in combat, powerless to protect his comrades, and spared out of pity for his weakness. It feels like just moments ago, Ichigo was convinced nothing could change his world. Luckily for Ichigo, the Wheel of Fate decides it is time for the reprisal of Death and Strawberry. The bonds he had recently formed in acquaintance with the Gotei 13 bear fruit. Hitsugiya, Renji, Rangiku, Ikaku, and Yumichika have come to help in the impending battle with the Aranka, and of course, Rukia accompanies them. The following chapter is titled Punch Down the Stone Circle, a reference to the millstone symbolic of fate. If you're afraid to lose, get stronger. If you want to protect your loved ones, then do what you have to do to protect them. If the hollow inside is so terrible, then gain the strength to crush it. Even if you're alone, isolated from everybody else in the world, nobody aligning with your ideal, stick your chest out and scream in defiance. Punch down on the crushing wheel. Rukia reminds Ichigo of the man he is at his purest, momentarily cleansing him of the fear and indecision that taints him. Kubo bounces back and forth between positive and negative frames of mind for Ichigo in this first act of the Aranka saga. Two steps forward, two steps backwards. Grimjaw's arrival fans the flames. Ichigo rescues Chad and asks him to step back, to allow him to take care of the situation alone. Ichigo stands in the way of Chad's own journey, interfering with their promise as the rift between them grows larger and larger. Chad doesn't have what it takes to match up to these monsters and they both know this well, spurring Ichigo to take everything into his own hands. But Rukia notices how tense he is. Her words of affirmation were definitely helpful but nothing close to a permanent fix. He is still battling a number of emotions. He lacks equanimity and inner balance, so she releases her powers and her Zanpakuto for the first time in the story. She has regained her powers and unlike Chad's, they are powerful enough to aid Ichigo in combat without getting in his way. Ichigo is learning to put trust in his comrades and share the burdens of responsibility with them, but it takes time, especially when spectating is in conflict with his core desire to protect all. Rukia shows him he can trust her strength, taking him two steps forward against D 
Rui. But mere moments later, he goes two steps backwards as she is easily knocked out by Grimjow. Ichigo is overpowered by Grimjow as well, but still gains his respect when he gets to showcase the black Getsuga Tensho, drawing from the power of the hollow within at the cost of weakening his self-control. That respect is minor trivial. Grimjow recognizes the toll it takes on Ichigo and knows it would do nothing to him in release form. But it is still respect, and Ichigo has earned Grimjow's interest. Had Tosen not arrived to escort Grimjow back to Hueco Mundo, Ichigo would have most likely died here at his hands. Ichigo agrees, lamenting in his own weakness and succumbing to his defeat. Grim is scolded by Tosen for his actions, forced to pay the price of an arm as punishment for acting outside of orders. Aizen handles the situation with manipulative finesse, both penalizing Grimjow for his rashness and affirming his motives as an overzealous display of loyalty. Aizen leads the Aranka as an intelligent, authoritative ruler. He helms a regime here that strongly resembles the one he fell from. In the meantime, Ichigo has decided to join the Visors, some of the first victims of Aizen's trickery. We reach the 25th volume of Bleach and within the poem, coming from the perspective of Ichigo's inner hollow, his true Zanpakuto, the extension of his soul, resides the ultimate message of Bleach. In a 2008 interview, Kubo was asked why the theme of death is prevalent in both of the manga he had serialized in Weekly Shonen Jump, to which he responded, life and death have been important to him since he was a child. Where did we come from? Where are we going? The realization that there is no life without death is something Kubo profoundly respects, coming front and center in the narrative of Bleach, best represented through its main character. We are all born dead. The end exists before anything begins, a direct reference to the cyclic nature of life and death, the Buddhist teaching of samsara. Birth is not the beginning of life and death is not the end, rather they are junctures in a never-ending cycle. If living is a constant quest for awareness, the awareness we gain at the end is the real goal. In other words, death is the discovery and complete understanding of the end. Death for the first time in the series isn't framed as a negative thing. Ichigo likens death to the discovery and complete understanding of the end, the resolution he strives for in overcoming the unknown. We are not permitted to seek awareness. Those that cannot transcend death will not find awareness in anything. Ichigo paints a vivid picture of the inherent conflict present in his previous words. Life is a constant quest for awareness. Death as the end of life metaphorically represents absolute awareness. This poem and its implications are obscured by its placement in the story. As previously stated, Bleach is a story that hinges upon hindsight. The story is infinitely reframed by later context. What originally seems like a struggle against an inner hollow, the monsters with an unquenchable thirst for bloodshed, evolves into a story of rejecting one's true nature, battling against one's own repressed emotions. The essence of what may seem like abstract ramblings for now will also evolve over time, becoming much clearer in the context of the entire story. Ichigo's resolve is tested by Hiyori, which leads to the unwilling activation of his inner hollow, forming a mask he cannot control. These powers cannot be contained by the body or the mind. The answer exists within. Every answer Ichigo could ever wish to seek exists within his own soul. He is transported into his inner realm, but this time, old man Zangetsu isn't there to greet him. Instead, the spirit he perceives as a monster lies in wait, greeting Ichigo as the king of this world. This is The Dark Side of the Universe, Part 3. The Hollow repeatedly reiterates that he is Zangetsu, but his words fall on deaf ears. The idea that Ichigo's powers exist as one, despite their naturally opposing forces, is made clear to him. Zangetsu and the Hollow share the same body, battling for dominance over Ichigo's soul, with the current victor being reflected by the spirit's appearance. Ichigo fights to reclaim old man Zangetsu, to defeat the Hollow and bring things back to falsehood, with his Quincy powers functioning as the center of his Reryoku, only mimicking a Shinigami. He doesn't understand, but yet again, how could he? The hollows are monsters, are they not? Surely this hollow inside of him that feeds on his soul and yearns for control is the same. Surely if given control, this hollow will breed carnage. Ichigo is not wrong for thinking this way, but he is wrong for failing to see beyond the surface. He only believes what he can see, after all. 
They both enter Bankai together, which further hints at the Hollow's true nature. They learned Bankai at the same time, for this is his true Zanpakuto. This is a battle for control. A battle between two beings that are identical in appearance, but seemingly opposed in temperament. A battle for control between a man and his shadow, a king and his horse. What determines control? Shape? Ability? Strength? If two beings are exactly the same, what allows one to dominate the other? The manifestation of Ichigo's deep darkest emotions, his repressed desire for battle and victory claims that a killer instinct is the answer, that somewhere carved deep into Ichigo's primordial unconscious, he must want to kill. The monster's words ring loudly in his subconscious, shifting his frame of mind and ultimately shaking the core of who Ichigo is. He begins to live an even deeper lie than previously. Ichigo begins to dream. Since this is already taking place within his mind, his dream world, you can think of this as a dream within a dream. Something completely unique to this one moment. We have never seen a Shinigami dream within their inner world. The inner world is already a projection of their mind. Why go even further? Ichigo subconsciously manifests Kenpachi, a man whose love for battle previously eluded him. A man who believes all are born with an innate desire to fight, born to seek battle forever. Ichigo succumbs to this dark philosophy that has slowly seeped into his soul. If a killer instinct is what he needs to protect his loved ones, then a killer instinct is what he projects. He wins this battle of control, but it is far from over. This is yet another hoax, a lie he tells to himself, a lie he believes. By embracing the ideology of his inner demon, he strays further from his core. He gains a false sense of victory over the hollow within that he successfully subdues, albeit with an ominous warning. I accept you as my king for now, but either one of us can become the king or the horse. Make sure you don't get killed. The moment I sense the slightest weakness in you, I'll throw you off and crush your skull. Remember the false sense of enlightenment Ichigo previously exhibited upon achieving Bankai? At that time, it was coupled with a poem nothing can change my world. This time it is coupled with a chapter title, No Shaking Throne. The king rests firmly on his royal seat, denying the horse that carries him any command over him. But the horse's threats do sting. They puncture his brittle ego and make themselves comfortable in the depths of his distorted mind. The king who seeks an even grander pedestal in godhood has been better understood by his mortal enemies. Aizen's true objective has been discovered. He seeks to create an Oken, a royal key to traverse into the higher, inaccessible dimension of the Soul King. To do so, he requires two things, 100,000 souls and a Jureichi, a concentrated spirit zone a spiritually charged area to which spirits are drawn, an unusual phenomenon in the world of the living that changes locations over time. This time, it exists in Karakura Town. The crushing wheel of fate has directed its gaze at the home of our protagonist. Everybody he has ever known and loved is in immediate danger, and everything is by Aizen's design. Upon learning of Aizen's plans, Ichigo barely reacts. He's always known what he has to do, harness his power into a strong blade and shatter fate itself. No matter who stands in his way, no matter what obstacles he must face, Ichigo persists with straightforward, infectious resolve, or so he thinks. He can feel himself getting stronger, but something is up. He looks jaded, disillusioned. Orihime even notes that his behavior is strange, and she's correct in thinking so. Ichigo simultaneously accepts and refuses the hollow within. He accepts its ideology, but rejects its true nature as the extension of his soul. He embraces a killer instinct, despite how diametrical that is to his core desires, his yearning to protect and prevent others from suffering the same fate he did as a child. Uryu regains his Quincy Reryoku in a process that informs many of Bleach's themes. Struck by a spirit arrow 90mm to the right of the heart's sinoatrial node, only when the mind and body have been pushed to their limits. Rather peculiar, isn't it? The process of reactivating one's Quincy powers once they have been lost is very similar to the process by which Yuhaba's powers are halted. The Kokoro continues to be the fundamental foundation that everything within this story rests upon. On the other side of town, Urahara rejects Orihime's desire to join the upcoming battle. Tsubaki, her only offensive weapon, was broken. 
Despite Chad's interjection as someone who can resonate with Orihime's desire to grow and fight alongside her friends, Urahara is very firm in his stance. She is not needed. But as Urahara dismisses Orihime's powers, Aizen entertains them out of interest. Hachijen repairs Tsubaki but still tests Orihime's conviction. Much like his own powers, Orihime's abilities aren't suited for combat, especially against the Aranka. He asks her, do you want to fight? To which she immediately responds as bluntly as she can muster, yes, yes I want to fight. And fight she does, in her own unique way. The important thing isn't how you should be, but how you want to be. The ethos of this story wrapped in a nugget of wisdom presented to a girl who yearns for strength, to fight for those she loves without being a burden. Unfortunately for the girl, fate cares little for her yearnings. A month ago, before Aizen had developed any interest in Orihime's abilities, he ordered Urikyora to capture one of Ichigo's friends and bring them to Hueko Mundo in hopes of triggering a rescue attempt. All for the purpose of raising Ichigo like a lamb for slaughter. It's incredibly noteworthy that Urikyora decided to capture Orihime, even though he wasn't explicitly ordered to. Any will do is exactly what Aizen stated. As a literal physical expression of the crushing wheel, Aizen's will is in tune with fate itself. He wants Orihime, so he gets what he wants regardless of any direct assertion. The third Aranka invasion of Karakura town commences and Ichigo's training this last month is put to test against the man who humiliated him. 11 seconds hollow find is all he can muster for now. This battle in Karakura is a calculated misdirection as Urukyora captures Orihime. He states that Aizen wants her powers, that he has orders to bring her back unharmed. We know this didn't actually happen. Aizen does want her powers, he would like her to be brought unharmed, but he never once expressed this directly to Urikyora, but he knows his king well, bolstering Aizen's throne as the horse that carries him to wherever he wishes. What stings most is the illusion of choice Urikyora presents to Orihime. He tells her that coming with him is not a negotiation, but an order, yet he doesn't take her by force. He breaks her psychologically, threatening to kill her friends if she doesn't heed his words, but showcasing empathy in allowing her to choose her single goodbye. The invasion comes to an end, with Ichigo once again staring at superior beings in the sky above him, coming and going as they please, and Orihime returns to Karakura town for one final night. Halcyon days is a term derived from Latin that essentially represent the golden days of the past, what Orihime had only just been living in. Forced to say goodbye, she visits Ichigo and professes her love for him in the shadow of his bedroom, thanking him for everything he's done for her. A bittersweet moment where she fails to do what she wants to do and instead succumbs to what she should do. She is not alone in falling victim to the maneuvers of fate. Orihime's departure from the human world triggers intense emotions from all her friends that prove useless in the face of the Soul Society's traditionalist values. The life of one girl cannot possibly hope to compare to the lives of all. Orihime must be abandoned, and Ichigo is forced to submission to do as he should and not as he wants. Tatsuki feels compelled to confront Ichigo and his strange behaviour over the last few months now that Orihime has disappeared, but all Ichigo does in response is push her further away, leave her wallowing in the unknown, taking the darkness on alone. He makes way to Orahara who ironically caused this entire mess by making the same mistake Ichigo just made. He refused to allow Orihime onto the battlefield out of fear Aizen develops an interest in her powers. But he confronted the situation passively, keeping her in the dark. Almost immediately after denying the arm of one friend, Ichigo accepts the arm of another too. Uryu and Chad join him after proving their worth through a showcase of strength. Well, Chad proves his worth. Uryu doesn't have to. Ichigo knows my boy is built different. Orihime's powers are established as a rejection of phenomena, far more than just temporal or spatial regression. Aizen likens them to overstepping the limitations set by the gods. The Shinshun Rika are a violation of divine law. A human girl with no special background possessing powers that actualize everything Aizen stands for as the fallen angel. 
the path to the hollow world has been prepared and these three protectors stand in defiance of soul society tradition once again to save the fourth of the evil intruders. Uryu is a special case as he stands in defiance of not just the Shinigami but the promise he made to his father. But he justifies this with Ichigo's own defiance of the Shinigami, a perfect loophole that allows him to do both as he should and as he wants. The group are immediately welcomed by Aranka. In fact, one of these guys appeared way back in volume 3 during Grand Fisher's transformation. They look less like the Aranka they've accustomed to, so Uryu hypothesizes the weaker they are, the lower their intelligence, the more they look like hollow. The value of teamwork and confiding in the strength of your friends is made abundantly clear as Uryu and Chad switch opponents, optimizing their matchups, and effortlessly handle the two Aranka they were just struggling with. Then they show compassion to these monsters. They try to spare them, but they are the ones who are spared. The room is designed to self-destruct, and the guardians who are assigned to handle intruders show inklings of humanity in sharing this information. Lord Aizen walks the path of fearlessness, and his followers flock to him precisely because of the fear they feel towards him. Born of fear, driven by by fear, controlled by fear. Fear determines the design of Aizen's empire, and these intruders, our protagonists, aim to instill fear in the fearless. This is Hueco Mundo, a realm characterized by death. The very nature of its inhabitants stem from the concept of death, and Bleach illustrates this painstakingly throughout the course of the arc. Hueco Mundo is based on one of the six realms of Samsara, specifically the Preta realm inhabited by hungry ghosts, a type of Buddhist rebirth based on strong possessiveness and desire which cultivated in the ghost's previous life, a perfect match to the hollows. The Preta are sentient beings who are constantly extremely hungry but can never satisfy their needs. Jibakure are pluses who cannot pass on due to their desire to stay at a specific place, and Tsukire are pluses who cannot pass on due to a strong possessiveness over a loved one. Once the chain of fate completely corrodes, they become hollows whose first target is the source of their attachment. Like I said, a perfect match. What's most interesting about Hueco Mundo being a reference to the Preta realm though is the repeated visual of the crescent moon. In Buddhist symbology, this is a representation of spiritual enlightenment. But the Preta spirits are the furthest thing from enlightened beings. They are victims of their own shortcomings, slaves of desire trapped in an endless struggle of consumption and emptiness. Of course, this consistent symbol of a crescent moon is intended as a mockery. Aizen serves the role of a god for the Aranka, using the Hogyoku to forcefully evolve them, an allegory of false enlightenment. An inherent contradiction as enlightenment isn't something that can be imposed or forced, rather it is internally attained. We see this through Ichigo's journey time and time again as I've already addressed. To make this subversion even more blatant, the lunar phase of Hueco Mundo's moon is inverted. Aizen rules by instilling fear in his underlings. They follow him not out of trust or loyalty, but rather out of an impulsive desire for survival. In Hueco Mundo, you either die by Aizen's hand or serve under his banner. He is simultaneously the subject and solution of their fear, assuring them there is nothing to fear as long as they stay with him. They know too well that nobody can defeat him. On the other side of this barren wasteland, in the empty desert, Ichigo and his gang stumble upon an even deeper showcase of humanity from these supposed monsters, Nell and her family. Goofier, kinder Aranka. Nothing like any of the other Aranka we've met over the course of the story. This meeting of strangers from separate worlds exists to directly complement the first encounter our protagonist received in Soul Society. Ichigo is the evil intruder placed at odds with a massive gatekeeper, making friends in the new world in the process. Nell begins to fear Ichigo when she realizes he is a Shinigami, proof that every soul is ultimately the same. Victims of a larger way of thinking prescribed by the societies they exist within. Everybody can only know as much as they've been exposed to, and the likes of Kurosaki Ichigo are few and far between in this sprawling universe. He is an anomaly in the cogs of fate. He exists in his own world, defined by his own rules informed by his own way of thinking, a contagious way of thinking that impacts everybody he meets, friend and foe alike. In complete defiance of their head captain's orders, Renji and Rukia arrive in the hollow world to assist Ichigo in his endeavor. Not only are they here to help, they are here to scold him for rushing into this alone. 
own and not trusting them to come through for him. That is how far they've come in such little time. Their friendship knows no bounds. And to make this valiant act of disobedience that much more sweeter, it was Byakuya of all people who allowed for it to even happen. Like Uryu, he finds a loophole in his orders and follows his heart, doing as he desires rather than being limited to what is expected of him. Byakuya, the token of Soul Society's traditionalism, the man whose strong sense of justice demanded his aid in the execution of his own sister mere months ago. His entire world was shook by Ichigo and his values swayed. Now he works against the system that shackled him for the man who freed him. Five warriors, five paths. They huddle together and revive an archaic Shinigami tradition, chanting a charm in hopes of mutual safety and success. This is the invasion of Las Noches, the heart of Hueco Mundo. Orihime is caged in psychological chains of Aizen and Urukyora's doing. Her mental faculties confused, her allegiances smeared, a ruse by Aizen to satisfy his boredom as he waits for the Hogyoku to fully activate. But this ruse ultimately fails. Orihime is acting completely out of her own volition. She has chosen to bear the brunt of the pain, to take on the darkness alone and destroy the Hogyoku when the opportunity arises. She is here with an unshakable will to carry out her own mission. A mission that can only be accomplished by Orihime. A mission that is guaranteed to cost her life. A price she is willing to pay. Nell clings to Ichigo as her protector. Together they venture into the lair of the Tres Cifras. Yaranka who have been assigned three digit numbers. A symbol of demotion denoting the Espada who've been divested of their ranks. Dodoni is Ichigo's first obstacle in the gauntlets of Hueco Mundo. Ichigo acknowledging the countless obstacles that lie beyond his immediate opponent, refuses to fight at full power and waste his energy on a man considered too weak to maintain his position as an Espada. He suffers as a result, putting Nell in harm's way and being forced to enter Bankai to protect her. He acknowledges his mistake, his foolish ego and supposed killer instincts that demand restraint in battle in the pursuit of greater power. Admirable, impressive, sure, but never worth letting a friend get hurt. Ichigo's disposition as the one who protects gains the respect of Dordoni, who likens his kindness and sweetness to chocolate, and so Dordoni wishes to fight him at his absolute best, shamelessly directing his attacks towards Nell in hopes of forcing Ichigo to holofy. His wishes are granted, but only for a second, for that is all Ichigo needs to defeat his opponent. Dordoni is a victim of his own powerlessness. He tasted the glory of standing at the summit as one of the few chosen Espada but was considered expendable once the Hogyoku was brought into the picture and the power expected of these chosen few increased exponentially. Healed by Nell, Dodoni swoops in for a counter-attack that is met with further humiliation. Ichigo doesn't want to cut him down but he knows he must, to honour Dodoni's choice despite his wounds and almost certain death. Finally, he accepts defeat. The Ihequia arrive to dispatch the defeated and pursue Ichigo, but Dodoni resists, his sword broken but his will intact, fighting for the man who respected him enough to hollow fire even at the cost of depleting his strength against an opponent who could have easily been handled otherwise. Dodoni showcases humanity in ways I don't think anybody could have expected going into this hollow world, but he does make it abundantly clear that the road ahead will not be so kind, that Ichigo must kill without hesitation. To waver is to lose. To heal their wounds is to ask for them to kill you. All thoughts of mercy must be stripped from his mind if Ichigo is to survive. He must leave his chocolate sweetness here and become a stone-hearted demon. Words that exist only in Dodoni's mind as internal thoughts, yet they still reach Ichigo and come full circle in his battle against Urukyora. Uryu defeats Suruchi as a firm representation of his people, a Quincy in mind, body in soul. Chad defeats Moskeda as a hollow. He has finally understood the root of his powers and embraces them, using the darkness to his advantage in the pursuit of his ideal. To fight alongside Ichigo not as a nuisance, but a helpful warrior. Though with hindsight, it is fair to say Chad's moment of internal understanding here is invalid. His powers do starkly resemble those of a hollow, but in truth, he is a fullbringer, an entity that remains unknown at this current stage of the story. Enlightenment is the pinnacle of self-realization, to reach the apex of your potential as an individual. 
Chad now believes he has reached this stage and perhaps has the most impressive performance of the three who vanquished the Privaron Espada, but this enlightenment is a falsehood. The number five Espada, Noitara Gilga, who is exhaustively paired with Crescent Moons, has arrived to show him the depths of his falsehood. From one fraud, to another. Chad is humiliated and the rest of our protagonists sense his waning spiritual energy but this is not the time for diversions. Belief is all they can muster for now as they charge headfirst into enemy territory. Urukyora tests the psychic cage he believes Orihime is trapped within, provoking her by assuring the deaths of the foolhardy friends who have come to save her. He tells her she should be disgusted with them for rushing into Hueco Mundo like lambs to the slaughter, triggering her to smack him across the face an act of pure emotion, heeding Hachijin's words of acting as one wishes to. Orihime knows that this monster could dispatch her with relative ease. She has practically nothing going for her besides the guts to do it. Perhaps she knows Urukyora is a loyal servant who wouldn't harm her out of consideration for Aizen's plans, but that in of itself is a gamble. The Espada explains to her that Noitara didn't follow Aizen's orders to stay put, which ultimately means that Chad's defeat was entirely in Noitara's hands. Of course, Urukyora tells her this to make her feel better. He displays inklings of kindness that remain obscured behind his tough mask of apathy. Urukyora feels more than most, but he has convinced himself that everything he says and does is attributed to pure objective rationale. He is the quintessential embodiment of someone who does as he should. Never as he wants. Every one of Urukyora's actions are rooted in his own conceptions of logic and reason, conceptions formed on a very limited understanding of the world. After all, he can only know what he has been exposed to, and here he is exposed to intense emotions that exist in complete opposition of how he chooses to view the world. His core is shaken. This is the beginning of Urukyora's transformation. Rukia is forced to face demons of her past, demons she has only just begun to overcome. Aroniero, the number 9 Espada, unveils his mask to reveal the face of another. Kayan Shiba has returned to haunt his admirer. He confides in her, telling her a make-believe story of how he was reincarnated into the body of a hollow in Hueco Mundo. He masks his lies with inkillings of the truth, peering into Kayan's memories and using them to his advantage. He explains the blue skies within Las Noches, a false sky painted onto the dome that covers the city. Aizen rules everywhere the light shines, a laughable attempt at enforcing his supposed godhood. But he will learn in time that to be considered a god in this world is not something one can impose. Aroniero exposes his sham when he asks Rukia to bring the heads of all her friends as repayment for taking his life, prompting an intensely emotional outburst from the one who knew Kayan better than most. A request like that is a disgrace to Kayan's memory, a vilification of his philosophies. By consuming the hollow who fused with the late assistant captain and inheriting their powers, Aroniero gained Kayan Shiba's spiritual body. His thoughts, his experience, his physical form, all lie in the palm of the Espada's hand, a mockery of his existence that has come to end the life of the one who ended his. Rukia wallows in her feelings of grief, guilt, and shame as she succumbs to her opponent's power, but then she remembers. The reason Kayan even meant so much to her to begin with, a distant memory concealed by years of anguish. Kayan's philosophy of love and kinship. Whenever people grow close, a heart is born between them. If you are alone in the world, you cannot have a heart. You mustn't die alone as the heart you formed with your close ones is left with them, living on within them. That is what Kayan believed. That is why he thanks Rukia on his deathbed for allowing him to leave his heart within her. The key to overcoming her trauma existed in a long forgotten lesson she received from the subject of her grief. But she remembers. She musters the resolve to turn the tide of this deathmatch only when she acknowledges that Kayan's heart lives on inside her. She clings to life in respect of Kayan's words, refusing to die alone as she slowly falls unconscious. This concept of the heart essentially 
essentially being a medium for connection is prevalent not just in this saga but throughout the entire story. After all, everything ultimately flows back into that fundamental principle of the Kokoro. Everybody across the battlefield is convinced of Rukia's death besides Ichigo, whose path has been blocked by none other than Urukyora. He almost redirects his path towards Rukia, claiming he has no reason to kill Urukyora despite them being enemies, justifying this by assuming Urukyora hasn't hurt any of his friends yet. A laughable assumption, as this is the man who spearheaded the capture of Orihime. Upon learning this, Ichigo erupts. He fights purely out of rage, embracing his killer instinct by immediately donning the mask of his inner hollow and giving his enemy absolutely everything he's got. He is swinging with clear intent to kill, but ultimately, his efforts prove futile against this vastly superior combatant. He barely puts a scratch on Orikyora, whose dominance is made clear, so Ichigo makes yet another laughable assumption. Such a ridiculously powerful man must surely be the leader of the Espada. He was consistently seen giving orders, so it's a fair assessment, but it could not be further from the truth. Urukyoro reveals his tattoo. He is ranked fourth, a bitter pill for Ichigo to swallow. Even if he somehow manages to overcome this insurmountable obstacle, there lies three even greater obstacles on the road ahead. Victory seems completely out of reach for Ichigo as his chest is caved in. A pitiful, disappointing performance for the boy who has consistently surpassed expectations. This is the supposed end for Ichigo, as his body begins to envelop in a dark aura that permeates the pages. Orihime's indiscriminate love of life and intense kindness irradiates the following scene, as she heals the young hollow girls who previously tormented her. She doesn't treat hollows any differently from humans, it's not even a matter of question for her. She respects all forms of life equally, without concern for any external factors. The same can most definitely be said for Ichigo, but not to the same extent. Orihime's compassion knows no bounds, she doesn't have the capacity for wrongdoing. Ichigo has the capacity for evil in its darkest form. They will both come to learn this about the other in the following conflict. Grimjao's crippling inferiority complex demands he uses Orihime to heal Ichigo. He deserves a fair fight against his match. He even goes as far as sealing Urukyora in a closed dimension to prevent any interference. But why go to such lengths just to fight against Ichigo? What did he see in this man in their last two encounters that lit this fiery desire to crush him? In their first encounter, Ichigo is undergoing going an internal identity crisis which reflects in his powers. He lacks control over himself. He fears the killer instinct associated with his hollow identity that repeatedly made itself known. The subject of Ichigo's fear is the subject of Grimjao's interest, a violent killer who manages to leave a scar on Grimjao's chest. In their second encounter, Grimjao's interest is elevated substantially by way of Ichigo's holification. Not only has he grown considerably since their last meeting, but he has made progress in embracing the identity that previously terrified him. Ichigo's indomitable spirit, his unshakable belief in his own victory, grinds Grimjao's gears. Even if he just got his shit rocked, not once did Ichigo falter. This third encounter will put everything to the test. Who is stronger? The self-proclaimed king who fights to assert himself, or the unwilling king who currently fights for everything but himself? Volume 32 is titled Howling, and it contains a poem from Grimjow's perspective directed inwards. It begins with a self-imposition of royalty. Grimjow considers himself a king who runs, moving forward in hopes of sustaining his identity. Shaking off his shadows is representative of the countless hollows embedded deep into his soul. These shadows exist in permanent competition. They fight for domination over the host's body, asserting their individuality ultimately to control. Grimjow transcended the other hollows melded within his soul simply through affirming his own existence. He conquered them through sheer force of will. That is why he considers himself a king, his armor clanking, scattering bones, tasting flesh and blood, crushing groaning hearts, and stepping in alone to a distance beyond. A king without a kingdom, 
By crushing Ichigo with everything he's got, he will further affirm this identity that both characterizes and shackles him. He prods at Ichigo's motivations, encouraging him to recognize a carnal desire to rip his enemy apart. But Ichigo clings to his straightforward resolve. He came here to save Orihime. Admittedly, this resolve is rather brittle. Grimjao voices a way of thinking almost identical to what his inner hollow believes. Remember what I said when I was talking about those chapters? By succumbing to his inner demon's ideology in hopes of gaining more power, Ichigo strayed from his core. Whenever he dons the hollow's mask, he is living a lie. The killer instinct lives in direct opposition to his desire to protect. But Ichigo considers this lie necessary in his ultimate pursuit. Grimjao pokes at the beast. He doesn't want to fight this shell of a man but the demon trapped within. He forces Ichigo to holofy against his wishes and finally reveals his release state. This is the man Grimjao was looking for. A man who relishes in battle. Fighting like a mindless monster yet still defending Orihime with everything he has. Even his manner of speech is different. It seems as if he's under the influence of his inner demon. Orihime notices this and questions if the man protecting her is even really Ichigo. She's frightened of those eyes. The eyes of someone or something she doesn't know. Ichigo sacrifices everything he stands for by relying on those hollow powers. Only does he recognize this when Orihime screams for his safety. As reflected by the volume sketches, Ichigo goes from being chained into a 2 to then breaking free of those chains into a three. These chains are a symbolic representation of Ichigo's killer instinct, but by breaking free of them upon heeding Orihime's words, he finds harmony in these conflicting ideologies. He can protect whilst maintaining the killer instinct within, so long as he accepts both sides and doesn't try to pick and choose between feelings that are deeply embedded in his soul. He aims to use this killer instinct not to fight selfishly but to fuel his desire to protect his loved ones. Even if the power is terrifying and inherently demonic, he won't let that get to him. He succumbs to Grimjao's prior claim. He did come here to fight him, and Urukyora, and Aizen. He came here to defeat them and take his friends back home. That killer instinct of his doesn't need to be in opposition with his desire to protect. All it takes is a shift in perspective. Ironically, he gains this through communicating with Grimjao in this battle. By better understanding the nature of his enemy, Ichigo better understands himself. Noitara Gilga steps onto the scene the poster boy of false enlightenment. He serves a similar role to Byakuya in the Soul Society arc, a personification of the idea Ichigo tramps all over by the end of the saga. This character is a bundle of symbolism. Kubo explicitly incorporates moon symbols in his weapon and headgear, a nod to his perceived enlightenment. The naming convention of his abilities indicates some sort of divinity. The animal he is visually paired with is the praying mantis, which has strong ties to spirituality across various cultures. But these are substantive elements of his character. The real meat lies in his interactions and dynamic with Nell, whom he considers his nemesis. The 33rd volume of Bleach is titled A Bad Joke, a nod to the futility of Menos' evolution. To evolve, Menos must consume other hollows, but the condition for this evolution is constant consumption. Otherwise, they'd regress into a lesser stage which would make further evolution impossible. This renders the evolved hollows no different from lesser hollows. It is fundamentally impossible for them to escape this endless cycle of consumption and suffering. A bad joke indeed. The poem of this volume is especially noteworthy. Noitara likens the Aranka to insects, parasitic worms writhing in malicious constancy. They are sort of like parasites, as an amalgamation of souls with one asserting its dominance over the others. Noitara doesn't want to be pitied, so he soars past the moon, seeking strength superior to all as that remains the one thing that differentiates one hollow from another, or so he thinks. Even as he likens himself to an insect, he expresses contempt for anyone who sees themselves as higher than him. That is why he detests Nell with every fibre of his being. 
Her very existence defies his beliefs. She is stronger than him, not just in body and mind, but spirits also. But her superior strength isn't what Noitara hates. Nell doesn't kill if she doesn't have to. She shows compassion towards lesser hollows. She values life. In many ways, Nell is an anomaly to the hollow condition. She has broken free, denying instinct and embracing reason as a rational being. But through Noitara's contempt and Zairoporo's malice, she is rendered a powerless child who can only function by way of instinct. But she temporarily gains power to protect her protector. However, this ultimately proves ineffective as she returns to that state of innocent instinct. Luckily for Ichigo, his previous efforts manifest into a fortunate outcome. The change he brought about to the unchanging soul society bears fruit in the captain's intrusion of Hueko Mundo. Kempachi, Byakuya, Unohana and Mayuri enter the fray. We begin with Byakuya versus Omari, which commences with a struggle of speed. Byakuya discards his captain's cloak to win this struggle, to symbolize what he's truly fighting for. The pride he refers to in defeating his opponent is not in reference to his position as a captain, but as the older brother of Rukia. The self-righteousness of the Shinigami is heavily criticized throughout the battle. By what right do they slaughter the Hollows? Who made them protectors of humanity? Who gave them the authority? By what right can they consider Hollows evil? The justice they hold in their hands is a farce. There is truth in Zomari's words, but they are directed at the wrong man. This isn't the poster boy of the Soul Society's justice anymore. He isn't fighting out of duty. He isn't even acting as a Shinigami. He fights out of love for his sister. Zomari also serves the role of a mirror in this battle, reflecting on Tobiakuya the man he once was. A man who blindly follows the orders of his superiors, even at the cost of his own desire. But now he carries himself as a man who does as he wants, not as he should. Mayuri, who has only ever served the role of a villain in the story thus far, faces off against the mad scientist Zairoporo Granz, a man who desired immortality by way of science to circumvent the fundamental nature of being a hollow as a representation of death, to become the perfect being, a doomed endeavor as seeking perfection is a fool's game. But Zairoporo never realized that and he pays the ultimate price for it. His ironic downfall is rooted in the very ability that represents his madness, as he rebirths through Nemu and therefore absorbs the poison Mayuri had already implanted within her. Mayuri remains a very morally questionable individual, a static character, relatively unchanged by the events of Soul Society. In some ways, a counterbalance to the drastic changes many other characters have undergone in such a short span of time. The same cannot be said for Zaraki Kenpachi. In some ways, he is very much the same. In others, he is growing at a terrifying rate. It's worth noting that despite his demonic nature and being a man fully prepared to kill, Kenpachi doesn't fight with the intent to kill. He fights almost entirely for the thrill. He loves fighting, but he isn't the type to continue a fight once his opponent has been defeated. If they die in the process, so be it. He is the archetypal blood knight. He lives for the battle. On top of this, he's also a victim of the past, grieving the death of Yachiru Onohana, the only person to ever bring him joy. He subconsciously suppressed his true power many years ago, and he inches closer to the monster he used to be every time he is pushed to his limits. In a way, he overcomes his grief through the thrill of battle, by chasing the pinnacle of battle he tasted as a child, a story told almost entirely through subtext. Kenpachi is a character whose development is rooted in fundamental aspects of Bleach's lore to incredible lengths. His dynamic with Yachiru manifests in several ways. She is the token of battle he strives to reach, the subject of his grief, and also the extension of his soul, intrinsically tied to his existence as the sword he has finally tried to open up to. Kenpachi isn't the type to dodge attacks, he meets them with his blade or takes them head first, fearless in the face of death. Noitara, on the other hand, is afraid of getting hurt despite priding himself in having the hardest hero of the Espada, and subsequently claiming to have no need to dodge, his fraudulence on clear display once again. Kenpachi knows who he is. He knows who he wants to be. He knows it's real and feasible. He knows it's there, he's tasted it before. He embraces his carnal desire and seeks greater heights in reaching out to his Zanpakuto. But this is all for the thrill, not to kill. Noitara kills out of fear. 
like the insect he is. He fights to kill and fights to die. He knows there is no salvation for his kind, something even the self-imposed god in Aizen cannot change. A similar concept of reaching out for the unreachable is present in both of their characters. Noitara is shackled by hollow nature, failing to exceed the limits of his existence because of his own limited perspective. We see there are other hollows who exist outside of the strictly defined boundaries of what it means to be an Aranka, but Noitara resigns to ignorance, single-minded and incorrect. Salvation is possible, even for a hollow. The story of Noitara Gilga is an effective prelude to the story of the ultimate villain. Aizen tried to recreate existence in of itself, to transcend past the limits of Shinigami and Hollow. By recreating the nature of life itself, he aims to recreate the universe and usurp the Soul King as the god above all. And ironically, he does so by creating a device containing a piece of the Soul King that manifests desires, ultimately failing due to short-sightedness. Aizen was never true to himself, and in in the end, his failure to understand himself is his undoing. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The end is near. It is time for the Battle of Fake Karakura Town. Much like the Ryoka invasion of Soul Society, this Shinigami invasion of Hueko Mundo was entirely orchestrated by Aizen, all for the purpose of confining some of the Shinigami's strongest forces in the Hollow World, separating the Gote 13's forces. Kidnapping Orihime was a way to provoke crisis within Soul Society. Her powers can dramatically speed up the Hogyoku's activation process. He thinks this will make them withdraw from the world of the living to defend their own world. But not everything fully goes to Aizen's plan. The Gote 13 lie in wait at Karakura Town, ready for war. The society Aizen had always lived within, studied meticulously, is changing before his very eyes, a product of his own creation. Las Noches is left in the hands of Urukyora, and we get a very interesting piece of dialogue from Ichigo. As substitute Shinigami of Karakura, Kenpachi tells him to take Orihime and return to protect the town. Throwing a wrench into this, Stark swoops in and captures Orihime once more. In response, Ichigo claims his job isn't just to protect Karakura, his job is to protect his friends. There's a bunch of reasons why this is an interesting line. His entire family is in Karakura, everyone he has ever known is there, but he prioritizes completing the task at hand and trusts the Gote 13 to protect his hometown in the meantime. Before he can go back to the world of the living, Ichigo believes he must fully overcome the world of the Hollows. He must overcome the very personification of despair and apathy in Urukyora, and ultimately he must overcome himself, his own feelings of fleeting control and inner turmoil. Urukyora aims to be the embodiment of nothingness, the key word being aims. Urukyora actively tries to be completely devoid of any emotion, denying himself of feeling anything but he feels nonetheless. We see inklings of his capacity for emotion time and time again. We see his disgust in Noitara's words. We see how Ichigo gets under his skin and angers him. We see how Orihime's unwavering belief in the love of her friends confuddles him. He constantly tries to prove his ideal in his dialogue with other characters, yet he himself is far from that very ideal. He is a slave to his own conceptions, his own limited perspectives. Born of the void with a complete lack of senses besides his eyes, Urukyo considers himself a wandering nothing observing a meaningless world. That's the conclusion he came to many years ago and frames his entire worldview around, making him who he is in the present. And this ideology remained unchallenged until he met Orihime, an incredibly empathetic individual who feels more than she can even understand a woman who defies the logic and reason Urukyora is enslaved by. She interests him as a human who has every reason to be absolutely terrified and completely lose hope in her own survival, but never does. And to soil his beliefs even further, Orihime attributes her lack of fear to the heart she shares with her friends, something that exists completely outside of the realm of logic, an emotion that comes from within. It cannot be seen or observed, only felt and understood. It is formless. 
Orihime voices her feelings with a sentiment that echoes Kayan's philosophy. She feels connected and synchronized with her friends. They share the same purpose, hence they share the same heart. Words that completely go over Urukyora's head. What cannot be seen does not exist. That is his belief. So, what is a heart? What does this word that humans toss around actually mean? Can it be seen if he rips open Orihime's chest? Or what if he crushes her skull? He spends almost the entirety of the impending battle devoted to trampling all over the very concept of humanity, of meaning, to break Orihime once and for all and prove his own beliefs. The 40th volume of Bleach exposes Urikyora's hypocrisy. In the poem, which outlines the seven deadly sins of Christianity, Urikyora embraces a capacity to feel. He embraces having a heart, having humanity, with lust ultimately being the one most heavily emphasized. Lust is desire. For the one who embodies nothingness, to desire anything is diametrical to everything Urikyora has convinced himself he believes. But he is transforming at rapid rates, abandoning the cage he locked himself within all of those years ago. Every chapter of this volume is titled to correspond with the seven deadly sins, in the same order as the poem, a representation of Urikyora gaining human emotion piece by piece. This is addressed in The Envy, where Ichigo notes that Urikyora's movements have become more predictable. Before he was like a stone statue, impossible to read, but now he can see his moves. And so he asks, am I able to predict those things because I am closer to a hollow, or have you become more human? The very crux of this battle put into words right at the very beginning. Urukyora as the ultimate observer insistently watches Ichigo and Orihime, studying their resolve. Without verbalizing this, Urukyora expresses a desire to see Ichigo holify. He wants to break him at his very best, to show both Ichigo and Orihime despair and trample all over their resolve. Ichigo grants him this wish, knowing he cannot hope to match his enemy without embracing the monster within. And so, Urukyora Urukyora leads him up, up above the canopy of Las Noches. They are literally above the sky itself, the crescent moon exposed, and the strongest beings currently residing within the realm truly begin their deathmatch. Here, Urukyora is free to fight as he wishes. His resurrection is powerful enough to destroy Las Noches itself. Only above can he remove the seal of his Zanpakuto and show Ichigo the hopelessness of this battle. Spiritual energy showers over Ichigo as a dense black rain to accentuate the sense of dread present, and Urukyora immediately begins to pummel Ichigo, even whilst donning the mask of the monster. The Getsuga Tensho, Ichigo's trump card, is effortlessly neutralized and rendered useless against the winged demon. And to rub salt in the wound, Urukyora uses a black sero that greatly resembles the Getsuga Tensho in appearance, yet in power, it is far greater. But for some inexplicable reason, Ichigo never falters. Urukyora cannot understand why. He's demonstrated the futility of the situation time and time again. But Ichigo remains steadfast and fights on. The eyes that cannot reflect meaning remain firm on Ichigo's grip. If he were to drop his sword and admit defeat, the pain would end. That would be the logical decision when faced with an insurmountable imbalance of power. But Ichigo doesn't function by way of logic. Urukyora attributes this inflated sense of conviction to Ichigo having been fortunate enough to steer clear of true despair. We know this isn't true, but at this point, Urukyora is grasping at any logical explanation to Ichigo's perseverance. True despair manifests in the form of his second resurrection, but Ichigo still grips firmly to his blade. Despite being terrified at the monster reflected in his eyes, Urukyora recognizes this and remains confounded at the display of sheer humanity reflected in his eyes. It's time to go all out, to pull no punches in hopes of finally breaking Ichigo by way of physical dominance. The heart eludes him. It is beyond his comprehension as he says, bound by logic in reason, Urikyora cannot understand the heart beyond its physical nature, as an organ that pumps blood around the body. And so, he blasts a hole through Ichigo's chest, destroying his actual heart as a final blow of validation. Orihime sinks into that state of despair Urikyora had been waiting for, completely hopeless. But within that sense of hopelessness and helplessness is exactly where the heart manifests and tramples all over Urikyora both literally and figuratively. Even with the absence of a physical heart, upon hearing her cries, Ichigo's soul resuscitates its dead body as a mindless monster with a single objective. 
I will protect her. The bond between Ichigo and Orihime is the symbolic connecting of their hearts. That is what gives life to Ichigo's lifeless body. Something formless, something beyond reason and logic, something beyond material existence. It all flows back into that fundamental principle of the Kokoro. Urukyora's conceptions are broken, his worldview shattered, but in a way, this merciless slaughter at the hands of a human turned hollow is Urukyora's salvation. He is freed from the boundaries of logic and rationality that shackled his scope and understanding of living. He lies on the ground, powerless and mutilated in the face of the mindless monster Ichigo has become. This monster cannot discern between friend and foe, which makes him attack Uryu who interjects. So, in his final act of the battle, Urukyora displays a hint of humanity as he inadvertently saves Uryu, redirecting the monster's attention towards himself. Whether this was done to intentionally help Uryu or to make the most of this opportunity as the rational being he is, we'll never know. After all, those kinds of ambiguities and character decisions are what make Bleach the story it is. Becoming a mindless monster who only exists to breed carnage is in complete opposition with everything Ichigo stands for. Like Urukyora, there is a gaping hole in the monster's chest. The very thing that allowed him to continue fighting, no matter the consequence, to protect his friends and preserve the bonds he's formed with them, is stripped away from Ichigo in the form that wins him the battle. If the void in the place of his heart didn't make this obvious enough, attacking his own friend surely got the point across. The darkness that had been festering within. The darkness Ichigo convinced himself he could control has come back to bite him in death, to rob him of his agency. And when this mask is finally lifted and he returns to consciousness, Ichigo is filled with shame. This is not how he wanted to win. He demonstrated that perfectly against Byakuya. In the pursuit of his ideal, Ichigo seeks a blade that can shatter fate itself, a blade of pure, unrelenting will. Not this blade, not a blade that lacks any semblance of choice. This is Urukyora's final straw. To the very end, Ichigo refuses to do what Urukyora wants him to. Ultimately, Urukyora did succeed in breaking Ichigo's resolve, but not in a way that validates him, for his own motivation in accomplishing that had already been crushed. In reality, Ichigo's resolve is broken by his own lack of self-control and Urukyora's beliefs are broken by the same thing, the monster whose very existence defies logic itself. Almost as if to test this newfound understanding, Urukyora asks Orihime if she's afraid of him, and when she says she's not, he finally understands what the heart is, what human connection is. The girl he has only ever antagonized is still capable of displaying remorse, forgiveness, and perhaps even love. So, Urukyora vanishes into the nothingness he lived finally understanding that he had a heart of his own and dying content with the fact he finally got to experience emotion outside of the boundaries he limited himself to. He reaches out to Orihime and despite their hands never meeting, embraces the connection they just formed and acknowledges the heart in his hands. Formless, intangible, abstract, whatever you want to call it, but real nonetheless. The battles of fake Karakura Town are chock full of ideological conflicts that substantiate many of the ideas present in not just Ichigo's journey but the story as a whole. Baragan's character is deeply concerned with the idea of godhood, what it means to be divine and lose that position of power, to go from a king to a pawn in the army of the one who usurps your throne. He embodies the purest form of death itself, senescence or death from old age, but ultimately he is defeated by his own power, a reflection of how Baragan was just another being who feared death and tried to escape it, like everybody else. Harry Bell's defeat at the hands of Aizen displays the cracks in his plans. The power of his army is pitiful and disappointing. Tosin is a character plagued by grief who never got to receive closure. He exists to point out the evils of soul society, an angel of justice consumed by his own darkness. He wore a mask before he ever gained the power of the hollow, the mask he called justice to try hide his true feelings of bitterness, grief and vengeance. Ultimately just another victim of himself and his inability to see, not physical sight but spiritual understanding.
The Visored arrive not to fight with the Shinigami, but against Aizen, a necessary distinction as they too fell victim to the injustices of Soul Society. Shinji repeatedly displays an intense belief in Ichigo as the hero who will save the day. This trust is mocked by Aizen, who likens trust and reliance to cowardice. All beings trust their superiors. They can't survive if they don't follow blindly. Aizen considers trust a burden that is passed on to those who exist above them. To trust in someone is to submit to them, to place your faith in them blindly, and rend yourself a powerless cog in a machine. That is how all kings and all gods are created, by shouldering a long chain of burdens in the form of trust, a nod to the truth regarding the Soul King, who exists only as a symbol, only as something people trust in, the existence that Aizen rejects. In Hueko Mundo, Ichigo is preparing to leave and join the battle in the world of the living, but the effects of his deathmatch against Urukyora are hampering him greatly. There's something wrong, and it's clearly visible to almost everybody. Ichigo pretends he's okay, and he pretends he's prepared to join the battle against Aizen, but Ukiya can tell there's something wrong. His eyes are not the eyes of a victor. Changes in the pattern of his hollow mask suggests an internal instability. Something is happening inside Ichigo that he is unaware of. Yami's belittlement of the other espada blows a fuse within him. He doesn't expect hollows to have a sense of camaraderie, and neither does he regret killing Urukyora and defeating Grimjao. But regardless, to hear them being trash-talked doesn't feel right. In an attempt to channel his disapproval of Yami, Ichigo hollowfies and fails. Coupled with the changes in the design of his mask, this introduces a worrying sense of impending doom in all of Ichigo's scenes. Who is in control now? What happened to the Hollow and where has it gone? Ichigo remains in the unknown, grappling with his insecurities internally whilst wearing a facade of confidence as he makes way to the war against Aizen. Byakuya's words slightly reinvigorate Ichigo's purpose, reminding him of his duty as Karakura Town's substitute Shinigami. Even Mayuri has this moment where he expresses faith in Ichigo winning the battle, which Byakuya points out. When accompanied by Unahana on his journey through the Garganta, with only half his power, Ichigo Ichigo displays Ryoku comparable to a captain's, buying Unohana's faith also. Going into the battle, everybody has their stocks on Ichigo as the only potential saviour, the only one who can defeat Aizen as he hasn't been exposed to Kyoka Suigetsu's Shikai. Unohana restores Ichigo's Ryoku to its maximum capacity until they reach their destination, leaving the trio of captains in Hueko Mundo. Ichigo's entrance is absolutely pitiful. He arrives moments after Aizen kills Torsen and bets everything on a single strike which is effortlessly thwarted. He failed to holify. He couldn't tap into his full power. His fears got the better of him. Ichigo has lost that killer instinct, but what most offends Aizen is the idea that it would have been any different even with that full power, even holified. The disparity in power between these two men is inconceivable. Aizen shows Ichigo his own hubris, the extreme discrepancy between these two men. The heightened sense of duty Byakuya filled him with is trampled over. You can't protect anything out of a sense of duty. You lack hatred, Ichigo. Aizen plays him like a fiddle. Everybody fights in front of Ichigo. The entire battlefield is both supporting and depending on him as the one to finish the job. The weight of the world on Ichigo's shoulders as the only one unaffected by Aizen's illusions. Soifon recognizes Ichigo's lack of conviction, reiterating their purpose for fighting the war to live. Saving the world is a lofty pretense to their real motive, to cling on to life. The transparency and genuine camaraderie he feels with the Shinigami empowers Ichigo. They display the resolve he currently lacks. As the trump card, Ichigo is forced to play the role of an observer, prepared to swoop in and save the day at a moment's notice, though that in of itself is an irrational approach. His power is needed. As Aizen goes on to painstakingly demonstrate, Kyokasui Getsu is but one aspect of his powers. The real terror of Aizen is his strength. His sheer spiritual energy knows no equal far beyond any precautions. Ichigo is rendered a powerless observer once more. The crushing wheel of fate is simply insurmountable. His role as the key to overcoming Aizen bears no fruit, as the comrades he places his trust in fail to plant the seeds. Captain after captain, visored after visored, they all crumble in the ultimate display of dominance. Just as they manage to land a carefully coordinated elaborate team attack combining various unique Zampa 
impact or abilities, the mask is lifted. How long have they been under the illusion that he wasn't using Kyokasu Getsu? They failed before they even lifted a finger. Complete and utter devastation. An embarrassing performance from the Shinigami elite, crushed by the one who claims to have transcended their inherent limitations. Even the pinnacle of their establishment, the head captain himself, is humiliated in having his Zanpakuto powers not only contained but used against him. He lands a high-ranking Kido technique at the cost of his own arm and barely manages to draw blood from Aizen. The only good to come out of this sacrifice is Ichigo's well-timed intervention, landing a black Getsuga Tenshaw and slicing Aizen across the chest. Unfortunately, this is the first and last moment of vulnerability Aizen gives, and so he continues to play Ichigo like a fiddle toying with his mental state by reframing his perception of everything that has happened in the story so far. The master planner reveals his careful schemes. The self-imposed god has been watching, carefully and attentively. Kurosaki Ichigo, the ultimate research subject, a single piece of a puzzle of Aizen's own creation, growing rapidly and incredibly just as envisioned. Kurosaki Ichigo, all of his battles took place in the palm of Aizen's hand. Practically every major event in the story concerning Ichigo so far has been under the supervision and maintenance of Aizen himself. There have been tweaks and adjustments to this plan, but Aizen intentionally assisted in Ichigo's developments for a number of reasons. Ichigo has essentially been living his life according to the will of another. The very concept of fate itself has manifested in the ultimate antagonist of the saga, who believes himself to be an ascended being of divine characteristics, the one who will change the world. You could almost say Aizen as a character, out of his own will, turned himself into the crushing wheel of fate that Ichigo has always lived to shatter. All of this orchestrating happening in the shadows, outside of Ichigo's knowledge, and the root motivator for all all of this is Ichigo's hybrid existence that is still unknowable to him. Born special as a crossover of hollow human Shinigami and Quincy, he piqued Aizen's interest and curiosity right from the very beginning. Not just from the moment he was born, but years prior, from the moment his parents first met. All of this unknown to Ichigo. A genius misdirection takes place here as Aizen's words are interrupted by the entrance of Ichigo's father, Ishin Shiba the former captain. Leading Ichigo to believe Aizen was referring to his father's true nature as a Shinigami, but we know there's more to the story, and that Aizen is referring to something else entirely. We get an interaction between father and son in the chapter titled Back from Blind, as Ishin's appearance serves as this moment of liberation and understanding for Ichigo that raises him from the pit Aizen just threw him in. But despite finally seeing his father as a Shinigami and understanding the source of his latent abilities and gets you mentioned, all of those chapters ago, Ichigo doesn't get any concrete answers. In fact, he straight up rejects his father's invitation to ask any questions, respecting his reasons for staying silent. Until Ishin is ready to share, he doesn't have to say anything a lesson he learned from Rukia with regards to his own trauma. This is a pretty telling point, as Ichigo gains clarity and mental stability despite not receiving any explanation. Had he been told everything here, he would learn about the true nature of not just his inner hollow but the so-called Zanpakuto he wields. But he gets a crumb, and that's enough for him. He somewhat resigns to the unknown out of deep respect for his father, at least for now. We arrive at the ultimate act of this saga, aptly named Deicide, the killing of a deity. Every idea simmering in this sprawling cast comes to a boil through the dynamic of Ichigo and Aizen. The power of knowledge, the crushing wheel of fate, the ability to express your will freely, and what it means to be a god. A story that is perfectly represented in the respective Zanpakuto of these two men. Ichigo intuitively understands the minds of people he crosses swords with, communication through battle which tells him what somebody is fighting for. This is everywhere in Bleach, not just in Ichigo's fights. People communicate through battle all the time. But there's one encounter Ichigo had way back at the beginning of Soul Society that didn't have this effect. The sword and the heart are one. We've gone over this countless times. With every opponent Ichigo has faced, their sword was swung for a reason. 
They all believed in whatever it is they were fighting for, even if there were cracks on the surface of those beliefs. But Ichimaru Gin, since before he even became a Shinigami, has existed outside of this norm. He is completely against what he's fighting for. He is a silent agent of his own agenda, which he strives towards camouflaged in grass, a snake blending in his surroundings, all for the purpose of killing the unkillable. As this is happening, Aizen's soul itself is being replaced by the Hōgyoku, the wish-granting jewel that serves as a condensed representation of transcendence, the key to Aizen's search for enlightenment and ultimately godhood, a creation born of pure scientific experimentation and curiosity. Aizen claims the Hōgyoku's true power is the ability to read the hearts of those around it and realise their deepest desires. Urahara mistook the nature of his own creation, thinking it controls the boundaries between Hollows and Shinigamis as that was his own wish for the artifact. Rukia's powers were all transferred to Ichigo as she had become disillusioned with being a Shinigami since the death of Kai and Shiba. Chad and Orihime awakened their own special powers because deep down they cursed their own powerlessness. The Hōgyoku is established to have a will of its own. Despite being possessed by Aizen and used to his own advantage. Aizen convinces himself that growing to greater heights of power is the will of the Hōgyoku itself. He will transcend by way of an object, the will of a gem. The Hōgyoku is aptly named as it breaks the boundaries a soul would normally face, separating the divine and the earthly and ultimately providing a sense of enlightenment. Or at least, that is what Aizen believes. It is exactly then that Urahara Kisuke enters. He lands a carefully coordinated string of attacks specifically created for the purposes of this battle that should, by all means, be enough to handle Aizen. And they do eventually. For now though, the enemy is certain the jewel of his own creation exists beyond his own comprehension. Surviving this barrage of ingenuity comes second nature to Aizen in his new form. As the ultimate representation of fatalism, Aizen considers it his duty to crush every single plan the Shinigami have to defeat him. Likening those plans to hope itself, this is the ultimate showing of despair. And Ichigo can only watch. He shares some words with Gin, who has complete belief that Aizen is beyond beyond stopping. He has reached a level of power that nobody can compare to. Everybody's gonna die and it'll all be over. But Ichigo refuses to accept that kind of ending. He still clings to hope, claiming he won't let Aizen destroy everything. But his next words reveal the cracks behind this mask of confidence. His next words expose just how brittle his resolve truly is. Ichigo is already giving in to fear and despair. His hope is but a single dim diminishing ray of light that is slowly but surely being consumed by Aizen's darkness. And Gin relentlessly mocks this. You were scarier back then, when you actually had purpose. Just run away, Ichigo. The combined forces of Ishin, Urahara and Yoruichi coordinate attack after attack after attack, but ultimately their efforts are futile. Aizen has reached a level of power so out of reach, they can't even perceive it. His Reryoku is literally beyond comprehension. It cannot be sensed or judged by those inferior to him. Only someone who exists in that same level of power can feel his Reyatsu. Gin's contemptuous taunting continues and Ichigo's hopelessness grows. The man whose resolve has consistently proved powerful enough to shake the hearts of entire societies is crumbling. But why? Why is he so scared in comparison to Urahara, Yoruichi and Ishin? Gin finally notices. Ichigo is the only person on the battlefield who can sense Aizen's Reiatsu. He's the only individual who exists on a comparable plane to him. The only one who can feel the terrifying power of Aizen's evolution. But as Gin points out, Ichigo is in an incomplete state. He has the raw talent and capability to compare to Aizen one day, but at this current moment in time, he lacks access to this power. His soul is plagued by dissonance due to his identity crisis. He lacks harmony and control over his own powers because he cannot understand them. His own enemy knows the composition of his soul better than he does, and so Ichigo is left to wallow in despair as Aizen makes his way to the Soul Society, ready to destroy the real Karakura Town.
In the Dangai, Aizen faces the Kototsu. A Shinigami cannot harm the cleaner. That's the rule set in place. Gin mentions that the Kototsu cannot be harmed by Reiatsu. It's a creature of reason. The two simply cannot interact. That's a fact one must accept regardless of what you personally think or feel. So, of course, Aizen destroys the Kototsu. What better way to prove his divinity? To prove he exists beyond the simple rules that govern men. Aizen has always detested the very concept of reason. He views morality as entirely subjective, and that reason in of itself is a social construct used to manipulate the hearts of man. Rules exist to shackle society, that is how Aizen views it, and so he will transcend in hopes of fixing this fundamentally broken world. But that's not the only reason Aizen destroys the cleaner. As he later mentions, this is his way of giving Ichigo one final opportunity, to take advantage of the Dangai's time mechanics and become the strongest he possibly can, to serve as the final stepping stone before Aizen ultimately goes on to kill the Soul King, and Ichigo by way of Ishin's guidance does exactly that. This is the final Getsuga Tensho. Ichigo enters Jinzen, a position devised for the purpose of communication with Zanpakuto. Up until this point, he has never truly communicated with the extension of his soul. Their conversations have always taken place in life or death scenarios. Every technique he's gained has been through brute force. He has to make up for all of that by stepping into those millennia he has yet to experience, to reach the level of power necessary to kill a deity. This time, Zangetsu is merciless. Ishin claims his Engetsu was the same way, implying he too once attempted to learn the final Getsuga Tensho. The Zanpakuto spirit doesn't want to teach its own of this technique as it ultimately results in the death of their powers, the complete loss of their Eryoku. That is why Tensa Zangetsu refuses because ultimately what he wants to protect is not the same thing as what Ichigo wants to protect. The towering inner world that was once filled to the heavens with hope has been reduced to a tiny little town. The rain may have stopped, but the entire world has sunk to the bottom of the ocean. A deeper, more painful sense of dread and powerlessness. All because Ichigo lost hope and stopped moving forward. Tensa Zangetsu reaches for Ichigo's chest, specifically the location of the soul, and pulls out the very roots of his despair. Black spiritual energy is withdrawn from Ichigo's soul and manifests into his inner hollow. This is the life-changing realization that flips everything Ichigo ever thought he knew on its head. We have always known this, but Ichigo is only just now realizing. The powers activated by Ichigo's innate destructive impulses and his perceived Shinigami powers that grant him the power to protect exist as one. There are some slight differences between what Ichigo thinks at this point in time versus the actual truth he later learns, which I've illustrated on the screen. Ichigo acknowledges White as part of him, as part of his Zanpakuto, which is correct, but what Ichigo is still mistaken on is Tensa Zangetsu's true nature as a manifestation of his Quincy powers. White himself is is both Ichigo's hollow and Shinigami powers, which have been merged since the very beginning. And what he is witnessing right now is the fusion of White, the hollow slash Shinigami, and Zangetsu, the Quincy. And thus, Ichigo finally accepts the hollow he had been rejecting for so long, even if he might have a slightly skewed understanding of what it represents. Gin made a vow at a young age that he would be the closest person to Aizen. He became a Shinigami to join him, all out of his love for Rangiku. As a child, he witnessed Aizen having something awful be done to her, the stealing of a piece of her soul to create the Hogyoku. And in his love for her, Gin became a monster, killing other Shinigami to rise up the ranks of Aizen's organization and ultimately gain his trust. All of this in a desperate attempt to kill Aizen for harming Rangiku and to ensure it can never happen again. But the the aspect of Gin's betrayal we're most concerned in is his contingency plan. In case things went wrong, which they did, Gin consistently aided Ichigo in his own development, in a completely different way to Aizen. Gin's taunts and jeers were always purposeful, guiding Ichigo to the answers he fails to see. Gin had pushed Ichigo to become the man he sees in him in an attempt to slay Aizen, the false god he is consumed in hatred by. His own god-slaying spear fails to get the job done, but he still dies with clarity, seeing that Ichigo has become the man he expected him to be. The eyes are crucial. Rukia remarked that Ichigo's eyes following the Urukyora battle were not the eyes of a victor, they weren't. 
the eyes don't lie. And Gin knows this better than most, as the man who lived a lie best represented in how his eyes were kept shut throughout the bulk of his time on screen. Aizen had always known Gin planned to betray him, keeping him around as the manner of his betrayal interested him and provided him with fear, which he considers necessary for evolution. Gin's betrayal only serves to turn Aizen into an even more terrifying monster, who reaches an even crazier level of power ready to kill Ichigo's friends. What better time for the Great Protector to enter? Ichigo's entrance is remarkable in every sense of the word. He is composed in a way we have truly never seen before from anybody against a threat who has reached unimaginable levels of power that we've never seen before. But Ichigo now exists in an even higher realm than the self-proclaimed god. It sounds crazy to say, so much so Aizen himself completely misinterprets the fact he cannot feel any Ryatsu coming from Ichigo. He even addresses the possibility of Ichigo somehow suppressing his Ryatsu but states the idea of it being completely invisible is inconsistent. Conceivable. This is when everything that has been simmering regarding evolution, transcendence, enlightenment, and ultimately self-actualization finally comes to a boil. Gin recognizes that Ichigo's eyes represent a sense of mental clarity and unshakable resolve. He has become the man he expected him to be, and so he closes his eyes for the final time and leaves everything in Ichigo's hands. Ichigo and Aizen share extreme similarities and extreme differences. Their dynamic is incredibly incredibly multifaceted and told largely through contrast. This is the conclusion of the first half of Bleach though, as I coined it previously. So absolutely everything I've spoken about in the video so far has to culminate here in some way. I've actually seen a lot of people express that. The conclusion of Fake Karakura Town feels like a natural conclusion for the entire story. There are obviously some loose threads and material that almost demands further exploration, which it does get, but the message of Bleach rings very clear. Up until this point, Ichigo's quest has involved him confronting unknowns, questioning the nature of the world, and sticking firmly to his personal creed on the path to personal growth and protecting his loved ones. Restrained by his own powerlessness, Ichigo wished for strength, and this strength was granted by the man standing in front of him, the man responsible for the hollow within him, for the first meeting of his parents, who orchestrated practically every step of his development and who knows more about Ichigo's origins than Ichigo does himself. The Hogyoku was created by Urahara out of pure scientific curiosity, a man who wished to exceed the limitations of Shinigami and Hollow, but immediately recognized the terror of his own creation. At some point in his life, Urahara learnt the truth of the Soul King's existence, as a silent observer who was mutilated and sealed in a crystal to maintain the current shape of the universe, the cornerstone for balance. But it is not in Urahara's nature to confront the pre-established system and try to change the world. That's simply not the man he is. Urahara's power is to reconstruct whatever it touches. Instead of breaking down like the Hogyoku, his Bankai repairs. He is constantly working for the betterment of the world, but he is not the man to call it into question. He is vocal about the existing structure, of course he is, he's one of the biggest victims of Soul Society's short-sightedness, but he maintains it for the greater good. He works in service of balance. He implies he knows that the system is flawed, but he resigns to the ridiculousness of trying to challenge the system. That is the way the world works, completely antithetical to Aizen and even the Hogyoku, his own creation, the personification of desire. Aizen Sosuke wishes to right the systematic wrongs of the Soul Society and is willing to achieve that through any means. A winner doesn't ask how the world is, but how it should be. This is Aizen boiled down to a single line in his breakdown after being subdued by Ichigo and ultimately sealed by Urahara. He refuses to submit to the fundamentally skewed hierarchy of Soul Society and despises someone like Urahara who he admits is intellectually superior to him, who has the ability to do something about it but doesn't. But where did this inflated ego come from? Where did Aizen's desire to evolve and become somebody who could change the world as he sees fit even come from? It's rather simple. Aizen is strong, incredibly so. He has always been strong. By communicating through the clash of their swords, Ichigo intuitively believes that being exceptional prevented Aizen from being able to connect with those around him, to form bonds, to find a heart. He was left feeling isolated despite being surrounded by people. Peerless spiritual energy and outstanding intelligence, that has always been Aizen. Lonely at the top, suffering from success. 
but failing to ever acknowledge his feelings and instead breeding a superiority complex. Greed and arrogance began to define Aizen. He refused to be ruled over by something that is a god in name only. A superiority complex grew into a god complex that is actualized by his merging with the Hogyoku. And the ultimate representation of Aizen's hubris is none other than the research subject he designed as a stepping stone on his path to godhood. In fact, there's one specific contrast that paints a very vivid picture of their dynamic. Both Ichigo and Aizen merge with their Zanpaktos, Ichigo the slaying moon and Aizen the mirror flower water moon. Ichigo a truly transcendent being who achieved enlightenment through self-acceptance versus Aizen with his self-imposed transcendence and illusory sense of enlightenment as he fails to recognize his own shortcomings. The man who once claimed adoration is the state furthest from understanding has become consumed by his newfound power. Admiring himself so greatly, he fails to understand himself and heed his own words. Aizen notes that his right arm fusing with his Zanpakuto is the conclusion of his evolution. Naturally, this is also the case for Dangai Ichigo whose right arm has the chain of Tensa Zangetsu wrapped around it. Interestingly enough, this asymmetrical design with significance placed on the right side is a trend that also applies to Uryu's Let Steel, who gained the wing of Reishi on his right and decided his battle in a single tremendous attack. A very intentional parallel. Ichigo completely overpowers Aizen, who comes up with every excuse conceivable to justify the beating he's receiving at the hands of his own creation. Aizen displays a range of emotions, from fear, anger, shame, and total disbelief. The complete opposite of Ichigo, who is calmer than ever before, bordering on apathy. The Hogyoku plays a crucial role in responding to Aizen's emotions and desires and evolving its host even further, making him stronger and stronger as the fight continues. And so, Ichigo has had enough. He begins to emit spiritual energy which debunks Aizen's theory that he traded all of his energy for martial might. The reason Aizen couldn't sense Ichigo has finally dawned upon him. He resides in an even higher plane of existence, and thus Ichigo ends it all in a single attack. Aizen is consistently evolving and growing stronger and stronger thanks to the Hogyoku. Alongside the immortality it gives him, that's a big problem. Eventually, he should theoretically grow to surpass Ichigo's newfound power. That's why Ichigo puts everything into Mugetsu, a colossal attack using up all the ridiculous power he had just acquired. The final Getsuga Tensho, a taste of transcendence and true enlightenment, achieved through pure selflessness. For the sake of his mortal ties, Ichigo becomes a divine existence, though only temporarily. That is the key point of this after all, otherwise the story would have ended here. This is just a taste of what's to come in his journey, a sacrificial act of momentarily reaching unprecedented levels of power, the peak of his potential, the state of divinity Aizen painstakingly strove for, all for the sake of his loved ones, to protect. The final Getsuga Tensho is for Ichigo to become Getsuga itself. The symbolism seeped into the naming conventions of his abilities reaches a boiling point. Zangetsu is the slaying moon, Getsuga is the lunar fang, and Mugetsu is the moonless sky. The final attack that costs Ichigo all of his powers, the only thing that allows him to express himself as the unyielding protector, the powers that define Ichigo, the extension of his soul. He reaches a level of harmony with his inner self, embracing Zangetsu and the hollow powers that are part of it, becoming the literal embodiment of the lunar fang that slew the moon and paved the way for Mugetsu. His swing starts upwards in the heavens and comes back down to the earth. Ichigo sacrifices the power of divinity and embraces a mortal life, away from this special world he has grown to love, away from the supernatural. To protect those he loves, he gives up a piece of himself, the ability to protect them in the future, something of equivalent value. Ichigo's purpose is sacrificed whilst also being completed. I've made it repeatedly clear that this Zangetsu isn't actually Ichigo's Shinigami powers, rather his Quincy spirit. That's the real beauty of the moment. Ichigo still exists in a state of unknown. He doesn't fully understand himself, but he transcends nonetheless. That's also why it's only a momentary sacrifice. Tensa Zangetsu didn't want to teach Ichigo this technique for a very specific reason, to protect his other and prevent the loss of his powers. But why exactly does Ichigo lose his powers? 
Ishin implies he had used the final Getsuga Tensho in the past, but we know he lost his powers with a different kind of sacrifice. If white is the combination of Ichigo's Shinigami and Hollow powers, and Zangetsu is Ichigo's Quincy powers, this form this final Getsuga Tensho that is achieved by embracing this trinity should naturally be a combination of all three. A Shinigami technique, a Hollow technique, and a Quincy technique all in one, with all three playing a role as to why Ichigo loses his powers. An application of the Shinigami final Getsuga Tensho he shares with his father, and an application of the Quincy Let Steel. That's why he wears a glove in his final form. Ichigo becomes one with his Zanpakuto after fully embracing every aspect of it, despite the countless unknowns, the terrifying hollow, and the ultimate sacrifice of it all. Aizen becomes one with his Zanpakuto after constantly dismissing the extension of his soul out of an obsession with the Hogyoku. When Kyoka Suigetsu begins to disappear, Aizen thinks this is because the Hogyoku has determined that he no longer needs a Zanpakuto, but really this is a commentary on the falsehood of his transcendence. The Water Moon can only watch in agonizing inferiority at the real deal, the product of his own creation who reached the level he dreamed of. All because Aizen failed to look within himself, to understand himself. If enlightenment and becoming a god within this story is an allegory for self-actualization, to fully realize the self, then it demands self-acceptance. Rather than depending on something like the Hogyoku, Ichigo reaches self-actualization by looking deeply within himself and conquering the inner turmoil. Aizen on the other hand relies on a jewel created by another and digs himself deeper and deeper into his own arrogance and the loneliness he refuses to accept. And the cherry on top comes as the finish of this battle between gods. Aizen is regenerating and Ichigo's powers are disappearing. But unlike Aizen, Ichigo is not self-absorbed. He has no qualms with relying on others, and so Urahara comes in to assist and seal Aizen once and for all. Urahara suggests that the Hogyoku has begun to reject Aizen as its master, but this is an incorrect assumption. Ichigo knows the truth. In battle, he only felt loneliness coming from Aizen's blade. The self-proclaimed god displayed his most humanity at the height of his evolution. Not just anger and frustration, but a genuine desire to be understood, to have someone who could see things from his perspective. Born with exceptional power, he was a natural outcast in society. And the only one to ever understand this is one who ended up existing on an even higher plane to him. Karakura is spelled with the kanji for sky and to seat. It is the place seated in the sky, the sky seat. Kara is also a homonym for empty, so you can also consider it the empty seat in the sky, the throne to be taken. He who sits upon the heavens is an enlightened one, as the empty throne is the sign of Buddha. Aizen and Ichigo's duel takes place in the space of the empty throne which sits in the sky. They are literally fighting to grasp the throne of Buddha, to grasp the throne of enlightenment. Both men who defy the status quo, who live to fight against the higher powers who dictate their lives. Ichigo prevails by way of a few distinct differences between these two very similar men. He surrendered his pride against one whose pride had grown into arrogance. He fought for everybody but himself against the one who fought only for himself, and most importantly, Ichigo understood exactly what he was fighting for. He acknowledged the consequences of his sacrifice and approached the battle with unequivocal resolve and self-understanding. Aizen was never true to himself, and ultimately, his failure to understand himself results in his defeat that is granted by the object of his arrogance. The Hogyoku grants Aizen the wish he never knew he had. To achieve the highest state of being, enlightenment itself is heavily tied to how one approaches the world around them. Through Aizen and Ichigo, the story illustrates two ways to achieve this state, which is accentuated by their respective approaches to social standards. Aizen and Ichigo both want to change the world, for good reasons. Ichigo does so by pushing himself to the limit for the betterment of others, and to offer assistance but never to deny choice to others. Aizen's approach is to force good on others by evil means, and to impose himself as the new ruler, trying to create a dictatorship not so different from the one that in infuriates him. Two different approaches to a very similar goal. The final chapter of this first half of the manga is titled Bleach My Soul, the loss of Ichigo's powers that define him. 
Rukia fades into the unknown, and Ichigo can no longer even sense the ghosts he has always been able to see. He returns to the normal world with newfound knowledge. The hero's journey has seemingly come to a close. Ichigo can no longer even see the spiritual beings that initiated his desire for power. His soul has been bleached of all Reryoku, rendering him a normal human being in a way he has never before known. He has returned to the status quo. Not exactly where he started, but close enough. A life without the power to protect. This is the end of the Aranka saga. A time skip of 18 months takes place and the story of Bleach is, for all intents and purposes, reset. The revamping of chapter 1's colour spread and the introductory narration for Ichigo perfectly represents this reboot. Don Kanonji's brief appearance early in the arc mirrors early pre-time skip. These two halves of the story intentionally parallel in a number of ways. Ichigo can no longer see ghosts. He has been removed from the world of the supernatural. The Fullbring arc is a subject of extreme controversy in anime and manga communities, with the overwhelming majority considering the arc canon filler that lacks any real importance in the overarching story being told. Unsurprisingly, I am in complete opposition of this notion. The Fullbring arc contains some of the most critical and significant character work for Ichigo in the entire story. The perfect calm before the storm that follows, exploring Ichigo on an intimate, personal level at the depths of his despair. This is Ichigo's lowest point in the story. In the battle against Aizen, he was forced into making a decision of monumental consequences. In order to defeat the deity, to protect his loved ones, to save the world, he had to forfeit not just his immense power, but his ability to even perceive the supernatural, the ghosts he's been able to see since he was a child. He knows they're there, but he cannot see them. When viewing this with the context of how Ichigo was at the start of the story, you'd expect this loss of supernatural awareness to be a form of liberation. Ichigo personally acknowledges this. Being able to see ghosts only ever made him crave a life where he didn't have to see them. After all, this accursed awareness is what led to his mother's death. It was one of the reasons he was bullied growing up, turning him into an outcast in his hometown. And now, he has what he always wanted. But nothing about his appearance and general behaviour suggests he's happy or fulfilled. He's convinced himself he is, but under the surface, he longs for the power he once had. The poem of this volume is the perfect evidence of this. I wonder if I can keep up with the speed of a world you're not in, from the perspective of Ichigo directed at himself, and by extension, Zangetsu. The Fullbring arc aims to break Ichigo down to his weakest, most fragile state of existence and then rebuild him into the man he wishes he can be once more, this time with heightened awareness and self-understanding. This time, Ichigo will be capable of fully acknowledging just how much these powers mean to him. The physical mastery and martial might he forged over the course of his journey lingers, reminding him of his previous life as a Shinigami. The general tone and atmosphere of the arc is that of tranquil contemplation. Ichigo, with his battle scars from his short tenure as a divine being, is reduced into a regular high school boy, living a regular high school life. A much needed interlude wherein Ichigo reassesses himself and confronts a myriad of feelings he has been suppressing out of fear of being an inconvenience to his friends. He has personally pushed away his friends when they didn't have the necessary strength required to fight alongside him, so he knows too well that they are justified in keeping him stuck in this state of limbo, wishing to be of service and fighting to protect his loved ones whilst lacking the required power to do so. Kugo Ginjo is immediately introduced as the lost agent with a Shinigami badge, a genius misdirection by Kugo once again as he frames this page in a way that makes it seem as if Ichigo had been robbed for his own badge. We later learn this isn't the case, as Ichigo still has his own badge, which is also far more damaged than the one Ginjo was holding. This man has come to cast doubt in Ichigo, to manipulate him for his own means, to implant suspicions and insecurities within him, to make Ichigo question everything he knows, even his own family. Unbeknownst to the one who cannot see even hollows anymore, Chad 
Uryu, Orihime and his younger sister Karin have been fighting relentlessly to protect Ichigo and Karakura Town from the Hollows in his stead. Ichigo has always struggled a great deal when it comes to accepting help from others. One of his greatest shortcomings in the story is the presumption that he must take everything on alone, something he finally conquers here. Placed in this position of powerlessness, lacking control over the events going on in his surroundings, Ichigo is struggling. He keeps denying that he wants his powers back, but the dreams of Renji and Rukia highlight his own self-deception. Finally, he succumbs. He reaches a boiling point when Uryu is attacked and reaches out to Ginjo, who previously left his phone number with him. Ichigo is introduced to yet another special world, the world of Fullbring. Spiritually aware humans who can use the Fullbring magic system for a variety of unique applications. It's an ability that enables the user to manipulate the souls contained within physical matter. The amount of Reryoku the person associated to the object has is also a crucial factor in determining the size of the soul contained within. Ichigo substitutes Shinigami badge, which he has a strong emotional attachment to as the symbol of the life he once had, contains a much larger amount of souls within than something more rudimentary like a chair or a table. The affinity to a specific Fullbring conduit is a similar process to the creation of Zanpakuto. Shinigami are given nameless Asauchi which they imprint the essence of their soul upon by spending every waking hour with the sword. The Fullbring conduit is also an object the associated Fullbringer subconsciously imprints the essence of their soul upon. Through the substitute Shinigami badge, Ichigo draws newfound powers as he comes to term with what it meant for him to be a Shinigami, to have the power to protect everyone around him. His powers are first activated in Ruruka's dollhouse, when Chad empowers Ichigo by reminding him of the strong sense of pride he had in his powers, triggering the activation of his Fullbring. Chad serves an important role during the arc as someone who knows Ichigo's current struggle too well. In the past, Ichigo was the one who would push him away from accompanying him on impossible missions, but now Chad pulls Ichigo up, helping his brother regain his powers so they can share their fists once more. Ichigo's Shinigami powers have always been represented as the means of him accomplishing his desire to protect others, but this was never personally acknowledged by Ichigo. That's one of the main things the Fullbring arc aims to do, reshape Ichigo's perspective and allow him to see things without his judgement being clouded. He slowly but surely begins to recognise the powers he once had as the path to actualising his purpose as a powerful protector. Without those powers, he could never be the person he wanted to be. The narrative tool designed to to set Ichigo on this path of regaining his powers is none other than Tsukishima, with his terrifying ability to insert himself in somebody's past, essentially creating an entirely new timeline where he is somebody very close to the affected individual. Even though Ginjo is the one with the actual personal connection to Ichigo, who ultimately serves as the main antagonist, Tsukishima is the subject of his rage in the process of training. He turns his own friends and family against him, a terrifying power that angers Ichigo like never before. Tsukishima is the only person in the story to ever anger Ichigo to the point of him genuinely wanting to kill him out of pure hatred. Working alongside Ginjo, who forms a friendship with Ichigo, they slowly whittle away any support Ichigo has from the shadows and betray him at his very lowest. Ichigo at the start of the arc had convinced himself he was fulfilled and comfortable without his powers. Ginjo dug at this, exposing Ichigo's true emotions and making him feel powerless. He then aided Ichigo in gaining Fullbringer powers and building him back up into the powerful protector he once was, only to betray Ichigo and steal those powers, returning him to powerlessness once again. At Ichigo's lowest point in the story, who better than Rukia to pull him out of his suffering? The one to originally set the gears of Ichigo's journey in motion does so once more, in a near identical fashion to the last time. But there are some key distinctions here. What was once a crime worthy of execution is now something the head captain himself is in full support of. What was once just a piece of Aizen's plans is now entirely attributed to Ichigo's own past actions. The change he brought about to the unchangeable soul society by being unchangeable in his 
own beliefs. That's what provides this triumphant return. Ichigo's role as the harbinger of change in rigid societies, from Soul Society to even Weku Mundo, is one of his defining characteristics. The strength of his steadfastness, as Rukia puts it. Her poem from volume 54, if you can say that your heart doesn't change, then that is strength, communicating the same message, that Ichigo's own immutability is exactly what compelled the immutable soul society to change their ways. He acquires a new form, combining his Fulbring powers with his Shikai. Fulbring is an ability of love, the ability to draw out the maximum power of something a person loves. By combining this with his reacquired Shinigami powers, Ichigo professes his love of being a powerful protector. By introducing this element to his mixture of different powers, Ichigo's self being represented in his abilities is taken up another notch. On the other end of the spectrum lies Kugo Ginjo, a product of the immutable, archaic soul society whose entire existence perfectly showcases the changes Ichigo has brought about. Execution is made up of tragic figures who have yet to overcome their traumas, putting all their faith into Ginjo as a saviour figure, who ironically needed saving more than any of the rest. He is plagued by his experiences with soul society, consumed by his hatred and need for vengeance. Over the course of the arc, Ginjo is under the influence of the Book of the End, which despite altering his perception of things and providing him with fabricated memories, temporarily frees him from the animosity he feels towards the Soul Society. Despite the influence of Tsukishima's Fulbring, we get to see a completely different side of Ginjo, arguably the true side of Ginjo, who repeatedly showcases an innate goodness. Through his concern of Ichigo's well-being, his support of Ichigo, his sacrificial attempt to take Tsukishima's sword strike upon himself, fighting against his own group for Ichigo's sake, Ginjo proves himself a good man. Even if their past is altered, the person themselves do not change. The actions Ginjo took were all done out of his own free will. It's worth noting that although his pendant forms the basis of his Fulbring, Ginjo's substitute Shinigami badge, the symbol of his hatred for Soul Society, is a major part of his new Shinigami Fulbring form. Seeing as these Fulbring conduits are things the owner has an emotional attachment to, the implications of this detail are very interesting. It brings into question the strength of Ginjo Ginjo's ideals and beliefs. Did he truly believe in the cause he was fighting for, or was he simply just another victim of the past? When his memories are altered, he's a pretty good person, but when they're returned to him, he's a dark ball of bitterness who seeks vindication against the Soul Society for their transgressions. Like almost everybody in the cast, Ginjo is a victim of his past experiences. Like a plague, they inform every one of his decisions and strip him of his purity, his individuality an unfortunate reality he only truly acknowledges on his deathbed. Ichigo experiences this firsthand, getting to know Ginjo on a personal, intimate level, as a friend, as a mentor, and as an enemy, the only human enemy in the story Ichigo kills. In fact, Ginjo's death is one of the only times Ichigo kills somebody intentionally, but this act of killing is the furthest thing from an act of anger and hatred. Throughout the battle, Ichigo learns to understand him, as someone who also knows the despair of losing their powers. As the only other substitute Shinigami to exist who also questioned the motives of the ones who gave him the badge. But whilst Ginjo finds the idea of being monitored and controlled by his supposed comrades a dishonourable falsehood that angers him to his very core, Ichigo appreciates the perspective of Soul Society. He acknowledges the potential risks he poses as someone with extreme power, understanding that being monitored and controlled by people who live to serve the greater good of the universe is not so bad of an idea. The greatest deal of Ichigo's newfound maturity coming in his acknowledgement of Ukitake's intelligence. Realizing had Ukitake truly wanted to deceive him, he would have done so without allowing Ichigo to ever question him. Instead, he provides him with a choice to choose his own path to protect. This arc takes Ichigo on a journey of reassessment, to reevaluate what his powers mean to him and build him up anew, this time with direct appreciation of the ability to see the supernatural. This is Ichigo's rebirth. He no longer fears insurmountable obstacles. He no longer fears the dangers of the great responsibilities to come with great power. Instead, he yearns for them. 
Instead of fighting alongside the Shinigami because of a mutual enemy in Aizen, Ichigo fights alongside friends, partners. After killing the man who doomed himself to a vicious cycle of vengeance, Ichigo respects the fact that man in that situation could have very easily been him in another lifetime. So he respects him, even in death, requesting a proper burial for him in the human world against Soul Society's doctrines. He's just a Shinigami. That's Ichigo's way of confronting the Soul Society's methods and making it abundantly clear he empathizes with a man like Ginjo, a mass murdering criminal. He too is a substitute Shinigami, after all. Much like the first arc of the story, Fullbring serves as a prelude for the remainder of this second half of the manga, a prelude for the Thousand Year Blood War, where everything the story has ever been building up towards intermingles and reaches its natural conclusion. The last nine days of the world, a cataclysmic event of prophecy, an inescapable fate, with Ichigo front and center once again. Every single idea Bleach has explored to a meaningful degree comes to a boiling point in this final arc, as is to be expected. Kubo personally stated that everything was leading up to this event, the Thousand Year Blood War, and it's pretty clear to see he wasn't lying. This is a story of self-reflection, cyclicality, overcoming trauma, defying determinism through sheer force of will, and embracing your identity. Pretty much sounds like everything I've already covered, right? Well yeah, that is the main goal of the final arc, to conclude individual character arcs and provide natural closure to all major aspects of the story. I'm currently at 48,000 words as I type this, which is a terrifying, exciting thing. I mean, we're 4 hours and 50 minutes into the audio, oh boy. So for the purpose of my own sanity, I won't be diving into the Thousand Year Blood War to the same depth I have for previous arcs. I won't be looking at side characters anywhere near as extensively. This final stretch is without doubt the densest, most ambitious in the entire story. And to top it off, the presentation can be very obscure and unconventional, though that has only strengthened my love for the arc as it's something I can continuously find new things to love about. But it does make piecing together every single beat of the arc in a comprehensive, cohesive manner an incredibly difficult task. I want to give this arc the love it deserves properly in the future. So for today, we'll focus primarily on Ichigo. After all, Ichigo appears in less than half of these 204 chapters. Of course, every other character and every other conflict function as tools that supplement the greater story being told and our hero's journey. But if I'm ever going to finish writing this video, I'll need to be as selective as possible with what I choose to talk about for the Thousand Year Blood War. With that being said, I am absolutely delighted to have kept you watching for this long, so without further ado, let's dive right into this. The arc starts off with the Karakura gang working together, an expression of Ichigo's growth and willingness to depend on others now. An old face in Nell returns to ask Ichigo for help. The hollow world has been attacked, and now the one who previously did the attacking will go on to defend the realm. In the 18 months following the defeat of Aizen, Haribel ruled over Huekomundo and was a just ruler over her people, which can be attributed to the changes Ichigo's actions evoke in this vast cosmos. A group of masked intruders claiming to belong to an army known as the Vandenreich storm the Seireite and declare war upon the Shinigami. They are led by a man named Yuhaba who is immediately established as a godlike figure. His name derived from the Hebrew name of God, Yahweh. We are introduced to him as the king and father of Quincy, the threat that even Yamamoto, who we'd consider the pinnacle of soul society, couldn't kill when he was in his prime. A man who tears off the arm of an Aranka, a species shackled by eternal conflict, and then professes a dislike for conflict, presenting himself as somewhat of a pacifist. Yuhaba is a man of many contradictions, which is made abundantly clear from the outset. Despite preparations being made for the impending battle, the first Quincy invasion leaves the Soul Society in disarray. There's no better way of describing this than an absolute wash. The Shinigami were humiliated. From the stealing of Bankai, to the murder of thousands of Shinigami, to the fall of the head captain himself, the first invasion hands the Shinigami their greatest defeat in the story. Truly an absolute wash. 
Ichigo's experience during this stretch of chapters is painful to say the least. Alongside the robbing of his powers by Ginjo, this is Ichigo's lowest point in the story. He is rendered a powerless observer by Quilge, who jails him and the Garganta on the way to Soul Society. Then, after finally being broken free, he makes a very dramatic entrance that instills hope in the hearts of everybody in Soul Society. The man who was once his mortal enemy begs of him to protect and save the realm and Ichigo completely fails. He is humiliated by Yuhaba, grasping onto his life only through powers he didn't even know he had, powers that come from none other than his enemy. Sound familiar? And as if to rub salt in the wound, Ichigo is forced to confront his lack of self-understanding. Yuhaba essentially tells him he was born a Quincy, that he doesn't know anything about himself or even his own mother. A very, very bitter truth for Ichigo to swallow. As the father of Quincy is about to leave, Ichigo goes for one last attack which is effortlessly thwarted by Yugaram, who breaks Tensa Zangetsu clean into two. The fact this was done so effortlessly, by not even Yuhaba but his number two, further emphasizes just how humiliating and painful this is for Ichigo. He is characterized by his struggle to protect the ones he cares about, and the tool he uses to accomplish that has just been destroyed. The powers we just spent an entire arc reclaiming and redefining as the most important thing to Ichigo. To repair Zangetsu, Ichigo goes to Mayuri, who tells him a broken Bankai can never be returned to what it once was. It must be rehammered by Oetsu Nimaya, the blade god himself. In the Soul King's dimension, Ichigo is placed in the Ho or Den, the Phoenix Palace. The Phoenix is an immortal bird that cyclically regenerates or is otherwise born again, a fitting name for the location of Ichigo's rebirth. He is posed with an all-important question, who is superior, a Zanpakuto or a Shinigami? This question feeds off the characterization of Ichigo and his inner hollow's relationship as that of a king and a horse. Ichigo and Renji are both tasked with overcoming the Asauchi within 72 hours. Simply put, they must make the Asauchi submit. They must make them choose them. And Ichigo completely fails. It doesn't help that Renji succeeds given their competitive rivalry. Nimaya makes it abundantly clear that no amount of physical strength or time will help him here. He cannot make the Asauchi submit through sheer force of will. He cannot simply push through this obstacle in the same way he has countless times in the past under the supervision of his many mentors. This time, the matter is a lot more personal. Sheer resolve isn't going to do anything. Ichigo needs to dig deeper to understand himself. To revert back to his roots. In order to understand his Zanpakuto is a reflection of himself, an extension of his soul. He has always valued his powers greatly, of course he has, and in the previous arc he learned to recognize his powers as an intrinsic necessity to enact his desire to protect. His complete acceptance of his powers is the main reason he managed to overcome Aizen, but he's never acknowledged them as part of himself. And so, Ichigo is transported back to the world of the living. Finally, he speaks to his father and learns the truth of his heritage. At the climax of Fate Karakura Town, his father offered to answer any questions he had. Ichigo rejected this offer, postponing the conversation until Ishin thought the time was right. Now is that time. When their Bankai was stolen, the Shinigami were forced to return to their roots. Hitsugiya began to train in Zanjutsu from scratch. Sajin sought his clan's secret technique. Byakuya reassessed his entire relationship with Senbon Zakura. Soifon perfected her Shunko. The first trailer of the Thousand Year Blood War anime highlights this with its key theme being revert your roots. Forcing one to abandon their progress and starting from the beginning is the textbook definition of a cycle. And this is best seen in Ichigo himself, who is forced to abandon all the progress he has made throughout the story thus far and start fresh. As I've made very clear throughout the video, identity is the foundational piece in Bleach's thematic framework. The discovery, affirmation, and acceptance of one's identity, in essence one's soul, is the core of every single character's growth. Power is intrinsically linked to the soul, to one's accordance with their own identity. In a nutshell, balance. Internal balance is the key to maximizing one's potential.
In this conversation with his father, Ichigo is struck by a barrage of revelations that ultimately serve to free him from his inner turmoil. He learns that his mother, Masaki Kurosaki was a Quincy, who suffered from holofication after saving Ishin from White. White is an experimental hollow of Aizen's creation, made by layering the souls of countless Shinigami, the exact technique that Nimaya uses to create his Asauji, an almost completely black hollow with a white mask. The spitting image of Ichigo's Vasto Lode form that we saw in his battle against Urukyora. A very interesting aspect of White is the meaning of his name. Aizen chose to name him with Iron Irony, for white has a black exterior but an inner whiteness due to its origin being the souls of several Shinigami. This ironic naming can be applied to everything but the rain itself, a tragedy which fits the way rain has been used but due to the context of how and when Ichigo learns the story at a time where he needed to learn the hard bitter truth of his origin, the name works. This story liberates him from his suffering. Like how the hollow has a black exterior but an inner whiteness, this story is depressing like rain, but everything but that on the inside, freeing Ichigo from the identity crisis that has plagued him since the very beginning of the manga. In order to counter holofication and prevent the victim from completely self-destructing, you require a permanent conflicting existence. Essentially, you need the opposite of your race. Masaki had become a Quincy Hollow hybrid, meaning she needed a Shinigami human hybrid to survive. Survive. With the help of Urahara, Ishin is transported into a Gigai which allows him to be the suitable conflicting existence. However, this came at a great cost. Ishin would stop being a Shinigami for as long as the hollow within needed to be neutralized, which actually spans longer than Masaki's life. In the anime, there's a crucial line added that fully explains why Ichigo inherited the hollow white. The hollow will not only stay within Masaki for as long as she lives, but it will be passed down to her descendants, to her first child. Considering Ishin is Ichigo's father and blood runs thick, he doesn't even hesitate in making his choice to save Masaki. Ishin sacrifices his powers in a very similar way to Ichigo's sacrifice with the final Getsuga Tensho, an easy decision despite the gravity of the consequences. This parallel gives all of those moments with Ichigo and his dad in fake Karakura Town an extra layer and ties them together very beautifully. They really are like father, like son. Ultimately, Ishin and Masaki's souls were bound to one another and eventually Ichigo was born. The hollow within Masaki was passed onto him and merged with his natural Shinigami powers he inherited from his father, thus becoming his Zanpakuto. Finally, Ichigo knows the origin of his inner hollow. This also explains how Aizen knew about Ichigo from the moment he was born. In fact, he knew him even before that. It's pretty crazy to think that a single moment of scientific curiosity would end up being the key to Aizen's defeat. Had he allowed Tosen to kill Masaki, Ichigo would have never been born, and Aizen would have never been defeated. Finally, Ichigo understands. He now knows the truth behind his heritage, the source of his hollow powers which have always plagued him. From the very beginning of the story, Ichigo consistently rejected the inner hollow. He considered it an evil, which is more than understandable given its nature, but this rejection has had a massive impact on him psychologically and emotionally. This inner hollow is not just some demon, but his zampakuto, the reflection and extension of his soul. Finally, Ichigo understands. As massive as the revelation of White's true identity is, it is not the only liberating truth to come from this conversation between father and son. Ichigo also learns that Yuhaba, is the reason his mother was killed by Grand Fisher as a result of the Ashvalan, the Quincy cleansing that killed every single Quincy that Yuhaba didn't deem worthy of bearing his blood. Masaki would have wiped the floor with Grand Fisher had she retained her powers. Knowing it is Yuhaba to blame and not himself allows Ichigo to finally overcome the burden of guilt for his mother's death. Finally, Ichigo is resolved. There are no more mysteries, no more indecision, no more confusion or mental instability. He knows exactly what he needs to do, what he wants to do, and who he needs to direct his anger towards. Ichigo regains his unshakable resolve, but this time it's rooted in reality. It's rooted in truth and understanding and awareness, not just blind faith. And this is wonderfully symbolized by the rain clearing away with the end of the conversation. And thus, Ichigo returns to the royal palace for another shot at making the Asauchi submit to him. He who was rejected by the Asauchi 
incapable of making them submit to him no less than a few hours ago, is immediately accepted. He didn't need to fight them, he didn't need any physical training, he didn't need some sort of ridiculous power up. The Asauchi are molded by the soul, and they function as receptors of the soul. They know and understand exactly what you're feeling, and considering Yuhaba's words make sense to him now, Aizen's words make sense to him now, the hollow within that has been eating away at him makes sense to him now, Ichigo's soul is free from any instability. He has found inner peace, and that fact permeates through the Asauchi as they all kneel before him. He immediately recognizes the Asauchi that belongs to him and says, you're the one. This level of certainty perfectly communicates Ichigo's newfound clarity. The hollow appearance of the Asauchi isn't something he has to fear anymore, it's a part of him and he embraces that fact. The analogy of the king and the horse is made redundant. Nimaya's all-important question regarding the superiority between Shinigami and Zanpakuto also made redundant. There is only one ruler, and Ichigo commands himself. But still, the most important part of this entire narrative thread is yet to come. Ichigo has learnt the truth of white, the hollow that lives within him, the source of so much anguish over the story thus far. But what about the Zanpakuto spirit he has communicated with on numerous occasions? What about the source of so much pride and power? What about old man Zangetsu? It was established that all Quincy's have the blood of Yuhaba flowing through them. Seeing as Ichigo is part Quincy, this applies to him as well. And there it is. The old man he sees in his inner realm is not a manifestation of his Shinigami powers, but rather his Quincy powers. It is Yuhaba from a thousand years ago the same man who trampled soul society. The truth comes crashing down on Ichigo as we get a haunting monologue that perfectly encompasses how he processes this revelation. Standing face to face with Yuhaba during the first invasion felt like being drawn into his inner realm where he spoke to old man Zangetsu. He shut off those feelings and tried not to think about them. He tried to ignore why Yuhaba almost reminded him of somebody. And so the rain reappears in the inner realm, the rain that represents Ichigo's sadness. He has a breakdown. He tries to bargain with Zangetsu. He refuses to acknowledge the truth as it is, but old man Zangetsu interjects and explains. He states that he is Yuhaba, but he is not Yuhaba. All Quincy come from Yuhaba as their father. They contain a piece of Yuhaba's soul within them. As Ichigo is a hybrid and has an inner realm, he is capable of communicating with this piece of Yuhaba's soul unlike any other Quincy. Which means old man Zangetsu does originate from Yuhaba, but they don't share sentiment and he doesn't serve Yuhaba either, at least not anymore. At first, that was most definitely his intention. Old Man Zangetsu claims there were no lies in his words or his heart. The only lie he ever told Ichigo was his name and even then, he tried to tell him his name at the very beginning, but that attempt was thwarted by Ichibei's antics in the future. As the conversation continues, we see the setting slowly break down, as Ichigo literally and metaphorically sinks deeper and deeper into sadness. He understandably feels betrayed, as anybody would. But once again, this is still part of Ichigo. It's very important to note that these internal conversations Ichigo is having are exactly that. They are in his mind. They are like figments of his imagination, but they are very much real. Old Man Zangetsu lays it all out for him. How he always needed white to help train Ichigo, how his life was saved not by him but by his hollow powers. He never wanted Ichigo to become a Shinigami because being a Shinigami would mean making him his enemy. The Shinigami and the Quincy are fated to fight, and old man Zangetsu didn't want to kill Ichigo himself, so he tried to sway him away from being a Shinigami. But Ichigo's immutable mindset eventually won him over. Ichigo's persistence, the choice to be a Shinigami, and travel down that dangerous path out of his own free will resulted in submission from the peace of Yuhaba within him. It made old man Zangetsu's heart waver. What was originally an attempt to keep him far away from the Shinigami became full support in Ichigo's decision. He now feels blessed joyful and content to have watched Ichigo's growth and to have supported him along the way. And now finally, it is time for him to step away and stop suppressing Ichigo's true power. What Ichigo has been using as his Zanpakuto for the entire series up until this point is only a fragment of his power that old man Zangetsu couldn't contain. Ichigo had been nerfed for the entire story, and it is now finally time for old man Zangetsu to step away 
and allow Ichigo to fight with his own power, giving him his true Zanpakuto, the real Zangetsu. And so finally, in a very similar way to how the rain clears at the end of Everything But The Rain, the light of his true Zanpakuto illuminates the water, and Ichigo chases after it, literally and metaphorically rising above his depression and gaining peace of mind once more. Despite everything old man Zangetsu just told him, how he's actually the manifestation of Ichigo's Quincy powers and comes from Yuhaba, Ichigo still accepts him as a part of his Zanpakuto, and he accepts his hollow powers also. He reassesses all of his interactions with both old man Zangetsu and the hollow white, and appreciates that they never lied. All they did was help him time and time again. Both of them are Zangetsu. Both of them are his Zanpakuto. Both of them are him. And this is wonderfully captured by the fact that Ichigo's true Zanpakuto is literally split into two, each of them respectively associated with the two halves. The chapter when Ichigo first called out Zangetsu's name was titled The Blade and Me, with the volume that chapter is part of sharing the same name. They were always separate. Ichigo was one and the blade was another. The king and his horse. The Shinigami and his Zanpakuto. A tool he used to fight. A means to protecting his loved ones. Powers he loves and appreciates for sure, but still a very flawed perception of what is literally the reflection of your soul. What is a part of your soul and Ichigo finally understands this better than ever before, stating that he will never ask for help, tell them to stay out of his way, or ask them to fight with him anymore. From this point onwards, Ichigo will fight on his own, as these swords are not separate entities from him, they are parts of him. Thank you, Zangetsu. You are me. The blade is me. The discovery, affirmation, and acceptance of Ichigo's identity coalescing in a single, all-encompassing moment of true enlightenment. This transformation is heavily rooted in the Buddhist concept of enlightenment, which is characterized by intimate knowledge and acceptance of oneself, wisdom of the material and spiritual world, and most importantly, freedom. Drawn as if carved on by Ichigo himself, rewriting the old and in with the new, Ichigo has attained freedom through internal balance. The blade is me. Ichigo's boost in power following the revelations I just covered is perfectly in line with the established connection between power and self-understanding. As a being who can now be considered enlightened and aware, Ichigo's growth in power is absolutely tremendous. The newly appointed captain commander, Kyoraku himself, visits Karakura Town in the world of the living to speak with Ichigo's friends. He expresses unease regarding the kind of power Ichigo will return with from the royal palace, depending on type of power it is, it may affect the world of the living, and if that's the case, Ichigo will not be allowed to return. He will have to stay in the Soul Society under unknowable conditions. This conversation is incredibly ominous and can be pretty confusing without later context. The possibilities Shunsui addresses is the potential death of Reo, with Ichigo as a being of all races serving as a worthy candidate of replacing him as the cornerstone of balance. Ichigo is a contingency plan, a pawn to be used for the Soul Society's goals in the event of the Soul King's demise, but at the same time, he is the hero they depend on to protect the universe. The second invasion begins as the Schattenberg unveils itself from within the Serete shadows and the Vandenreich storm the heart of Soul Society once more. Yuhaba's backstory provides great insight into his character, mainly his discordant identity. A child born blind, deaf, voiceless, and limp. A child with no means of survival, and yet the people around him call him by the name of God. He took that name for his own. The dichotomy between Yuhaba's origins and his current existence as a near omniscient being is incredibly telling now portrayed as a god, yet somehow born as a defenseless mortal, forced to keep repeating the cycle of distributing parts of his soul and retrieving them to prolong his life. It's not just his origins, but the mechanics behind his powers that communicate Yuhaba's greatest weakness, a fear of death. 
His dream of eradicating the very shapes of life and death themselves to create a utopia is merely a pretense to his true desire, to transcend death itself and free himself of the fear it brings him. Despite being essentially immortal and omnipotent, Yohoba is still shackled to the cycle of mortality as both cause and effect. He propagates the cycle by killing the people he gives pieces of his soul to, which is the cause of the cycle, and he's trapped in it because it's necessary for him to continue living the effect. This is the foundational core of Yuhaba's character, a man who is ultimately just another being who fears the inevitability of death. He goes to all extremes in hopes of defying death, going as far as attempting to reshape the natural order of the universe itself, but in order to do so, he must destroy balance. He must kill and absorb the Soul King. One of the most blatant commonalities between Aizen and Yohaba is their functions as symbolic representations of fate itself. Before we even learn of Yohaba's powers, which make this abundantly clear, Yohaba's role as the crushing wheel is established in the second meeting between Ichigo and Yohaba. Ichigo, the hero, arrives in the Seireite to help an exhausted Kenpachi. What follows is the first battle involving Ichigo following his recent transformation. Every time Ichigo has grown in power throughout the series, he has achieved a specific milestone. Ichigo's progress was always very technical by achieving these fixed milestones. Shikai, Bankai, Holification, Fullbring, even the final Getsuga Tensho. His power and progress were always contained within the forms that the manga set for him, controlled by old man Sangetsu, in essence Yohaba as the center of his powers. But what we see in this sequence of Ichigo fighting against the Bambis is unlike anything we've seen before. Ichigo's freedom is on full display as he expresses his newfound powers, which can only truly be described as formless. A mini Getsuga Tensho followed by a Getsuga Judisho. Ichigo's perspective is no longer limited, and so his power is no longer limited to established forms. I have seen a bunch of hate for Getsuga Tensho over the years as it makes Ichigo feel like a one-trick pony, and that's an understandable perspective. But with the context of Ichigo's new style, as well as the link between self-understanding and power, I think it's very clear why Ichigo only ever used that one attack. It was all he knew. It was the form Old Man Zangetsu contained Ichigo within but he has now broken free from fixed forms and achieved harmony with his unique spiritual makeup, displaying his freedom through his new style of fighting, which hinges on the idea of formlessness. And that's exactly where Yuhaba's role in this arc thrives. He exists to challenge Ichigo's newfound growth, his conceptions of being enlightened and truly free. He exists as the personification of fate itself, and he conveys this here and now, just as Ichigo begins to express this freedom. Kurosaki Ichigo, the one who will guide us to the light. His entrance paves the way for Yuhaba's invasion of the royal palace. It is only thanks to Ichigo that Yuhaba managed to break into the realm of heaven and threaten the balance of the entire world. Ichigo is used as a pawn once more. The crushing wheel continues to spin as Yuhaba and his Shutstafel immediately make way to the royal palace for a battle between gods. The pinnacle of Shinigami versus the pinnacle of Quincy. But what's noteworthy is the assistance Ichigo receives from the Gote 13 who pick up the slack and allow him to follow Yuhaba into the world above. The real beauty of this not being the fact Ichigo's friendships are proving useful, but rather Ichigo's acceptance of this help. With absolutely zero hesitation, he allows the others to get the job done as he chases after Yuhaba. What lies ahead of him is a painful surprise. Instead of standing behind him and picking up the slack, this time a friend stands in his way, as an enemy who denies him entry and clears the path for Yuhaba to ascend upwards. The Quincy arrive at the royal palace and immediately begin their destruction. What follows is a short but interesting conversation between Yuhaba and Yugaram. Yugaram states, I understand how you feel your majesty, to which Yuhaba responds, I'm not feeling a shred of emotion from looking at this decaying grave. Why would Yugaram suspect Yuhaba feel some type of way upon reaching what we have been led to believe is the king of Shinigami, the ultimate enemy of the Quincy? What does Yuhaba mean by decaying grave? 
we arrive at the battle between Yuhaba and Ichibe, both men considered top dogs of their respective races, two ancient leaders who possess powers related to granting identity. This battle is one of my absolute favourite things in the manga and has extreme significance to not just the Thousand Year Blood War but the entire story. It more than deserves its own video, which is already in the works to be released around the same time it airs in the anime, so I'm going to keep the analysis here minimal. Ichibe is said to have named most things in Soul Society, including Zanpakuto. Names have an obvious and explicit tie to identity. Yuhaba gives the Stern Ritter their powers and identities by way of engraving a piece of himself onto their souls. Shrifts are essentially names. Ichibe steals from the future to protect the present. He's the personification of the Shinigami doctrine, maintaining the status quo whatever the cost. His powers are transcendent, which is reflected in Yuhaba not being able to sense any Ryatsu from his Zanpakuto. By way of his abilities, Ichibe controls black and white, which funnily enough, forms the essence of the manga from a thematic, narrative and aesthetic standpoint. This is intentional, as Ichibe's control over the narrative is incredibly key. It was evidenced way back in Ichigo's first meeting with old man Zangetsu. Ichibe from within the manga blocks out the dialogue of another character with his ink. What he essentially does is cover Yuhaba's name from the annals of history with ink through a single action that reverberates throughout the entire manga. History is key as this is what Ichibe governs and fights for. This confrontation is more than just the leader of the Shinigami versus the leader of the Quincy. This is a conflict between the past and the future, the potential of a new world versus the foundation of an old world. In the end, neither of these two men and their causes truly prevail. But Yuhaba does win this confrontation and blows Ichibe to pieces once he awakens his true power the Almighty. Since the beginning of the battle, Yuhaba had been fighting with his true eyes closed. Not because he took his enemy lightly, but rather because he had to follow the prophecy to the T, waiting exactly 9 whole years before fully regaining his strength. As Yuhaba makes clear, there is no room for comprehension or counterpowers against the Almighty. As the Lord of Fate, he transcends even the one whose powers form the essence of the manga itself. He gives himself back his name and affirms his identity as the one who will rob Ichibe of everything, in a display of complete dominance. 611 starts with the death of Ichibe who meets his demise in the exact position Yuhaba predicted he would, even without the Almighty. Squad Zero has fallen and now it's your turn to fall. These are Yuhaba's words to the Soul King. Ichigo alongside Yoruichi, Chad, Orihime and Ganju arrive at the royal palace shortly after this battle between gods. Through some soul transfer shenanigans that only transcendentally powerful individuals like Ichigo and Ichibe could ever possibly hope to perform, Ichibe is resurrected through the power of names. This is another one of those scenes that is widely disliked for a number of reasons, but to me it's the source of a lot of interesting theory crafting. The power to impart pieces of your soul is exclusive to Yuhawa and Yugaram of the Quincy, at least from what we currently know. It would not be surprising in the least if Ichigo had a similar ability as a being of all races, a worthy candidate in replacing the Soul King. And who better than Ichibe to know this, the man who originally intended to mutilate Ichigo and turn him into that replacement. Ichibe asks Ichigo to stop Yuhaba. He states that while his body may have returned, it will be too late by the time his strength returns, a similar principle to how Yuhaba regains his mind, body and strength at different times. Ichibe's body language in this entire sequence is incredibly concerning. He's looking down as he begs Ichigo to at least stop Yuhaba. We see him from behind and we don't get an actual close look at his face. There are clearly some deep dark secrets Ichibe is keeping to himself. He explicitly states that the Soul King is the key to the world. If he dies, the Seireite, the world of the living, Hueco Mundo, all of it will disappear. This is completely in line with Urahara's words following Aizen's defeat against Ichigo. The Soul King is established as a necessary cornerstone for the greater good of the entire universe. Not a ruler, not a figurehead for just the Soul Society, but for the entire world. A very crucial detail for his character. Finally, we see the Reo once again, being pierced through the chest by Yuhaba. Again, his eyes are his most 
striking feature. And this time, the silhouette within the crystal doesn't appear to have any legs. Yuhaba calls the Soul King his father who has seen the future. Whether Yuhaba is the biological child of the Soul King or just a symbolic child is besides the point. He views him as his father, the one who came before him. With Yuhaba being the father of the Quincy, this implies that all Quincy originally stem from the Soul King. The line about Reo seeing the future is also incredibly important. He seems to possess the Almighty just like his son, an ability that can be best described as omni-precognition. Yuhaba can see everything that is to occur from the present moment into the far-flung future. He knows everything that lies within his gaze. The key aspect of this ability being that Yuhaba doesn't see a single linear future, but rather he can observe all possible futures like grains of sand, and can thus act accordingly to that knowledge to prepare for any circumstances. The devil is in the details though. The Soul King's eyes each have four pupils, one more than Yuhaba who has three pupils by the end of his battle against Yuhaba. Yuhaba's eyes gaining an extra pupil is treated like a pretty big deal in the fight against Ichibe, which means Reo's four pupils serves as an implication of even greater power than Yuhaba's almighty. The next chapter goes back in time a few moments and shows us Yuhaba's words before he says farewell, before he pierces the Reo through the chest. He calls him an imperfect god, who is unable to escape even in a moment like this. He then goes on to say he shall bring an end to the Reo's endless humiliation. No, perhaps the Reo has already foreseen this very day. It's very clearly shown here that the Reo is a limbless humanoid figure. He has no arms, he has no legs, he has no agency just an observer with an almighty gaze trapped in a crystal. This position he finds himself in is considered humiliating by Yuhaba. Once again, not everything is as it seems and the implications are very concerning. Ichigo finally arrives at the Reo's residence to see Yuhaba standing in front of him. Once again, Yuhaba's eyes are brought into focus, the eyes that allow him to see everything, something he calls proof of a true Quincy, which says a lot about the Reo. Yuhaba knows exactly what happened between Ichibe and Ichigo. He knows exactly what Ichigo is going to attempt to do, and he knows that it is too late. Upon seeing Yuhaba's sword pierced through the Reo's chest, Ichigo immediately dashes to pull the blade out, and then it happens. Yuhaba eggs Ichigo on. Go on, pull it out. I know you can do it. Pull that sword out and bring down the Soul Society with your own hands. Ichigo kills the Soul King slicing the crystal he resides in clean in half, something else Yuhaba foresaw. The Quincy blood inside Ichigo will never accept Reo's existence, and immediately following this, we witness the crumbling of Soul Society. Yuhaba was able to make this happen through his ability to bestow power, or more accurately, his ability to bestow pieces of his soul. His Reiatsu resides within his sword, and by coming into contact with Ichigo, who has Quincy blood running through his veins, he was able to take control of Ichigo and make him do what he did. Following the death of Reo is a massive earthquake that extends across the cosmos. We get a scene of Yuzu and Karin in the human world feeling the effects of the Reo's death in a distant dimension that should communicate fairly well the impact that the Reo has on the universe. He's not just a symbolic cornerstone for the world, he's a literal cornerstone. His existence maintains both a symbolic and a literal balance in the universe, but he has no agency, which is what makes his existence particularly interesting. The Soul Society begins to crumble, vanishing from existence. Urahara immediately notices that this means the Reio has been killed, which means the Soul Society, Hueco Mundo, and even the world of the living will cease to exist. Yuhaba tells us the Reio was created, keyword created, to stabilize the Soul Society, where massive numbers of Kompaku pass through. Now that it is gone, not just the Soul Society, but everything connected to it will collapse. And if you've watched my world building series, you'll know that everything is connected to it. The Dangai, the Garganta, every realm of existence. The entire universe will crumble at the hands of Ichigo. Orihime's ability to reject and reverse phenomena is rendered useless when she tries to return the Reio to his previous state, an interesting detail given that her ability was previously described as a rejection of divine law. Yuhaba claims resurrecting the Reio is impossible, regardless of what powers you use, and then Ukitake steps up to the podium. 
He says he will take Rayo's place, begins to cast an incantation and a black shadowy figure emerges from his body. A god that is said to be the enshrined right arm of Rayo that fell from the heavens long ago. Thus Ukitake sacrifices his life to replace the Rayo and serve as the cornerstone of the universe in his stead, through the Rayo's right arm that has merged with him. The man Aizen specifically spoke to in defiance of the Soul King turns out to have been the literal right hand of the Soul King all along, a man who embodies the unbearable vacancy of heaven's throne. Mimihagi traverses upwards to the Soul King's dimension and latches onto the split crystal, and Yohaba immediately notices that this must be a part of Reo. He notices this because Mimihagi doesn't reflect on his eye. Yohaba can intervene with all futures reflected on his eye. He showcases this when he breaks Ichigo's Bankai in the future and manifests that future in the present. The Reo is the one thing whose future Yohaba cannot intervene with, or even see, as the Reo is not reflected on his almighty eyes. The fact Mimi Hagi, who is a part of Reo, is getting in the way of Yohaba's plans absolutely infuriates him. They halt the destruction of the universe and subsequent creation of the utopia Yohaba seeks, the merging of all realms into the graveyard of death. He asks him why. Why are you getting in the way? Are you suddenly feeling an attachment to the soul society you've been protecting? Yet another line that implies the soul king has ties to the Quincy and originally didn't have have ties to the Shinigami. Yuhaba justifies this as an odd occurrence and states that the Reo's will no longer dwells in an arm that's been ripped off. Heavy emphasis on ripped off. Mimihagi is the right hand of the Soul King. They govern stillness and stagnation in opposition to the left hand Penaida, who governs progress and evolution, further cementing the Reo as balance. Both sides of this conflict are represented in him. Both extremes are reflected in the philosophies and affiliations of each hand. Penaida pursuing progression chose the path of Yuhaba to recreate the world. Mimihagi pursuing stagnation chose the path of Shinigami, maintaining the status quo, the current system, the structure of the cosmos with the rail themselves as the idol linchpin, despite being ripped off its master by the same Shinigami it defends. Yohaba goes in to destroy Mimihagi alongside the Reio but is stopped by Ichigo who obviously wants to protect the entire universe. Ichigo reiterates his sense of agency and free will, stating that having Yohaba's blood inside him isn't going to make him do what Yohaba wants him to. And again, Yohaba states whether or not Ichigo will do as he wishes is up to those eyes of his. He tells Ichigo that their wills are connected, all because they have the same blood flowing inside of them. And then we get what I personally think is one of the most important parts of this entire stretch. Ichigo tells Yohaba he is here to stop him, and Yohaba responds by asking, why stop? Am I not your enemy? The fact you can't say kill against the man who killed your mother is your weakness. A very similar sentiment to what Aizen was telling Ichigo about his lack of hatred. Deep down, Ichigo knows there's something questionable about Reio's existence as a limbless figurehead trapped in a crystal and he can't tell whether or not Yohaba is correct in his actions or otherwise. He wants to stop him but he doesn't really want to kill him because he wants to understand him. But regardless, he will fight to protect his loved ones. He's mature enough to recognize that this is war, driven by million year old sins and fierce agendas. War fought because both sides are just, and both sides are evil. Ichigo has his own agenda. He lives in service of life, which demands his intervention in this conflict. His friends need protecting. The universe needs protecting. The Aizen and Yohaba parallels are made clear once more. Yohaba claims every single thing Ichigo has ever done was for his gain. Yohaba's influence in designing Ichigo's fate cannot be denied. He has always been with Ichigo in the form of Old Man Zangetsu and has guided him down a path where anything he does, any battle he fights, he does so for Yohaba's sake. Their wills are connected by the shared blood flowing in their veins. But unlike Aizen, Yohaba never once planned for Ichigo to serve him. He never once even thought about making Ichigo do what he wanted him to do, because he didn't have to. That's the key distinction between Aizen and Yohaba. 
Yahaba assumes the position of God, what Aizen always strived for but never managed to truly accomplish. He is the ultimate representation of fatalism in Bleach as he decides the fate of people with the Almighty and all agency is robbed by the power of his eyes, but it is never an intentional choice. Everything simply bends to his will by design, as he himself is the crushing wheel of fate. Mimihagi attempts to attack Yuhaba, who questions its motives once again. Why would the Reo's right arm want to consume his own child? He notes that Mimihagi is now far inferior to him and then absorbs Mimihagi through his hand and decides to take everything that once belonged to the Soul King. He fires a beam of darkness down to the Seireite and takes on a new appearance. Now that he has been absorbed, Mimihagi's will has been shifted to Yuhaba's, and these tiny dark creatures with a single eye begin to pass through Yuhaba's body. Yugaram tells Lily Barrow to calm down. These creatures will not harm him as they are a torrent of Reo's power, and Reo's true enemy are the Soul Reapers. The creatures descend to the Seireite and begin to attack members of the Gote 13 like Soifon. Aizen pulls up and saves the day, which is honestly a topic for another video, and a lot of other stuff happens, but let's get back to Yuhaba. He has now completely absorbed the Soul King. His first act as a being overflowing with power is to reinvent the Quincy's nation, reshaping the royal palace into the Varvelt or castle of the true world. Almost every aspect of Yuhaba's subtle characterization flows back into that central conflict between free will and fate. The Almighty exists to enforce the idea of how futile free will is from the view of a person who towers over mortals. Mortals talk about hope and defying fate, but those who are watching everything from a greater plane of existence know for a fact how childish the idea of defying fate truly is. Yuhaba, now merged with the Soul King himself, is truly an unstoppable force of divine retribution. The implications of these chapters, even without taking the light novels into consideration, tell a dark story that underpins the Thousand Year Blood War. The Reo was seemingly mutilated and placed into a crystal by none other than the Shinigami who currently function as protagonists of the manga. They did this to create the world as it is now, using the Reo as the cornerstone for the current fixed shapes of the cosmos, swirling life and death that they maintain as they please. But who gave them the right? They fashioned this universe to suit themselves, and Yuhaba exists to enact vengeance for his father, the most enigmatic, ambiguous, and interesting character in the story. Seemingly lacking all agency, but still exerting his will over the narrative in countless ways. Yuhaba fights to return the world to what it once was, before life and death were created, to reshape the composition of the cosmos into a single almighty realm, as it was was when his father was conjured into existence. He fights to punish the Shinigami for their ancient sins, as the ultimate representation of cycles by striking them with karma. This story is structurally centered around the Reo, as the cornerstone of not just the world building and lore, but the narrative itself, with both ultimate villains and major conflicts of both halves of the manga fighting to overturn his existence. The Prince of Light intervenes to send the Son of Darkness back down to the Seireite, once again Again standing in his way. But through the assistance of Yoruichi, Riruka, and Yukio, they managed to make ways back to the Reoku, which has now been shaped into Yuhaba's true world. The rest of the Gote 13's elite forces also arrive on the final battlefield, a five pronged cross resembling the Quincy Zerchen, a reference to the pentagram in Christian symbology. In Christianity, the pentagram was considered a representation of the five sins or the five wounds of Christ, which reflects Yuhaba's own loss and regaining of the senses as prophesied in the king's hymn. Very fitting that the mark of his people and the shape of his new kingdom should represent this. It's incredibly important to understand that Yuhaba did not intend to merge with the Soul King like this. The intervention of Mimihagi is a future that could not be reflected on his eyes, as the Soul King is the only entity in existence that cannot be seen by Yuhaba's almighty. By merging with the crystal containing the head and torso of its host, the right hand of the Soul King who embodies stagnation halts the destruction of the universe. 
purpose. Yuhaba is forced to consume the Soul King's head and torso, which turns himself into the new cornerstone of the universe, rendering him the symbol of balance. He becomes the very thing he wishes to destroy, and now must find another way to recreate the shape of the universe, which isn't necessarily something Yuhaba cannot do, but it does require a lot more effort than simply having killed the Reo. Mimihagi's intrusion throws a wrench into the cogs of fate. As you can tell, we're trimming through the arc and all the incredible stuff we receive for side characters and diving straight into the final conflict between Ichigo and Yuhaba. There is so much I'd love to talk about that happens before this, but if I continue writing, this video will be over 10 hours long and I will be a broken man if I have to edit all of that. With that being said, let's dive into the ultimate conflict of the series. Yuhaba sits on his throne and sleeps. The power of the Almighty is supposedly with Yugaram as the Quincy King dreams. In front of him stands Kurosaki Ichigo, wielding his original Shikai, the false Zanpakuto that was crafted by Old Man Zangetsu, the piece of Yuhaba within Ichigo that served as the center of his powers, and he cuts him down across the chest. This dream is the key to Yuhaba's defeat, for it isn't a dream Yugara made him see as he surmised, but rather a future Yuhaba saw with his own eyes. The path to his throne is opened by the efforts of everybody fighting against the Quincy, which leaves Ichigo accompanied only by Orihime as he approaches his greatest enemy. Their relationship has finally grown to a point where they can depend on each other, with Orihime reveling in her growth and Ichigo's acceptance of her. He no longer pushes her away, but relies on her as a much needed protector in charge of defense, concluding her own journey. Together they enter and face off against fate itself. Ichigo and Yuhaba share some words which only serve to anger Ichigo who immediately swoops in with a Getsuga Tensho that is effortlessly thwarted by Yuhaba who rises from his throne in his new Soul King infused appearance. Remembering the rain that fell on that June 17th, Ichigo has only one thing on his mind. Vengeance. Or at least that's what it seems like. He charges in recklessly and his impatience is a point of mockery by Yuhaba. Throughout this entire battle, Yuhaba speaks to encourage Ichigo. He advises him, he shares his wisdom, he doesn't treat him as an enemy. Even Orihime somewhat agrees, as she tries to calm Ichigo down and stop this relentless barrage that ultimately achieves nothing. Or at least, that's what it seems like. By locking eyes with him, Orihime notices that wasn't the face of a person who had lost himself, that Ichigo had something in mind, and she was right. His true goal was to make use of Yuhaba's Quincy Reiatsu and awaken his inner hollow, cleverly using the Reiatsu spectrum to his advantage. The Horn of Salvation. He still has a way to go before he can call them out at will, but he still displays impressive harmony with his inner hollow, maintaining his self-control and behaving just as he normally would, completely unaffected by the negative aspects of the hollow for the first time ever, drawing out its power to his advantage. Such a magnificent power, even the divine Yuhaba cannot help but give it praise, drawing his sword in retaliation. And what follows is an even greater expression of Ichigo's inner balance, a Getsuga Tensho mixed with a Grand Reisero. Truly magnificent, but is it enough in the face of Yuhaba who is now fully on guard? This is when Yuhaba provides his all-important speech. Ichigo, I enjoy speaking of hope. The future can be changed, that is a fact, a fact filled with such great hope. You evolve through your battles, fine. That too is filled with hope. But changing the future simply means jumping from one grain of sand to another. Please, do not give up hope, Ichigo. Stay the way you are. Keep jumping from the rolling grains of sand called fates or possibility with your eyes shut. That is hope for humans. Do not lose hope. There is nothing more painful for a parent than killing a child in despair. The connection between fate and grains of sand follows up on that all-important chapter we discussed right at the beginning of this video. Chapter 0 Part A, The Sand. Everything in this story has been working towards this moment, as Ichigo leaps from one grain of sand to the other, in hopes of changing the future and defying fate itself. He pushes back at Yuhaba's rhetoric regarding despair, proudly declaring he knows all about despair. He's been through it time and time again, and every single time he overcame. 
He thinks back on all of those moments, the journey he has persisted through that ultimately culminates here. This is everything Ichigo always wished for, enough strength and a strong blade to shatter fate. And so he grabs both of his swords and holds them side by side, screaming Bankai, Tensal Zangetsu, and reaches a new height of formlessness. The chain that once hung off his zanpakuto is now intrinsically connected to its blade, a representation of the equilibrium he has achieved. But almost immediately, this incredible power is destroyed, snapped into two. He looks at his blade in pure horror. Yuhaba explains this is his way of paying respect to this formidable power by breaking it in the future. The irony of Yuhaba's victory against Ichibei is made apparent when he also steals from the future by breaking Bankai to protect his life in the present. He then proceeds to break the Horn of Salvation in the same manner to further display his inescapable power. The Almighty is not just the power to see the future, it is the power to alter the future. Ichigo sinks into despair once more, as the overwhelmingly powerful Yuhaba towers above him. It's over. Yuhaba drains all of his Reryoku and renders him completely powerless. He laughs in a frenzy as he revels in victory. As the ultimate showing of his arrogance, Yuhaba leaves the gate of the Dangai open, welcoming any adversaries to come after him. He empowers himself even further by performing the Ashvalan and taking back the pieces of his soul in all of his children, before descending to the Soul Society, ready to crush the universe. And on the other side of the battlefield, Uryu's life is saved by Yuhaba's betrayal of the one who governs balance. Yugaram is inseparably tied to Yuhaba's cycle of life and death, taking over the power of the Almighty at night as the only other Quincy who can impart pieces of his soul. The power to assign fortune and misfortune can most definitely be considered divine. Through those all-seeing eyes, Yugaram, who was already suspicious of the boy who survived the Ashvalan, implies to have seen a future where Uryu turns traitor. He discovers chips that were planted in various areas of the Varvelt, chips with a mechanism that breaks down and diffuses Reishi, a similar effect to the laden hand he wore in the Soul Society arc and used to activate the last style. The object of his destiny his grandfather left him with, what Uryu views as the tool he must use in fighting this battle he cannot avoid. Uryu is intending to take on everything alone, heeding his destiny to oppose Yuhaba. Yugaram embodies the concept of balance, something all living beings and even forces of nature must adhere to. We weigh our options against themselves because we instinctively crave balance. This is incredibly true in the case of Bleach, where the world itself hinges upon balance as the backbone of existence. Balance is what demanded that friendship, which was Yugaram's original purpose, be robbed by Yuhaba, who replaces it with another purpose in devotion to him, from training to kill the emperor to serving as his other half a complete switch. Throughout the Thousand Year Blood War, Yugaram is consistently tested. He faces off against two men who had come to terms with their identities in their battles against him. Baz B, his best friend in childhood whom he betrayed, sheds his hatred towards him and accepts his own shortcomings becoming free of suffering before death. And now Uryu, who upon weighing all the elements of his past, chose to heed his destiny and fight against Yuhaba. It was through them that Yugaram finally came to terms with his own identity. Uryu's willingness to choose the more difficult path and stay true to his values angered Yugaram, as it forces him to recognize that his life could have taken another path. But he too finds peace in his last moments, once abandoned by Yuhaba. He finds solace in his choices, staying true to the balance until the very end. If only he could have done so as a child, instead of hastily joining Yuhaba and losing the heart he shared with his best friend. But despite that choice he always regretted in life, Yugaram holds no regrets in death. In his final moments, he gains a new outlook on the balance he governs over. Perhaps maintaining balance is not weighing our options against each other and choosing the one that seems most rational or logical, but rather choosing the one you want to choose and staying true to yourself. To do as you please, to move forward as you please, to understand what exactly you want to choose. Balance is an internal, formless thing. And as he closes his eyes for the last time, clinging to the handle that defined him, Yugaram finally understands. Unfortunately, his other half, Yuhaba, did not have the time or sufficient experience to come to terms with himself and find that solace in his final moments. He is blinded by his own hubris until the very end. 
Yugaram's character supplements the hero's journey by presenting a perspective that accompanies the ultimate decision Ichigo makes, to maintain balance not out of a sense of logic or reason, but to protect his mortal bonds, the world he has grown attached to and fulfil his role as the ultimate protector, acknowledging there are concerns with the format of the cosmos and the sins that formed it, but doing as he pleases nonetheless, clinging to the life he has grown to love. Uryu's shrift shares the same letter as Yuhaba's almighty, the A, fitting as he is perhaps the only one who can challenge Yuhaba with his ability of the antithesis, the power to reverse the events that have already taken place between two designated points, a direct counter to Yuhaba's ability of altering the future, and he showcases this power against Yugaram twice, once in the midst of the battle and again at Yugaram's deathbed as he transfers his wounds onto his fallen adversary. Yugaram tells Uryu to place everything on a balance and go help Ichigo. Uryu's role in this final volume must not be overlooked. So let's quickly go over everything that brought him to this moment. Do you remember the backstory he received during the battle against Mayuri way back in Soul Society? I spoke about it at length for a very specific reason. That backstory contains the key to Uryu's internal struggle during the Thousand Year Blood War, the inescapable enemy he must one day face. Throughout Uryu's childhood, Ryuken presented himself as a cold, heartless doctor who hated the ways of the Quincy. He claimed there was no profit in them, as a way to justify his hatred. He does in fact hate the ways of the Quincy, but not because there's no monetary gain in being one, but rather because the Quincy are doomed to suffering. He knew of Yuhaba's existence and eventual return. He knew how and why his wife was killed, and he knew his son would be subjected to a great deal of suffering if he chose to walk the path of the Quincy. So everything he did was intentionally done to prevent Uryu from choosing that path. Unfortunately for Ryuken, his own father had different plans for the boy. Soken established Uryu as a chosen one figure, with a destiny to do what needs to be done, as the only one who can get the job done. The boy who somehow survived the Ashvalan. Of course, Uryu is still a child, so Sorkin doesn't share the intimate details of what exactly Uryu must one day do, but Ryuken's appearance in the royal palace unveils the truth of Uryu's mission. All Quincy subjected to the Ashvalan develop a silver thombrus in the heart and die. Uryu receives an arrowhead made of that silver from his father and is told it should be fired by him and only him. As a child, Uryu decided not to become a doctor after witnessing his own father cutting apart his dead mother. If that's what being a doctor demands of you, then he doesn't want to be one. But at the end of the manga, Uryu does become a doctor. Why is that? Well, the answer presents itself in this silver arrow. Ryuken did not cut apart the body of his dead wife as a part of his job as a doctor. He cut her apart as a part of his job as a Quincy. Finally, Uryu understands the burden his father has been carrying all along, as well as the battle he cannot avoid. Uryu heeds his destiny in fighting against Yuhaba and fights for the ideal his grandfather sought. Differences settled between the races and peace. Uryu fights for friendship, the heart shared between himself and Ichigo, the one who freed him from his suffering by unveiling his insecurities and guilt and empathizing with his struggle. Uryu had grown to hate the Shinigami. His grandfather and mentor yearned to settle differences with them but to no avail. He was rejected until killed by the same hollows that caused the rift between these beings. In bitterness, Uryu strays farther and farther from his grandfather's teachings and becomes something far removed from Sorkin's ideal. But the appearance of Kurosaki Ichigo into his life allowed him to acknowledge his own shortcomings, strive for self-betterment and find kinship with a Shinigami, just as Sorkin dreamed of. Unlikely allies the Fullbringers, who previously served as antagonists, show up to restore Ichigo's Bankai. Through a very complicated procedure of batshit crazy powers working together, Orihime and Tsukishima's combined efforts restore Ichigo's power. To explain this simply, Tsukishima inserted himself into Ichigo's past and created a past where Yuhaba did not break his Bankai, which allows Orihime to restore it as she would normally. The actual mechanics behind how this is possible is rather confusing and not something I'd like to discuss today, but it makes sense when you consider these are two individuals with a piece of the Soul King living within their souls. What matters most is the thematic significance of this gesture from past enemies. Ginjo is responsible for this. 
as he orders Tsukishime to repay his debt to Ichigo. A debt that can be best described as, I made your life a living hell, so here's an apology. <laughs> Ichigo's ability to find help in even those whose lives he ended is remarkable, even if this is the subject of widespread criticism. That's the point of his character after all. No man can cross swords with Ichigo and not be changed to some extent. His outlook is irresistibly infectious. Having been rejuvenated, Ichigo has overcome despair once more, ready to strike back at Yuhaba in the ultimate confrontation. With Renji, he takes the path Yuhaba left open for them through the Dangai just as Yuhaba arrives to be greeted by Aizen Sosuke, who drops the coldest line in the entire series. Aizen plays a pivotal role in this final battle by tampering with Yuhaba's perception. But what exactly drives this man who once stood in a similar position to Yuhaba as the Soul Society's antagonizer? Why does he oppose the one who has freed him of the awful chair and defend the ones who gave him that sentence to begin with? It's simple, Aizen refuses to be controlled. This is perfectly in line with his character but it does raise some questions about his grander motives. If you'd like me to discuss Aizen's role in the Thousand Year Blood War at a later date, let me know in the comment section down below. Ichigo and Renji's arrival makes this an unexpected team up between these three men, who seemingly join forces. In actuality, Ichigo and Renji have yet to arrive, and their involvement in the bulk of this battle is the result of Aizen's illusions. Designated as one of the five special war threats for his ridiculously powerful Reiatsu, Aizen is the only being besides Ichigo with the raw power to face off against Yuhaba. Kyoka Suigetsu's illusions were activated way back during the first invasion, when Yuhaba visited him in the Muken, and of of course, they work against the Almighty, as Yuhaba sees into the future, believing everything reflected on his eyes is real. His foresight is vision-based, which Aizen takes complete advantage over. This paves the way for Ichigo's real entrance, where he momentarily kills Yuhaba with a Getsuga Tensho before the Almighty revives himself by way of his indomitable power. If even death itself is a future that can be rewritten by Yuhaba, how on earth can they possibly kill him? What better time than now? for the magic silver arrow covered in plot armor. I, okay, I'm playing, I low-key love this shit, even if I completely understand a lot of the criticism surrounding the arrow. I do agree that the integration and presentation of the still silver was sloppy. We all know Kubo's health issues, we know this final volume was rushed, right? But the thematic weight more than makes up for its shortcomings. This arrow provides the perfect conclusion for Yohaba on a character and thematic level, a man consumed by arrogance who fails to look within. The silver that appears in the hearts of the victims of the Ashvala is known as the Silver of Stillness. By mixing it with the blood of the one who has activated the Ashvalan, all of that person's abilities for a brief moment will cease to exist. An object that serves an almost identical role to the Hodgyoku in causing the downfall of the main villain. A product of their own creation that reflects their hubris and ultimately serves as the bane of their existence. An incredibly important detail that is overlooked in this moment is the fact that Uryu is the one who fires the arrow. Uryu is the one who fires the arrow through Yuhaba's chest, the antithesis himself, acknowledged by Yuhaba as the last surviving Quincy for having been unaffected by the Ashvalan in the past. But how? That was never addressed. Why did Kubo leave out such an incredibly important detail? The answer is rather simple, he didn't, he just chose to present it in an incredibly indirect way. The answer lies in Uryu's antithesis, the ability to literally reverse events between two points in time, the perfect counter to Yuhaba. That's why he was unaffected by the Ashvalan as a child, because as we know, shrifts are an intrinsic thing that come from the stern litter themselves. The piece of Yuhaba's soul serves as the activator. This is also why he's unaffected by the Ashvalan in this final volume, and most most importantly, that is why this all-important job of firing the arrow was Uryu's burden to carry alone. It must be fired by him as he is the only one capable of doing so. Thus, Uryu accepts his fate in momentarily halting the power of the one who personifies that same fate and banking on Ichigo to get the job done. And of course, he does. Ichigo capitalizes on this all-important moment and swings his Bankai blade at Yuhaba to deliver the finishing blow. A man heeding his fate along alongside a man who rejects his fate. Perfectly balanced. The sequence that follows is perhaps my favourite thing in the entire manga. 
Ichigo's blade is covered in cracks and blemishes due to the damages it received over the course of this battle. So as he makes the swing, Yuhaba manages to crush the blade pretty effortlessly with his overwhelming Ryatsu. But beneath the outer shell of this Bankai is a blade we are all very familiar with the false shikai that old man Zangetsu constructed for Ichigo. The only blade he can be defeated by, as per old man Zangetsu's words, way back during the Bankai training. The same blade Yuhaba envisioned cutting him down in his dream. The representation of Ichigo's Quincy powers that stem from a piece of Yuhaba within Ichigo. OMZ has turned against its origin and lays the final killing blow to shatter fate. Yuhaba is shown in the center of an almighty eye, the symbol of fate within the story as Ichigo is seen slashing right through him as well as the eye, visually representing that he is sliced through fate itself. Yuhaba obviously didn't plan for Ichigo to defeat him. That was entirely a product of Ichigo's courage to defy his own fate and fight against a godlike being who controls the crushing wheel of fate. Ironically though, Yuhaba's control over fate is brought into question. An undervalued aspect of this scene comes in its portrayal of Yuhaba as the one trapped in the chains of fate. This is evidenced by how his powers are imperfect and he needs to share them with Yugaram in order to stay alive. At night when Yuhaba sleeps, the power of the Almighty is assumed by Yugaram, trapped in a cycle of life and death, day and night. In fact, the fear of death is why he even wages war in the first place, despite his supposed pacifism, in hopes of creating a utopia where the shapes of life and death no longer exist. But Ichigo rejects the deathless utopia, choosing to maintain balance and protect the current order of the universe, even if this current world is fundamentally flawed as he witnessed firsthand, Ichigo being the inspiration of change in others to overcome their trauma and reassess their worldviews. Ichigo yearning for enough strength and a blade to shatter fate, Ichigo's immutability and steadfastness in his core beliefs. Every major aspect of his character coalesces in this all-encompassing moment of transcendence as he slices down the man who embodies the crushing wheel. A piece of that man within Ichigo's soul is ultimately the key to his demise. A piece of Yuhaba who had spent so much time seeing the world through Ichigo's eyes, he could not help but yield to his contagious beliefs. In his final moments, Yuhaba's hubris is all that is reflected on his all-seeing eyes. In the end, his failure to look within himself is his Achilles heel. Poetry in motion. Yuhaba previously stated that the Quincy blood in Ichigo wouldn't forgive the existence of the Soul King. This is a fate imposed by Yuhaba himself as the father of the Quincy. Why does this matter? Well, when Ichigo kills Yuhaba, it's after he's absorbed the Soul King. He is the acting Soul King when Ichigo cuts him into two, just like he did the Soul King's torso, further pointing to how Yuhaba himself is a prisoner of fate. This can be seen to a greater extent in Yuhaba's role as the exact inverse of the main messages the story promotes. In a story where discovering and accepting one's identity means everything, the final villain being a character born with an incapability of expressing individual agency who embodies an identity imposed upon them couldn't be more fitting. Yuhaba fears is death and wishes to create a world where death doesn't exist, contrasting Ichigo's courage in the face of death and willingness to continue living in a world shackled by the cycle of mortality. The dream of a deathless utopia is undeniably a noble one. The world Yuhaba intended to create would neutralize every single problem humanity faces, completely removing the possibility of despair. Conflicts would be rendered non-existence, promising eternal peace. But can we really call that living? Yuhaba's world would have no problems, sure, but without problems, is there meaning to existence? That is Kubo's argument, that there are two sides to every coin, and Yuhaba's world completely destroys destroys that, rendering all things meaningless, destroying the very concept of balance both literally and figuratively. Without the fear of death, there is no hope in life. There cannot be good without bad. This is Eastern Philosophy 101, yin and yang. The fear of death rather than being something negative can be a beautiful thing. It is proof of existence. It spurs people on to seek meaning, to have actually lived a life worth living. For without death, there is no true living. People will persist simply by being alive. But with death, there is hope. There is persistence while fending off the fear of death. There is courage. And so we reach the second end of the hero's journey.
I've mentioned that Ichigo's journey can be split into two near-perfect halves that parallel, mirror, and complement one another. Cyclicality in the very structure of the manga, is what I called it. This is evidenced by how Ichigo's journey in the second half of the manga is almost an exact mirror of his journey in the first half. Ichigo starts off powerless, wishing for strength. His wish is granted and he achieves tremendous power, with his potential for even greater power being made abundantly clear. But he soon faces a dramatic reality check in a battle where he is drastically outclassed, ending with his means of fighting being stripped from him. To regain his power, he goes through a journey of self-discovery and comes out stronger at the end of it. Eventually, Ichigo faces the final boss, the big bad and ultimate villain, and he proceeds to get absolutely stomped on. But he never submits, and he travels through the Dangai to reach the final battle where victory awaits. Mugetsu is mirrored in Ichigo's final blow to Yuhaba, both being attacks that are representative of his Quincy powers. Okay, these are very, very cool details, but what's the ultimate purpose in this? Why does Kubo go to such lengths to have this cyclic structure in the manga? The concept of cycles, by definition, implies the lack of free will. Those caught in it are there without choice. They perpetrate whatever it is they were victims of, creating more victims and in turn, more perpetrators. By framing Ichigo's journey as a cycle that ultimately ends with him transcending the cycle, Kubo aims to integrate the thematic framework of the story into the structure itself, creating a manga where the main character breaks the established boundaries that define it through sheer courage, in a very meta fashion. Ichigo literally saves the world and ends the cycle of suffering that plagues every character within it through his courage, which is the final say of the story. Cyclicality also adds to Yuhaba's godhood and how he is able to shape people's fates. Unlike Aizen, he didn't actively control the flow of Ichigo's journey, things simply happened in accordance with his will as the ultimate representation of fatalism. This control over Ichigo's life is realized through Old Man Zangetsu, the peace of Yuhaba within Ichigo, but ultimately it is that same source of control and arrogance for Yuhaba that submits to Ichigo's will and leads to Yuhaba's downfall. But my absolute favorite aspect of Bleach's cyclical structure is this. The first and final chapters of the series share the same title, with no numbering to differentiate them as Kubo usually does. They don't need to be distinguished from each other, as they tell the same story. In the first chapter, Ichigo is established to be an individual who can see and talk to ghosts, an ability he has zero understanding of. His family is attacked by a hollow, a monster he has zero understanding of. Despite his lack of understanding in the face of a monster that would terrify any normal man beyond measure, Ichigo displays courage and chooses to fight against the creature characterized by death to protect his family. We fear that which we cannot see, the unknown. In the very last chapter, we see Yuhaba's final words followed by Aizen's monologue, the path to a world without fear. Life and death were meant to be combined as one. Thanks to Ichigo thwarting Yuhaba's plans, life and death retain their shapes. All that has life will continue to live in constant fear of death for all eternity. Aizen's monologue outlines the fatal flaw in Yuhaba's plans. Without a fear of death, people won't search for hope. People will persist simply by being alive. Persistence while fending off fear is something else entirely. That is what gives meaning to life. And the special name for that is courage. By killing Yuhaba, nothing changes and the status quo remains. The cycle of mortality is left untouched. Where chapter 1 showcases Ichigo's courage in the face of the unknown, chapter 680 showcases Ichigo's courage in choosing to keep the unknown unknown. Courage and two sides of the same coin. Balance and the perfect showcase of Ichigo's growth and maturity. Ichigo achieves his wish from chapter 0 in the conclusion of his battle against Yuhaba, but not in the way one would expect. If the wheel symbolizes the cycle of life and death, Ichigo doesn't truly shatter that fate. Instead, he uses the strong blade he wished for to maintain the status quo and he even has a child to continue on the cycle of life and death, Kazui Kurosaki, whose name literally means courage, the embodiment of Bleach's ultimate message. If Ichigo hadn't managed to defeat Yuhaba, Kazui would have never been born. He is the product of Ichigo's courage, which is why he is named as such. That same boy from the start of the story who was traumatized by the death of his mother, consumed by self-loathing, learns to love himself. He learns to love living, to accept death, 
and above all, radiate that same outlook on living to everybody he encounters, friend and foe alike, freeing them from their own trauma. An anomaly who exerts his free will in an otherwise deterministic world, and his free will permeates the entire cast. Even the ultimate villain is affected by Ichigo's contagious steadfastness, albeit in the form of a spirit that exists within Ichigo's soul. The final say of Bleach is a simple one, to have courage in the face of death, to gain a formless strength that pushes you on to keep walking, a strength that lies beyond the scope of the material world, a strength that can only be achieved through intimate knowledge of yourself and the resolve to stay true to yourself. The hero's journey is an endless cycle, with that being the main reason why I chose to include it into this analysis. The hero returns from his mysterious adventure with newfound awareness and power, having overcome death itself, and he ultimately finds himself in the same place where he begun, the status quo. However, this time it is a different status quo, one he personally played a massive role in changing. He shares his experiences and wisdom with the fellow man, and if the need arises, the hero is always ready for yet another journey. We can see the story of Bleach is inevitably going in this direction, with the narrative threads that are practically guaranteed to come front and centre in the Hell Arc, such as the concerning nature of the Soul King's existence. The Hell Arc will restart the hero's journey, with Ichigo placed into yet another special world, yet another unknown. The very premise of the Hell Arc is that balance has been broken, and the only people to blame are the ones who were originally known as balancers. It's very likely our protagonists will be forced to reshape the very essence of Bleach's world in hopes of maintaining balance, as the current structure of the universe is questionable to say the least. Though of course, that remains an untold story. I originally intended to complete this video by attempting to bring it all together and present a 15-20 minute holistic viewing of Ichigo's character with absolutely everything taken into consideration, but we're not going to do that today. This video is already ridiculously long and I don't want it to feel like I'm repeating myself any more than I already have, so be on the lookout for a separate video doing just that in the near future, where I'll be prioritizing analysis of Ichigo's character on a macro level rather than the micro level. I was also going to include a theory regarding Ichigo and the Soul King, but it seems the anime is introducing a bunch of new information and lore that directly correlates with many of the things I would have discussed, so that is also something I refrained from sharing today and will be sharing sometime in the near future. I'll be completely honest guys, I'm fully aware of the blemishes in the writing of this script. There are a lot of things I've covered that could have been trimmed for the sake of brevity. I know I repeat myself a lot and maybe even talk about stuff that are completely unnecessary. I'm still learning. This is as condensed as possible in the time frame I have given myself. If I wanted to perfect this video, it would end up taking me many more months to complete than it already has, and I would have to completely pause my content creation in general, which is the last thing I want to do. Making videos like this isn't easy in the slightest, especially as I can be someone who's pretty perfectionist at times, and I've had to just force myself to get this out there, otherwise I'd never finish this video. But it is very rewarding, more rewarding than you could ever imagine. The amount of work I put into this single video is mind boggling. It's more work than I have put into like 20 of my other videos combined. And I'm saying this before I've even begun editing, which is perhaps the most time consuming aspect of the process. So despite the issues present, I am incredibly proud of this. It's easily my proudest work as a content creator thus far. I can't believe I finished writing and recording this and I'm literally grinning from cheek to cheek as I say this. And trust me when I say I'm far from over. I plan to reach even more ambitious heights in the future of the channel and I hope you guys stick around with me on this journey. If you're hearing this right now, that means you've reached the end of the video, so I just want to say thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. It means the absolute world to me that you managed to sit through multiple hours of something of my own creation. Whether it's praise or criticism, love or hate, please feel free to share whatever thoughts you have in the comment section down below. I truly hope this was worth your time and you enjoyed yourself. Once again, thank you very much for watching and I hope you have a fantastic day, week, month, year, decade and century. <laughs> thank you.